Fiancé for the Night. One Night to Forever, Book One. Written by Melissa McClone. Text Copyright 2017 by Melissa McClone. Production Copyright 2023 by Melissa McClone. Dedication. This was the original dedication from the 1999 edition. To my husband, Tom. For believing in dreams. And believing in me. Here's an updated dedication for this 2017 revised edition. To my husband, Tom. 18 years, 3 kids, and 40 plus books later. I can't thank you enough. For always believing I could be an author. From the author. Fiancé for the Night was originally published in 1999. The rights to the novel reverted to me from my publisher in 2016. After thinking about where I was as a writer when I wrote the manuscript, it was my first published novel, and where I am now and how much things had changed over the years, I decided to rewrite and update the story. By the time I'd finished, I'd added 8,000 words. I hope you enjoy this new edition. Chapter 1. Would you be my fiancé? Fiancé. Troy McKnight must have misheard the blonde standing next to him due to the noise in the jam-packed San Francisco brewery. She was attractive with wide blue eyes, freckles across her nose, a heart-shaped face, and no makeup, but she wasn't his type. With multiple chains and pendants hanging around her neck, dangling silver earrings, and a flowery dress, she looked out of place in the popular, after-work hangout, which was filled with the suit-and-tie crowd from nearby financial offices. He preferred women who dressed professionally. She was too bohemian-looking. He stared over the rim of his pint. Excuse me, but what did you say? Releasing a sigh, she brushed her wavy blonde hair behind her shoulders. Would you be my fiancé? she repeated. Just for tonight. Troy had heard her correctly the first time. He half laughed. Her matter-of-fact tone made her proposition sound almost logical, and he knew it wasn't the beer causing that. He'd only had one, the half-filled cold glass he held in his hand. He took another swig from his lager. The cool liquid ran down his throat. After a rough day at the office, all he wanted was a drink followed by another quiet evening at home, nothing else. Especially not this woman. She hadn't introduced herself. She could be a scam artist, a she-devil in disguise, and he the target. Even without lipstick, her full lips were luscious enough to seduce unknowing prey. Troy set his glass on the bar. Why do you need a fiancé tonight? It's a long story. Her sunshine and sunflower scent cut through the smell of beer hanging in the air. Okay, that was nice. I'm not going anywhere. She reached for his hand, pushed back the arm of his suit, and read the time on his watch, a present from his parents when he graduated business school. Yes, I knew it. What? You're wearing a watch. He eyed her warily. What's that supposed to mean? That I asked the right person. You're being evasive. I don't have time to explain. Are you coming with me? You're asking for a lot without providing any explanation. She rolled her eyes. I got myself into a jam with my family. It's only one dinner. My father will pay, so the only thing tonight will cost you is time. Any other questions? Troy hesitated, unsure if he bought her explanation. Nothing personal, but you don't look like the kind of woman who hangs out here. I'm not, but my parents would approve of you and the men who frequent an establishment like this. That sounded plausible. Look, will you be my fiancé or not? The edges of her mouth turned up slightly. I'm sorry to be impatient, but if you say no, I have to find someone else. She glanced around the bar as if she were scanning the area for her next target. In the crowded brew pub, she could easily find someone else. Men with rolled up sleeves and loosened ties stood at nearby tables, relaxing after long hours at the office. Troy didn't know why he was considering posing as her fiancé. The woman had appeared out of nowhere, yet he couldn't deny his curiosity about her and her strange proposition. 
The concern and sense of urgency in her eyes rang true, but he never took risks. Spontaneity wasn't part of his plan, a life plan to ensure he achieved all he wanted and would never have to return to his family's farm in that middle-of-nowhere town in Missouri. Staring at him, she waited for his answer by tapping her unpainted fingernails against the bar. If he said no, she seemed to have no qualms about asking another man to be her fiancé for the night. He doubted she was a con artist. She looked too much like an innocent love child from the sixties with a hint of vulnerability in her eyes. In a meat market like this, a veritable smorgasbord of male testosterone, she could end up with anyone. At least she would be safe with him. This is important to you, isn't it? he asked. As she tilted her chin, her earrings chimed. Yes. A free dinner with an attractive woman. It almost sounded too easy. Troy thought of Jessica White, who worked in the office next to his. Now she was his type, but he'd seen Jessica's fiancé pick her up this afternoon. For three years, Troy had wanted to ask her out, but he'd been too busy working to get around to it. Now she was engaged to someone else, and he was sitting in a bar with a total stranger. Maybe he needed a little adventure in his life. He took another sip of his lager. Okay, I'll be your fiancé. The woman threw her arms around him and kissed his cheek. Oh, thank you. Her impulsiveness gave him a small thrill. The envious glances of other men in the bar made Troy sit straighter. Maybe this wasn't such a bad idea after all. Grabbing his arm, she pulled him off his barstool. Come on. We're going to be late. Whoa. That was fast. Maybe an adventure wasn't such a good idea. I need to pay for my beer. Before Troy could reach his wallet, she opened her purse, a multicolored cloth pouch with drawstrings, and pulled out a $10 bill. Will this cover it? Yes. Call him old-fashioned, but he wasn't used to a woman paying. She tossed the money on the bar. Is there anything else? He wanted to say yes. Stop. No. Let's go then. She led him out of the double glass doors. A cool breeze blew off the San Francisco Bay. Cars sped by on the Embarcadero. To his right, the lights on the double-decker bay bridge twinkled in the evening sky. The pleasant October weather was a refreshing change from a day spent in a skyscraper. Do you have a car? she asked. Not with me. She rubbed her temples. We'll take a taxi. That will be faster than calling for a ride. Where are we? I'll explain everything once we're on our way. She flagged a yellow cab and muttered the name of a trendy restaurant known for creating mouth-watering dishes and attracting a crowd of CNBC patrons. He would be getting a good dinner tonight. Troy followed her into the cab. As they pulled away from the curb, she laughed incredulously. I'm going to pull this off. He watched her for a moment. Her unrestrained joy and boundless energy captivated him. He'd never met anyone like her. She wet her lower lip. I don't know your name. Troy McKnight. Troy McKnight. She repeated his name twice. I like it. Well, Troy, I hope you don't mind me calling you that. After all, we are engaged. The cab driver coughed, but Troy ignored him. Would you mind telling me your name? I'm Cassandra. Such a serious and formal name for such a light-hearted person. The name Cassie fit her breezy personality better. Cassandra what? Oh, sorry. Daniels, Cassandra Daniels. She took a deep breath. I can't believe I found you, and you said yes. Why do you need a fiancé? Her honey-gold eyebrows pulled together. He couldn't let this drop. I need to know what's going on. Otherwise. You're right. She dragged her teeth over her lower lip. Okay, here's what happened. We met a few weeks ago, fell madly in love, and got engaged. My parents decided they had to meet the man who swept me off my feet, so they called this morning and told me they were driving up from Carmel to have dinner with us. 
Are your parents retired? My mother thinks so, and my father should be, but he does some business on the side because he claims he's not ready for retirement. They split their time between Carmel and Palo Alto. She had to come for money. Both towns were expensive places to live. What happened to the real fiancé? What real fiancé? I assume you told your family about a real engagement. No, Cassandra, no, he liked Cassie better, said. I made it up. Excuse me. There isn't a real fiancé. If there were, I wouldn't need your help tonight. Who was this woman? She wasn't a compulsive liar, was she? You told your family you were engaged when you weren't. She nodded as if her actions were logical. Cassie didn't look delusional, but this was insane. Why? he asked. It seemed like the right thing to do at the time. Sometimes, I'm, uh, impulsive. She smiled mischievously, almost as if sharing a childhood secret. The woman had to be crazy, but what did it say about him since he agreed to participate in her lie? I want to thank you. Her eyes shone with gratitude. I could tell you were a nice guy. You have a wonderful smile. When had he been smiling tonight? He'd been drinking his beer in solitude to relax before heading home to his studio apartment to do more work. Maybe tomorrow, he could look back on tonight and laugh. A smile lit up her beautiful face. I don't know what I would have done if you hadn't said yes. Don't worry about it. The way she turned toward him tightened the bodice of her dress and accentuated her full breasts. This fiancé gig was looking better and better. He'd been working hard, trying to close the micro deal, and get offered a partnership with the venture capital firm where he worked. But life consisted of more than reading balance sheets and making deals. He was no different from any other red-blooded male. He needed rest, relaxation, and fun too. No, it is a big deal. She squeezed his hand. You're my McKnight in shining armor. At your service, milady. We McKnights aim to please. He wasn't sure if the full moon or her perfume were getting to him, but he found Cassie's playful spirit contagious. When was the last time he'd had fun? Troy couldn't remember. His shoulders tightened. By the way, is there anything else I should know about tonight? he asked. You should know a little about me. She bit her lower lip. Let's see. My favorite color is purple. I love flowers and hot fudge sundaes. I'm not a vegetarian. I love a good hamburger every now and then. Cooked medium. I think people who won't eat veal but eat chicken are hypocrites. I love reading books. I like 800 thread count sheets, any higher number than that isn't better, just pretentious. Oh, and I sleep in the nude. Stunned, Troy stared at her. She'd spoken so fast. Hot fudge sundaes and sleeping in the nude. His temperature rose at the images filling his mind. He crossed his legs. What about you? she asked. He couldn't think straight. He needed to cool down. Uh, I like ice cream. Chocolate's my favorite. What else? Troy stared into her eyes and found himself transfixed. It was as if he were being hypnotized. She smiled at him as if he were a lost puppy. Any sports? I like football. What's your favorite color? Her eyes were the color of a cloudless summer sky. Blue. She patted his hand. Don't worry. We can make it up as we go along. What was wrong with him? He felt out of sync. Almost dizzy. Maybe he needed something to eat. The cab slowed as it approached the restaurant. Cassie handed the driver a $20 bill and slid out of the cab. Are you ready? Not at all. Troy cleared his throat. Sure. Cassie brushed a lock of hair from his forehead and straightened his tie. She took his hand in hers. Don't forget, we're madly in love. Her small hand fit snugly in his. Madly in love? Maybe they were just mad. 
standing on the sidewalk, Cassandra worried Troy might change his mind. He seemed a little uptight given all the questions he'd asked. She was so sure he would say no that his yes had surprised her. Maybe that was why she held on to his hand like a lifeline. So far, so good. She couldn't believe she'd found a fiancé, albeit a fake one, but the evening was only beginning. Her insides trembled. This night could easily turn into a complete disaster. Nice place, he said. Yes. That was the only word Cassandra could manage right now. She clenched her free hand and then flexed her fingers. Nerves were getting to her. Who was she kidding? She'd been frantic from the time she hung up from her mother's call earlier today. Cassandra wasn't a good actress, but if she pulled off tonight, she should get an Oscar for her performance. Her family wasn't standing at the carved mahogany bar. They must be seated. That would mean making a grand entrance with her fiancé in tow. Something she hadn't wanted to happen, but she'd been running late, as usual. She glimpsed Troy's reflection in a mirror. An unexpected smile tugged at her lips. Luck was on her side tonight. He was exactly the well-dressed fiancé she'd hoped to find. His Italian navy suit was top-of-the-line silk cashmere if she guessed right. He wore a nice watch, which was a bonus. And he was easy on the eyes. Very easy. High cheekbones and sculpted features gave Troy a model-handsome look. To be totally corporate, he needed a haircut and different style, but she liked the way his longish, curly at the ends, and almost out-of-control brown locks added character to his all-American good looks. Her picky parents would find few faults with Troy McKnight. They would give their seal of approval and stop interfering in Cassandra's personal life. After tonight, their endless dating advice and matchmaking would stop. She'd be on her own. For good this time. All she wanted was to be left alone. Soon. She smiled, pleased with herself. She'd found the perfect fiancé for the night. Her sister, Emily, would be jealous, too. That was another bonus. Cassandra didn't care what Eric Wainwright, her brother-in-law, thought, so long as he didn't voice his opinion. She'd heard enough from Eric. She'd be happier if she never had to see him again. The hostess, an attractive woman with flaming red hair, smiled. May I help you? We're with the Daniels party, Cassandra said. The woman glanced at something on the tall table she was standing behind. Your party is seated. Follow me. She led Cassandra and Troy into the crowded dining area. Not one table was empty. Waiters hurried around with steaming plates of food and bottles of wine. The scent of basil and garlic drifted in the air. Cassandra had skipped lunch and was starving. Noise from spirited conversations rose from the tables, but the din wasn't unpleasant. Not like at the brew pub earlier, which was just a place people went to drink and hook up. She shivered. The only good thing about that place was knowing she'd find someone suitable to pacify her parents there. Here's your party, the hostess said. Enjoy your dinner. Thank you. Cassandra took in the image of her family sitting at the table like models from a magazine ad or a soap opera. None had noticed she'd arrived. Not surprising. She'd tried fitting into their world, but she'd realized that wasn't who she was. Maybe someday her parents would understand and accept the choices she'd made. Then again. Vanessa Daniels, her mother, wore a black knit dress, simple lines and flattering, which no doubt carried a hefty price tag as did the rest of her wardrobe. Every strand of her platinum hair was in place, and her brilliant diamond earrings sparkled for all to admire. Thanks to daily workouts and highly paid dermatologists, she was a stunning woman who looked like she was in her early forties, not pushing sixty. How would her mother act if she became a grandmother? Cassandra couldn't imagine her mom letting anyone call her grandma. But that was Emily's problem when she had babies. Cassandra didn't even want to date. Forget about marriage and having a family. She liked being single. Her mother's gaze met Cassandra's. I told you she would come, Emily. And look, Dixon, her fiancé does exist. You're correct, Vanessa, her father said. I must admit I had my doubts given how fast things have happened, but he's real. 
Cassandra winced. She would show her parents she could find her own man. She didn't need their help or their interference. Sorry we're late. Cassandra clutched Troy's warm, strong hand. She not only needed a fiancé tonight, but she also needed someone to give her emotional support. Troy and I were making out, so I had the driver make an extra circle around the civic center. Her mother blushed. Cassandra, really? Don't worry, Vanessa. Her father, the venerable Dixon Daniels, downed his drink. His once blonde hair had turned gray, and he could stand to lose about 30 pounds, but he was still handsome with sparkling cornflower blue eyes and a cheerful smile. At least this one looks normal. Unless there are hidden tattoos or pierced body parts under that suit? Cassandra leaned over and kissed her father's tan cheek. The familiar scent of his aftershave filled her nostrils and brought back fond memories of her childhood. She might be the black sheep of the family, but she would always be her daddy's little girl. Don't be a prude, dad. Everyone has a tattoo. I don't. Emily, her uptight sister, sounded offended. Not everyone is as classless as you. Her? Classless? As if asking Cassandra to be her maid of honor was an example of classy behavior. Unbelievable. Well, I suppose you got all the class when they divided the DNA. Emily was her fraternal twin. She was two minutes older, an inch taller, and fifteen pounds lighter. Her light brown hair was pulled off her face. Her little black dress shouted designer collection. Two twins couldn't be more opposite. They'd shared nothing except the same birth date, until Eric Wainwright. Eric. So pathetic. Sweat beaded on his high, creased forehead. A short, boring hairstyle had replaced his formerly luscious mane of blonde hair. The hair. That was what had attracted Cassandra to him in the first place. The length had given him a wildness and an edge that was missing now. For the best. He'd created a bad boy character that made him irresistible to her, but it had been an act. He wasn't wild or a rebel or any of the things he claimed to be. The nights she'd spent with her arms around him, riding on his motorcycle and watching sunsets, had been as fake as his words of love. She'd been Eric's key to ensuring a successful career, until he met Emily, who was born to be a corporate trophy wife. Unlike Cassandra. She only wondered if Eric was as miserable to her sister as he'd been to Cassandra. Her wedding gift to the couple had been a lovely keepsake box containing the business cards of marriage counselors. Tacky, yes, but what the two of them had done to her was worse. Aren't you going to introduce us to your betrothed, sweetheart? Her father asked. Her betrothed. Troy. Sorry, Cassandra said. I got so caught up in the goodwill at the table, I forgot. Emily rolled her eyes. Are you trying to be sarcastic or ironic? Or perhaps you don't know the difference. Ignoring the words, Cassandra cuddled against Troy's firm, wide chest. His muscles tensed, but she didn't back away. She couldn't, or her family would figure out this was a ruse. She lightly rubbed her fingers against him. Maybe that would calm him. Troy, this is my family. Cassandra looked at her mom and then her dad. Emily and Eric didn't warrant acknowledgement. Family, this is Troy McKnight, the man of my dreams. Chapter 2 After formal introductions and handshakes, Cassandra and Troy sat. No one said anything. The tension in Troy's body had increased. He looked ready to feign an excuse and take off. This wasn't good. Cassandra ate a slice of bread before her stomach growled. She drank her entire glass of water, trying to wash away the dryness in her throat. The waiter took each of their orders and left. Still, no one spoke. She had to think of something to say and fast. I want to thank you for inviting us to dinner, Mr. and Mrs. Daniels. The genuine tone of Troy's voice surprised Cassandra, as did his speaking up given how tense he appeared. Maybe he wasn't going to take off. He raised his wine glass in acknowledgement. The pleasure is ours, Troy. Her mother smiled. And please call us Vanessa and Dixon. My husband's parents were Mr. and Mrs. Daniels. 
Troy's grin reached the corners of his eyes. The effect was dazzling. Cassandra had been interested in his image, the whole package he presented, when she had picked him out earlier. She'd recognized his attractiveness, but now she could see how gorgeous he was. My mother says the same thing, Vanessa. Troy emphasized her first name. Cassie and I have been so wrapped up in each other that we've shut everyone out. I'm happy to finally meet each of you. Cassie? Every muscle bunched. She hadn't been called Cassie since she'd graduated from high school and demanded to be called Cassandra. No way did she want to return to her childhood nickname. Maybe no one noticed. We're happy, too. Her dad's assessing gaze never left Troy's eyes. I must admit we were surprised, shocked really, when Cassandra told us about your engagement. After all, Emily and Eric had just returned from their honeymoon. How was your honeymoon? Cassandra wanted to change the subject. Troy didn't need to know the icky details about her past with Eric. Wonderful, Eric answered. The honeymoon was everything we hoped it would be. A month away was the perfect length, too. She bit the inside of her cheek. Eric had told Cassandra that he wouldn't be able to take more than a week off from work when they'd been planning their honeymoon. Had that only been a year ago? It felt like another lifetime. Where did you go? Troy asked, seemingly oblivious to the undercurrents at the table. The Mediterranean. We spent a week in Greece and then took a three-week cruise, Emily said before her husband could answer. We made so many stops I lost count. Fun, but tiring. Eric cocked one eyebrow. Have you two made honeymoon plans yet? Cassandra suppressed the urge to toss a piece of bread at his oversized head. Instead, she pasted on her most charming smile. Troy's in charge of the honeymoon. That's right, Troy said without any hesitation. Two weeks of total relaxation on a tropical island with fine white sand, crystal blue water, a gentle sea breeze, and no interruption sounds about right. Picturing Troy at the beach, body surfing in the waves, rubbing sunscreen over her body, had her nodding along. Eric snickered. I can't imagine Cassandra sitting on a beach for two hours, let alone two weeks. We aren't planning to spend our time sitting, Troy answered with a wink before biting into a slice of bread. Cassandra's cheeks warmed. Thank goodness he wasn't her type, or she could imagine falling for Mr. Troy McKnight. Enough honeymoon talk. Her father straightened in his chair. Why don't we discuss the wedding, her mother suggested. Have you set a date? No, Cassandra said. We aren't sure if we want a traditional wedding or not. That doesn't surprise me, Emily muttered. I see you don't have a ring yet. We're using my grandmother's engagement ring, Troy said. The man kept saying the unexpected, and she appreciated his fast thinking. I haven't had time to fly home and get it from my parents' house. Your grandmother's ring. Her mother clapped her hands together. A family heirloom. How wonderful. Troy smiled at Cassandra. Her mother's reaction seemed to please him. Eric glanced at the rock on Emily's ring finger. That works out well financially. Troy has a ring to use, and Cassandra has a dress to wear. Jerk. Cassandra balled her hands into fists. Emily's parted lips matched her wide eyes. She exchanged a glance with Eric. She can't wear that dress, Emily said with uncharacteristic understanding. She bought it for, another wedding. But the dress has never been worn, Eric explained as if he were talking about a pair of jeans, not a beautiful white dress that had made Cassandra feel like a princess. Letting an expensive wedding gown hang in the closet forever because I married you would be a total waste. Cassandra stiffened. She couldn't believe she'd told that moron she loved him or said yes, when he'd asked her to marry him. Temporary insanity. That was the only explanation. Troy placed his arm around her shoulder and pulled her close. His warm breath teased her neck. Are you okay, he whispered. She nodded. At least someone cared, or pretended to care, about her feelings. I sold the dress. Well, then. That means you'll need a new one. This time, her mother picked up her glass of Chardonnay. I want to go shopping with you. 
Of course, mother. That day would never happen. There's plenty of time to talk about the wedding, her father said. All I know is my little girl looks happy, and that makes me happy. My job is to make her happy. Troy caressed Cassandra's cheek with his fingertips. A tingle ran up her spine. You do an excellent job. Did he ever. He was playing the devoted fiancé role better than she expected. She would have to be careful given the sparks that could easily erupt into fireworks if he kept touching her. What do you do, Troy? Emily asked. Leave it to her sister to get to the bottom line, income potential. An interrogation of Troy was bound to happen at some point. Cassandra had hoped they could get through appetizers and their salads first. No biggie. She assumed Troy was an attorney. He had that overpaid, honor attainer, stick up his bottom lawyer look about him. Go ahead, honey. Tell them what you do. Troy cleared his throat. Venture capital. Oh, no. Not V.C., Cassandra clenched her teeth to keep her mouth from gaping open. Her stomach somersaulted. This couldn't be happening. Not again. Her dad beamed. Of course this news would make him ecstatic. Dixon Daniels was one of the long-reigning kings of venture capitalists, financiers who invested in startup companies in hopes of making huge profits. He'd made a fortune at the height of the tech bubble, but money had continued to pour in after the dot-com collapse and now. Her father leaned forward. I thought you looked familiar, Troy. Who do you work for, Sand Hill? No, it's Scorpio Partners. I remember now. You handled the Magi Wear deal. Troy nodded. Impressive. Her dad wasn't a man who gave praise often. Why didn't you tell me your fiancé was in the business, honey? Cassandra struggled for words to say. Troy had caught her off guard. He looked like an attorney. He was supposed to be an attorney. How could she have been so stupid? Why hadn't she asked what he did? Daniels Venture Group was a respected firm, and Dixon Daniels was known as the master. Up-and-comers would kill to learn from him. Marrying the boss's daughter was an easy way in. Just ask Eric Wainwright. Not sure how to answer, she swallowed. Well, Dad. We wanted to tell you in person, Troy finished for her, much to Cassandra's relief. I didn't want you to think I was marrying your daughter for the wrong reasons. Her father glanced at Eric and then at Troy. Does this mean you have no interest in joining my group? Unsure if she wanted to hear his answer, Cassandra focused on the bread basket. Death by carbs sounded like the perfect option right now. Eric had lied when she asked him the same question after they'd started dating. She crumpled the linen napkin on her lap. I wouldn't say I have no interest, Troy said. But my first concern is Cassie. Ugh. If he kept using that nickname, someone would notice. Cassandra forced herself not to grimace. Getting married is stressful, Troy continued with a sincerity that suggested he was an excellent actor, or a liar. A new job would only add to the pressure. I want to be the best fiancé and husband I can, so I don't see myself making any changes right now. A rush of emotion built inside Cassandra. For all the fake smiles she'd given tonight, the one on her face now was genuine. She'd hoped to find a man who would say those words, a man who would put her needs ahead of his own. Troy answered the question well. That gave her hope. Maybe not all men were like Eric. Perhaps some weren't self-centered and egotistical. Was Troy different? Not that it mattered, but he sure was being the perfect fiancé. If what he'd said was true, Troy would make a great husband. A great husband for someone else. She ignored a twinge of regret. After tonight, she wouldn't see him again. Cassandra, you've found such a nice man. Her mother dabbed her eyes with a tissue. I spent hours on my makeup. I can't believe I'm going to ruin it by crying. You don't need makeup to look beautiful, dear, her father said. Her mother sniffled. I hope the two of you will be very happy together. Vanessa, you read my mind. Her dad raised his glass. A toast, to Troy and Cassie.
May the two of you find a lifetime of happiness together. Oh no. Her father had called her Cassie. That meant he'd noticed Troy using her old nickname. What was she going to do? She'd spent her freshman year of college convincing her family to call her by her full name. She'd later realized she was more of a Cassie than a Cassandra, but by then, the trench had been dug too deep. She'd had to continue holding her ground. Daddy, she asked. Yes, Cassie? The joy in his eyes made her hesitate. For the first time in years, she'd made him happy. Her mother looked equally pleased. Cassandra couldn't spoil the mood, not yet anyway. If she allowed only her father and Troy to call her Cassie tonight, that wouldn't be too bad, right? She swallowed the lump in her throat. Thank you. So, Cassie, Emily said with a saccharine sweet tone. Have you heard we've been house hunting? Unfortunately, the market is tight, especially in Palo Alto. It's Cassandra, she corrected her sister. And I'm sure house hunting must be a challenge. Are you still living in that, unique apartment near 24th Street? Thanks to Emily and Eric, Cassandra had moved after the breakup. The bad memories were too much for her to take. As her temper flared, she reached for her glass of Cabernet. She sipped slowly, enjoying the robust taste of the full-bodied wine until she reigned in her emotions. The anger, however, felt good. That was better than heartbroken. No, I live a couple of blocks away. You should buy a place. Emily stared down her nose, a move she perfected by the time she turned nine. Renting makes no sense. It's like flushing your money down the toilet. Cassandra's words ended her sister's lecture. The rest of the evening went relatively smooth. Delectable desserts followed the delicious dinner. Conversation flowed without the uncomfortable gaps of silence they'd experienced at the beginning. Cassandra managed to be civil to Emily and Eric, who returned the politeness. Troy charmed his way further into her parents' hearts. Gratitude grew with each sentence he spoke. She also appreciated the way he kept his arm around her chair, his fingers on her shoulder. Not only would anyone looking at them assume they were in love, but she also had the support she'd needed when dealing with her family. Everything had worked as planned, except for her father calling her Cassie, but she could fix that later. This would be over soon enough. Outside the restaurant, Cassandra kissed her mother's cheek. It was wonderful seeing you, Mom. I enjoyed it, dear. I like your young man, Vanessa whispered. Thanks, Mom. Cassandra hugged her father. Thanks for the delicious dinner, Dad. Glad you could come. He released her and then extended his arm to Troy. I'm happy we got to spend time with you. Troy shook her father's hand. Thanks for dinner, sir. I wish we had more time to get to know one another, her father said, a twinge of regret in his voice. Daddy, it's getting late. Emily tapped her toe on the sidewalk. You and mother have a long drive ahead of you. We're staying in the city, so don't worry about us. Her dad looked at Troy. I have an idea. Are you a golfer? Yes, but I'm a hacker. Me, too, her dad replied. Cassandra bit back a chuckle. Her father, who played at least three days a week, had a four handicap. He was far from a hacker. Why don't you and Cassie spend the weekend with us in Carmel, her father asked. You and I can golf, and the women can discuss wedding plans. Short notice, I realize. Uh. Dot. Troy ran his hand through his hair. What do you think, honey? Well, I. It's settled, her father said before Cassandra could say no. He placed something in Troy's hand and whispered in his ear. Cassandra needed to stop this. Now. Daddy. Her father kissed her cheek. We'll see you Friday night, kids. With that, her parents walked around the corner. Emily and Eric followed them. What happened? Cassandra stared at the deserted sidewalk. Her shoulders slumped. It was going so well. Too well, of course. I can't believe I didn't see this coming. I wanted them to like you, but this is too much. 
how are we going to get out of spending the weekend with them? With a bewildered look, Troy stared at the contents in his hand. I don't know. What did my father give you? Troy showed her two $50 bills. You won't believe what he said it was for. Cassandra stared at the money in Troy's hand. She laughed. I can't believe my father gave you gas money. Me either, but this isn't funny. An incredulous look was on Troy's face. No one's ever given me gas money. Not even my own father. It's not a big deal. This is what he's done my whole life. Arguing with him is futile. Troy's eyebrows furrowed. Her explanation hadn't seemed to mollify him. I don't need your father's money. Troy stiffened. I might not have my own company or fund, but I have a good job. This isn't about you. He needed to lighten up. Cassandra wondered if Troy took everything so seriously. My father gave you money for me. He's trying to take care of his little girl. But I feel, offended. Troy's lips flattened. I can take care of you myself. Okay, the guy was sweet to think that, even though this engagement of theirs was not only fake, but also over. Cassandra would play along if that made him feel better. She owed him for coming with her tonight. I know that, and so does my father. The temperature kept dropping. The cold brought goosebumps to her arms. Too bad she hadn't brought a jacket. She crossed her arms. Be happy my father likes you. Troy removed his suit jacket and placed it around her shoulders. He does? Of course, much to my brother-in-law's chagrin. Cassandra pulled the front of his jacket together. The scent of Troy surrounded her and made her want to smell the fabric. On second thought, that wouldn't be a smart idea. Eric kept glaring at you. The look on his face was priceless. I'm sure he thinks you're trying to grab a share of his gravy train. Troy's forehead creased. You think this is funny? Yes, I do. His irritated tone annoyed her. Relax, Troy. My father didn't mean to offend you, so stop feeling insulted. Consider the cash payment for services rendered. I'll come up with an excuse why we can't go to Carmel this weekend. This is my problem, not yours. I disagree. He shoved the money into her hand. This goes beyond gas money. It's as much my problem as it is yours. Why is that? Your father is Dixon Daniels. Troy said her father's name with an almost reverent tone. Whether I want to work for him or not doesn't matter. I have my reputation and career to consider. Dixon is an influential man in the V.C. circle. I doubt he'd be spiteful on purpose, but, as you pointed out, you are his daughter. How dare he, a total stranger, criticize her father? She raised her chin. My father would not sabotage your career. He is an honorable man. An honorable man who adores you, Troy said softly. I was tempted to walk out when I saw him, but I couldn't leave you there alone. At least she'd picked an honorable fake fiancé. Biting her lower lip, she struggled to put the situation into perspective. Thanks for staying. I'm sure tonight wasn't easy for you. It wasn't, which is why I can't blow you off like a one-night stand and risk offending your father. I'm not a partner at a V.C. firm. I'm an associate, working my way up the proverbial ladder. If he wanted, Dixon could become a big obstacle to my getting ahead. What are you suggesting we do? Cassandra asked, not sure if she wanted to hear Troy's idea. She wasn't as happy being stuck with his honorable intentions now. He glanced at the sidewalk and muttered something. She couldn't have heard him correctly. What did you say? We could be engaged for a little while longer. Are you crazy? She yelled so loudly that a passing car stopped so a passenger could ask if she was all right. Until tonight, I would have said no, Troy said with a half-smile. Are you seeing anyone? What does that have to do? Answer the question, Cassie. No. Neither am I, Troy said. So we don't have to worry about other people saying anything or being hurt by this. 
I don't see why being engaged longer wouldn't work. It's crazy, that's why. The situation was getting out of control. Not that this mess wasn't her fault. She took full responsibility for the fiasco they faced, but that didn't mean she had to allow the farce to continue. No, she had to put a stop to the fake engagement. That's what I said about tonight and look where we are now. Troy buttoned the front of his jacket around her. Once your parents see how different we are, they'll understand when we break up. We can say, goodbye, and tell your parents it's too painful to remain friends. Although Cassandra didn't think her father would hurt Troy's career, she understood his concern. She had dragged him into this mess. Was she willing to take a chance with Troy's job hanging in the balance? No, she couldn't do that to him. How often do you see your parents, he asked. Never. Not much. So no one will know whether we are together or not. All we have to do is get through the weekend. The weekend. As much as she might want to make a clean break, Cassandra couldn't leave Troy in the lurch. He seemed like a nice guy. Uptight, but he'd gone along with her charade. Leaving him with a noose around his neck and her father holding the rope wouldn't be fair. She bit the inside of her cheek. How long will we keep up the masquerade? Long enough so I don't look like a jerk. His smile lightened the seriousness of their situation. What do you think? Will you be my fiancé for the weekend? She'd wanted a fiancé for the night, not any longer. She enjoyed her life the way it was, uncomplicated. Okay, but on one condition. Name it. We don't get married, she said half-joking, half-serious. I mean, let's not get carried away with this. Uh... Thing. I've had one fiancé who was more interested in marrying my father than me. That's an easy one. Troy laughed. I don't want to marry Dixon. She exhaled slowly. That's not what I meant. I know. Troy smiled. I promise not to get carried away with this thing. Thank you. Besides, he said, almost laughing again. Look at us. We're complete opposites, from the way we dress to our personality types. Could you imagine us dating, let alone married? Chapter 3 That night, Troy had trouble falling asleep. Thoughts of the dinner, particularly his fake fiancé, bounced around his head like ping-pong balls. When he could finally relax, dreams of chocolate ice cream, hot fudge, whipped cream, and Cassie took over. Sweet dreams that morphed their way into sexier ones. She might be his opposite, but he hadn't wanted to wake up and didn't. Except sleeping through his alarm meant he overslept and was late. Not a few minutes late, either. An hour. Troy bolted out of bed and into the shower. Less than ten minutes later, he ran to catch the Marina Express, bus number 30X. He didn't need to clock in, but he tried to get to the office early. The quiet meant he could get more work done before co-workers arrived and phones rang. He also liked being hard at work when the partners showed up. Troy had never been late. Until today. As soon as he walked into the office, his boss, Mick, met him at his desk and gave him a once-over. Late night, Troy. I, Troy struggled for what to say without mentioning his dinner with the Daniels family. I had trouble sleeping last night, and I slept in. Not exactly a lie. Thoughts about Cassie had kept him awake, and then dreams about her made him wish he could hibernate. Don't worry about it, Mick said with a Cheshire Cat smile. Why don't you come into my office? Huh? Sure. Troy set his laptop bag on his chair. He couldn't imagine being called into Mick's office for arriving an hour late. Besides, Mick had a smile on his face. Something was up, but what? As Troy followed his boss, an intern shot him a sympathetic smile. Another person snickered, but Troy couldn't tell who. No worries. Mick was a fair man who demanded and rewarded hard work. He had a temper, though, and rarely took employees into his office unless to chastise them. He believed in airing grievances in private, away from the watchful eyes and ears of co-workers. 
Mick's assistant gave him the thumbs up sign. Must not be too bad if Della was so relaxed. Inside the office, Troy glanced around. A photo of Mick's gorgeous wife and another of his midnight blue BMW convertible hung on the wall. At 37, Mick was the definition of success. Troy wanted what his boss had, his own fund, a chrome and glass decorated corner office, a view of the Golden Gate Bridge, a luxurious car, and a wife who looked like a Sports Illustrated swimsuit model. If Troy stuck to his plan, he'd have it all, too. He was on his way. Two days on the job had told him that appearances were everything, so he'd splurged on new clothes to look the part of a successful venture capitalist. Designer suits were more important than a new vehicle or fancy apartment. His old truck, which no one at work ever saw, and a studio apartment in one of the desirable neighborhoods were fine for now. Mick motioned to a black leather chair. Have a seat. Troy sat. Mick leaned against the edge of his desk. Anything new? Start on a good note. Mick didn't mind bragging if one could back up the bravado. The micro-side deal should close by Friday. Excellent. Mick rolled his shoulders as though he were trying to relax his muscles. Anything else? I. I got an interesting phone call this morning, Mick interrupted. From Dixon Daniels. Oh. He wanted to talk about you, Mick said nonchalantly. Troy's stomach clenched. He asked all sorts of interesting questions. Mick's gaze bored into him. A vein on the side of his neck throbbed. The cutthroat negotiator, as competitors often called him, broke through Mick's seemingly laid-back manner. Man to man, Troy, Mick said in a serious tone with one black eyebrow cocked. What's going on with Dixon? I met a woman last night and agreed to be her fiancé, not knowing her father was Dixon Daniels. Nope. Mick wouldn't understand. Over the past three years, Troy had learned one thing about his boss, outside of investing in startups, Mick never took risks. Nothing. Somehow, Troy kept his voice steady. Mick took a deep breath and then exhaled slowly. People are always looking for better opportunities, but I thought you were happy here. Troy rubbed his palms against his thighs. I. You told me you were ready for additional responsibilities and a raise, and I've been slow in responding. What if I increased your annual bonus by 20%? 20%. Troy forced himself to stay still. A quick calculation told him he could help his parents replace their roof and get another suit. Any leftover money could go to paying down his student loans. He held in a smile. It's a start. Daniels is a good man, but we have an excellent group here. You're a key player on our team. Mick cracked his knuckles. We're starting a new fund early next year. I mentioned a possible partnership when I hired you. Is that something you'd be interested in? Partnership? Wow. Troy forced himself not to say yes right away, even though he would sell his soul for a partnership in the new fund. That had been his goal since he started working here. He took a breath and then exhaled slowly. I'd be interested. I need to talk to the other partners. This is an involved process. I understand. Troy wished he could high-five his boss, but he maintained his calm. His mind reeled with the possibility of being named a partner, but one nagging thought intruded into his excitement. I need to ask you one thing, Mick. Ask away. Are you offering me this because Dixon Daniels called or because I deserve the partnership? Excellent question. Mick grinned. What do you think? Since starting at Scorpio, Troy had worked non-stop, making solid deals and big profits for the company. He'd taken vacation days only when his family needed his help back on the farm. Not once had he called in sick. Because I deserve it. You deserve it, Troy. Mick spoke with conviction. Let's say Dixon gave me a kick in the ass to take action. Thanks. Mick stood. You stay with us, and I'll make it worth your while. Yes. 
Troy rose, unable to believe he would be ahead of schedule with his plan if he were named a partner, a year ahead to be exact. He didn't say anything in affirmative, only nodded. Thanks. Mick patted Troy's shoulder. Saying no to Dixon will be difficult. Don't let his easy smile fool you. He's as tough as they come. I can handle him. At this moment, Troy believed he could. Soaring out the window on the 47th floor and flying seemed possible because his dreams were going to come true. I'm sure you can. Mick opened the door. See if you can get Dixon interested in one of our deals. That would be a coup. Something no partner has been able to do. Troy doubted he'd be able to either, but he might as well play along. You never know. Good attitude. Mick's smile widened. Have an excellent day. I will. A well-deserved increase in his yearly bonus and a partnership within his reach. Troy almost floated to his desk. He thought about his master plan, the one he'd followed since deciding to go to business school and make something out of himself. Well, more than working the land like his dad and grandfather. He sat. He was on his way to achieving all he'd planned, but. He'd taken the job with Mick fresh out of business school and never considered changing companies. Troy figured hard work and loyalty would earn him high marks and greater rewards. After the close of the Magiware deal, he'd assumed he would be offered a partnership. He hadn't been. Nothing had been mentioned until today. Thanks to the catalyst of Dixon Daniels. Troy slumped in his chair. The help made him uncomfortable. He was willing to do what it took to get what he deserved, but. How long would Mick have taken to act without the call from Dixon? Maybe Troy needed to re-examine his plan. If he'd stuck to it and not taken a risk, he would have never agreed to pose as Cassie's fiancé. Cassie. The not-his-type charmer. She reminded him a little of his college girlfriend, the one who would have never fit into the life he'd wanted. He'd broken up with her even though he'd known she'd been expecting a proposal after two years of dating. That had been the right move. He'd known that then and now. These days, he was attracted to women with classic style, tailored clothes, subdued jewelry, and impeccable makeup. Cassie Daniels created her own style. One that would never be called classic. Still, his lips curved into a smile. For a perfect stranger, she'd had a significant impact on his life in less than what? It had only been 14 hours since she'd approached him at the brew pub. She was also giving him something else, a weekend with Dixon Daniels. How many VC associates got the opportunity to spend time with a legend? Yeah, Troy's leap into a mini-adventure last night had turned out way better than expected. He was also flattered she'd picked him over the other men in the bar. Had he been her first choice? He didn't know, and he wondered why the thought bothered him. He shouldn't complain given his conversation with Mick. Troy wanted to thank her. They were supposed to talk tomorrow to make plans for Friday's drive to Carmel, but her father's call today justified one of his own to her today. He pulled out his cell phone and clicked on her number. On the fourth ring, she answered. Hello. Her voice sounded husky. Hi, it's Troy. Troy who? A blonde moment, or had he woken her? She could have been asleep. Troy McKnight, your fiancé. Oh, that Troy, she said. I'm sorry. I'm still in bed. In bed? Oh, and I sleep in the nude. Their conversation in the cab rushed back. Troy imagined her naked body between 800 thread count sheets. The feel of her soft skin, the scent of her. What was he thinking? Cassie was a Roman candle about to burn his hand. Focus. I'm sorry I called so early, he said. No problem. Not for her, at least. Are you okay? she asked, her sweet voice full of concern. Yes. Cassie. It's Cassandra, but go on. She would always be Cassie to him. Your dad called my work this morning. Why? The word shot out of her mouth. 
She sounded alarmed and more awake. Dixon had questions for my boss, Mick. Troy could picture her biting her lower lip. She'd done that last night. What questions, she asked. Mick didn't say, but he increased my annual bonus and talked about making me a partner. I'm sure my father had nothing to do with it. I can tell you're a hard worker and earned whatever promotion you receive. Troy laughed at the way she tried to justify his good fortune. I do deserve it, but your father made Mick realize I have other options. He made me realize that, too. I have you to thank. Our, um, engagement is helping me. And could help him further. Who knew what pearls of wisdom he could pick up from Dixon Daniels over the weekend. This was looking better and better. You're not angry, she asked. Troy picked up a pen. No. I thought after the gas money thing. This is different. He twirled the pen with his fingers. Maybe I should be angry, but I'm happy. You deserve to be happy, Troy, she said. You'll have to go out and celebrate tonight. Celebrate? If he went out with the guys, he'd only end up with a hangover the next morning. And what guys? The ones he knew had serious girlfriends or were married. A few had babies. But he deserved a celebration. That gave him an idea. Would you like to join me? When? Tonight? Silence. Static sounded. As the pause in conversation continued, he twirled the pen around and around. A phone rang somewhere in the office. Do you have other plans? he asked finally. No. If he didn't give her a good reason for meeting him, she would say no. He didn't know her well, but he knew that much. We're going to be spending the weekend together, pretending to be engaged. We need to learn more about each other so we don't make any mistakes. I want this weekend to go well. Don't you? This wasn't a date but a research meeting. Troy smiled at the reasoning. Yes, she said finally. I'm free after eight. Where do you live? Troy asked, curious about what would keep her busy until eight o'clock. Near No Valley. Do you want me to come there? Why don't we meet by your place since you're the one sacrificing a weekend to go to my parents' house? Sounds fair. Except he was bummed. He wanted to see where Cassie lived and learn more about her. How about nine o'clock, at the coffee house on the corner of Chestnut and Avila? You live in the marina? Yes. Figures. Her condescending tone was hard to miss. What's that supposed to mean? Nothing, she replied, but her voice said the opposite. I'll see you tonight. I'm looking forward to it. As Troy hung up the phone, a scary realization filled his head, he was looking forward to seeing Cassie again. A little after nine o'clock that night, Cassandra stepped off the bus at the corner of Fillmore and Chestnut. She wove her way through the couples and groups of young professionals crowding the sidewalks on their way to one of the many restaurants, bars, and shops on Chestnut Street. Some storefronts were decorated for Halloween. The Marina District. Shivering, though the temperature was pleasant for October, Cassandra fought the rush of memories. She tried to erase everything about her old life, the one her family had approved of, the stressful life that had caused sleepless nights and health issues. Maybe she'd done too good a job putting her past behind her. She hadn't been to this part of town in years. Favorite shops she'd frequented had been replaced. The street had always been upscale, but a few mom-and-pop shops had survived. Most of those were gone now. She hoped the displaced merchants had found better opportunities elsewhere. Cassandra stopped on the corner across from the coffee house. The place looked crowded. Not surprising given its popularity when she'd lived for blocks away. A boulder of dread settled in her stomach. What was she doing here? All day, Cassandra had thought about seeing Troy again. As she'd shelved books in the travel section of the bookstore, she'd daydreamed about a tropical island with hourglass-fine sand and turquoise water. Troy had played a starring role, complete with a pair of board shorts and no shirt. 
she couldn't understand why she was imagining him like that. He'd seemed down to earth last night, but she'd said the same thing about Eric. And he had been that way. Until Eric met Emily. Warning bells sounded. Cassandra's spine went ramrod straight. Thinking about Troy as anything other than a casual acquaintance made zero sense. She would be stupid to think there was more between them, even the possibility of more. Just look at the situation. Troy was pretending to be her fiancé. Did that make him dishonest? Like Eric? And what did that say about her since the fake engagement was her idea? She needed to remain, indifferent. She used to work with guys like Troy, ambitious, cautious, rigid. Okay, he might not be exactly like that, but he could be. Yes, he intrigued her, and men rarely did because she never let them get close enough for that to happen. There was something about Troy, though. Maybe his polite manners? Or the twinkle of mischief in his eyes? But that didn't mean she needed to learn more about her so-called fiancé. She couldn't risk getting close to him. Falling for the wrong guy would only lead to heartache. Again. Cassandra glanced at her cell phone. Quarter after nine. She was only a little late. Squaring her shoulders, she entered the crowded coffee house. Folk music blared from the overhead speakers. Customers crammed into the place. Every table was taken with people trying to talk over the music and other conversations. Two men played backgammon at a small square table, and a man and a woman played Scrabble at another. She spotted Troy. He was staring at his phone and sitting at a table toward the back. Hi, she said. Sorry I'm late. As he put his phone in his pocket, he stood. Let me guess, you're always late. Troy's smile sent her stomach into cartwheels. She forced herself to look away. Yes, and I bet you're always early. Usually. Being punctual is important. A good thing we're not really engaged. We're so different. Standing on her tiptoes, she kissed his cheek. For practice, of course. Of course. She pulled a green lollipop from her purse and handed it to him. Congratulations. Thanks. He laughed at the dollar sign on the candy. You didn't have to get me anything. No, but I wanted to. Reaching across the table, he pulled out a chair for her. Have a seat. She tossed her sweater over the chair but didn't sit. What would you like to drink? It's my treat, Cassie. I, tonight was about him, so she would allow him to pay and let the nickname slide. She's Saturday, since you're on your way to Megabucks, I'll have a caramel macchiato. I'll be right back. Chapter 4. As Troy placed his order at the counter, Cassandra noticed the assessing and approving glances of other women in the coffee shop. She couldn't blame them. He looked relaxed and casual in a pair of khakis and a navy Henley shirt. Not at all like the businessman she'd found last night. Thank goodness he ditched the silk tie and button-down shirt. Only his ruffled hair looked the same. And she liked that about him. A couple of minutes later, he placed two steaming cups on the table. Here you go. Thanks. She picked up the warm mug. To your prosperous future. Troy clicked his cup against hers. This is a great way to end an equally great day. As she stared at his long, thick eyelashes, she almost drifted into a daydream of an island vacation. Cassandra hadn't noticed his lush lashes last night. She wet her dry lips. Enough. Stop admiring him. She couldn't stand more complications in her life, and Troy McKnight would be a huge one. Cassandra sipped her drink. Too bad the hot liquid only added to the heat building within her. Troy set his cup on the table. I need this weekend to go well, especially after talking to Mick today. We wouldn't want to ruin your good fortune. Especially since the partnership isn't a sure thing, Troy said with a hint of concern in his voice. We're going to have to act like an engaged couple in front of your parents. But that will be for less than 48 hours. 48 hours didn't sound too long. I can handle it. Do the terms honey or sweetheart offend you? Not bad, a politically correct fiancé. 
I can live with them. What about you, darling? His eyes widened, and he sat straighter. She laughed. You're not the only one who gets to use terms of endearment, oh, love of my life. I hope you can live with the kissing, and hugging, and touching, Anne. I get the picture. He took another sip of his coffee. How do you want to start? Time to ruffle a few of those stiff feathers of his. Reaching over the table, she caressed the top of his hand. Do you mean with the kissing and touch? No, with the getting to know each other. She enjoyed the way he squirmed in his seat. Getting together tonight was turning out to be more fun than she thought it would be. I ask a question, and then you ask one. Sounds democratic, he said. You start since it's your celebration. How old are you? Troy asked. Thirty-two, she said. How old are you? Twenty-nine. She grinned. A younger man. Three years isn't that much. Not unless you're counting in dog years. His forehead wrinkled. Huh? Is that your question? Noah Troy started to speak but then checked himself. She'd seen the same hesitant look on her parents' faces many times. Just ask. I won't be offended. He paused. I don't mean to pry. What do you want to know? Are you in love with Eric? No, she said without hesitation. That was an easy one. No, that's it? You asked your question. Now it's my turn. She didn't want to explore her relationship with Eric Wainwright any further. She hoped she didn't sound too defensive, but this was a topic she didn't discuss with anyone. She tapped her toe. Can I continue, please? Troy asked. So much for fun. The compassion in his gaze softened her resolve. Go ahead. If you're not in love with Eric, why did you need a fiancé? Unrequited love. That was what Troy thought. Politically correct and a romantic. Not a bad combination. Except his assumption about her feelings toward her ex was wrong. She stopped tapping her foot. I didn't need a fiancé because of Eric. Troy's eyes narrowed. Then who? It's not important. Time to change the subject. She inhaled. Don't you love the smell of freshly brewed coffee? Who? Your sister? My parents. She swirled the contents of her cup. They, it's a long story. I'm not going anywhere. Troy sipped his coffee. Eric and I broke up over a year ago. She hoped Troy didn't ask why. Emily and Eric had betrayed her, but that wasn't public knowledge. Cassandra had been keeping that secret, though maybe she should reconsider staying quiet. Her parents might leave her alone if they knew the truth about how Emily's relationship with Eric started. After the wedding was cancelled, Cassandra continued. I wasn't interested in dating. And you haven't been interested in dating since then? Not really. She tried to sound nonchalant, but her insides twisted. Eric must have hurt you badly. Yes. She raised her mug. Breakups are difficult. Not just romantic ones. An image of Emily flashed in Cassandra's mind. She took a sip. Trusting anyone was difficult when her twin sister had hurt Cassandra far worse than Eric had, and she never wanted to have that happen again. Not letting others close seemed the best option. So far, that had worked well. Troy didn't say anything, but curiosity filled his gaze. The silence bristled. Cassandra shrugged though she wasn't sure why. What's the adage? Once bitten, twice shy. Your parents don't agree. No, if only her parents did, she would be fine. They think now that one twin is married, the other should be next. My dating life has become their personal pet project. Seriously, he asked. Unfortunately, yes. It started a little over four months ago. My parents invited me and a date to dinner. I wasn't seeing anyone, so I asked a friend. The memory brought a smile. Some of my friends are unconventional. Pierced body parts? She nodded. 
Rowdy is very nice. He'd give you the shirt off his tattooed back if you asked. Troy laughed. I assume your parents weren't thrilled at meeting Rowdy. You assume correctly. A couple of weeks after the infamous dinner, I bumped into my parents near Union Square. I was with another friend who happens to be a biker. Remembering the horrified expression on her mother's face made Cassandra laugh. My mother couldn't handle Otto with his spiked collar, shaved head, and black leather pants and jacket. So your parents were concerned about the men you were dating? Concerned is putting it mildly, and I wasn't dating either of them. Thinking back brought a sigh. Suddenly, my cell phone exploded with texts and calls from the sons and grandsons of my parents' friends asking me out. My mother made me an appointment with the city's top matchmaker. My father told me to join a gym so I could meet suitable men. They drove me crazy. You're lucky they care so much. I know they love me, but I couldn't stand their meddling in my personal life. They'd wanted me to bring a plus one to Emily's wedding, but I said I couldn't do to being the maid of honor. That had been the only good thing to being forced to stand at her sister's side during the ceremony. They still wouldn't let up, and their interfering got worse. Cassandra had been humiliated. Humiliated enough to invent a fictional fiancé. I figured a make-believe fiancé would be the easy way out. They could stop worrying, and I could have my life back. Only you don't have your life back, do you? Troy sounded almost regretful. His gentle voice and the tenderness in his eyes tugged at Cassandra's heart. She wondered how many hearts Troy McKnight had broken. Several, if her intuition were on track. She wouldn't want to join the list, she couldn't afford to join the list. Not yet, but I will soon, won't I? After the weekend. That couldn't come soon enough. On Friday, Troy drove his truck south on Highway 101. He had no doubt he would be certifiably insane by the time they arrived in Carmel. Dealing with the wrath of Dixon Daniels would be easier than fighting these raging hormones. After being crammed with Cassie in the cab of his small pickup for the past two and a half hours, he was reaching his breaking point. Her off-key singing had annoyed him at first, but now he missed the sound when she was quiet. She stretched her arms overhead. The movement accentuated her breasts. He fought the urge to look at her instead of the road. He gripped the steering wheel. Spending 48 hours in forced proximity was about 46 too long. At this rate, he would never survive. Each time she turned her head, he caught a whiff of perfume shampoo, soap. Her. She smelled fresh, a bit like citrus. He felt as if he had completed a workout and desperately needed a cool drink. Cassie was like a glass of lemonade on a hot summer day, but out of his reach. He needed a taste to quench his thirst. Who was he kidding? He wanted to guzzle. Pretty scenery. She stared out of the truck's window. Yes. That was the only word Troy could manage. He was in over his head. For the past three days, he'd thought about her at the most inopportune times, doodling her name during a board meeting and suggesting the name Cass Ale for a new beer during a meeting with a brewery startup. Nothing, however, had prepared him for what he was feeling now. Cassie spelled danger. Even her unconventional clothes were a turn-on. Strange, given nothing she wore could be considered fitted or tailored. He glanced her way. Her oversized yellow tunic, calf-length gauze skirt, and brown boots covered everything except her neck, head, and hands, but even with little skin showing, she looked sexier than a Victoria's Secret model. Luckily, Cassie seemed not to notice his current state. She questioned him about his background and seemed more interested in hearing about growing up in Missouri and his big family than what was happening in the truck. Good. Turn right up ahead, she said as they drove along a street with large, well-kept houses on either side. Stop on the driveway. The gate will open automatically. Troy stopped in front of a pair of closed 20 feet tall, wrought iron panels. Suddenly, they opened as if on cue. Keep following the driveway, she said. What kind of house needed a secure entrance? As he drove through the opening, 
he understood. A large two-story house that resembled a Mediterranean villa lay at the end of the drive. The white stucco home had archways, terraces, and balconies. He shouldn't be surprised by the size or details. Dixon Daniels had made a fortune in the 90s by taking high-tech startups public and continued to have success since then, but Troy hadn't expected a house, or an estate, this sprawling. Someday. Someday, I'm going to live in a place like this. First step, becoming a partner. Troy parked. Dixon walked out to greet them. A smile lit up his face and deepened the lines around his mouth and eyes. This had better work. Troy's career was hanging by a thin string, one that could unravel at any second. Cassie slid out of the front seat. She greeted her father with a hug. Hi, Dad. Good to see you, sweetheart. Dixon studied Troy's truck. Nice truck. Practical, too. Troy cleared his throat. A good thing he'd washed the truck before coming. It gets me around. Does it have four-wheel drive? Yes. Good in snow, I'll bet. Dixon smiled. We have a cabin in Tahoe. Do you ski? Cabin? Troy bet the place was more like a lodge. I love to ski. How was the drive? Dixon asked. Sixty-five all the way, sir. Not really. Fine. Did you take Highway 1? No, but we're talking about driving that way home. Do. It's a beautiful drive. Dixon smiled as Troy nodded in agreement. Did you hit much traffic? Some, but not as much as I thought for a Friday. Troy grabbed their bags and his golf clubs from the pickup. Surprisingly, Cassie's flowered print bag was smaller and lighter than his. Dixon took her bag from Troy's hand. Vanessa's in the kitchen fixing a snack. I hope you're hungry, son. Son. Dixon said the word as if he meant it. Troy swallowed the sudden lump of guilt lodged in his throat. Respected and liked in the industry, Dixon made killer deals and never showed any weaknesses. Troy saw one now. Dixon Daniels might be a powerful and intelligent businessman, but he had an Achilles heel, his daughters. I'm starved, Troy said. Cassie nodded. We wanted to arrive while it was still light. We didn't stop for dinner. You should always eat, Cassie, Dixon said like a typical father. If you don't eat three meals a day, you get cranky. Daddy. Cassie sounded horrified. I'm never cranky. Emily's the one who needs to eat, not me. Forehead wrinkling, Dixon rubbed his chin. It is your sister, he said finally. I'm sorry, sweetheart. Troy, forget what I said. As Cassie entered the house, Dixon grabbed Troy's shoulder to hold him back. Cassie gets cranky, too, Dixon whispered. Make sure she eats. Troy smiled. I will. He stepped inside. Terracotta tiles covered the entryway. Original artwork, illuminated by recessed lights, hung on the textured walls. The house looked like something out of an HGTV show, the ultimate after seen once a designer remodel was complete. Leave your bags in the foyer. We'll take them upstairs later, Dixon said. Let's go into the living room and relax. Cassie held Troy's hand and led him into the large room filled with elegant furniture. He'd grown up with five brothers and sisters in a four-bedroom farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. The sculpture in the corner of the room probably cost more than redoing his parents' house after a flood destroyed everything. No doubt, the painting hanging over the fireplace would pay off the mortgage on the farm. Cassie stopped in front of an elaborate flower arrangement. She broke a lily from its stem and tucked it behind her ear. Dixon motioned him to sit. Have a seat, Troy. The white couch looked too clean to sit on, but Cassie pulled him next to her. As she and Dixon chatted, Troy took in the room. He wasn't much into interior decorating other than watching his mom's favorite do-it-yourself cable TV shows, but he recognized quality. 
He'd visited mansions in Pacific Heights and estates in Hillsboro. He'd been impressed then, but this house overwhelmed him. Cassie elbowed him. Honey, do you want a drink? Sure, thanks. What would you like, sweetheart, a beer? Cassie asked. As Troy nodded, Dixon spoke up. I'll have one, too. Her nose crinkled. But, Dad, you always drink. I want a beer, Dixon said with authority, ending further discussion. Cassie kissed Troy's cheek. I'll be right back, sugar. Don't forget to see if your mother needs any help, Dixon added as she left the room. He dipped his head at Troy. You're going to have your hands full with her. Troy already did. She's spirited. That's one way to put it. Vanessa spoiled the girls. He didn't think so. Cassandra appeared to be the definition of unspoiled. Her wardrobe consisted of casual and eclectic clothes. More thrift or vintage store variety. Nothing like the designer labels other women he knew wore. When he picked her up earlier tonight, she'd been waiting on the porch of an old Victorian with peeling paint and squeaky front steps that had been converted into apartments based on the number of mailboxes. He assumed this was where she lived. I suppose I had a hand in spoiling them, too, Dixon added. It's difficult not to when you have all of this. Troy glanced around the room until his gaze rested on a photograph of Dixon's two daughters. The portrait showed a younger Emily and Cassie. Both wore sweaters and strands of pearls. Cassie looked so, normal. Troy leaned forward to get a better look. When was the portrait done? After they graduated from college. That would have been ten years ago. He squinted. Cassie looked so. Different, Dixon said. Yes. She was. Nothing like the nonconformist she is today, but. Let's just say Cassie got my stubborn streak. Once she decides something, that's it. She'll go to the extreme to prove her point. She's strong-willed. I respect that. Their pretend engagement was making Dixon open up and share things about his daughter, but Troy didn't want the conversation to go too far. Cassie and I will do fine. I'm happy to hear that. Dixon smiled. So, tell me. How is Mick treating you at the office? Has he offered you a partnership yet? Chapter 5 Cassandra walked toward the kitchen, unsure if this was her parents' house or not because her mother rarely cooked and her father had never asked for a beer. Who were these people? Where were her real mom and dad? At the doorway to the kitchen, Cassandra froze. The scent of fresh-baked brownies lingered in the air. A pan of them sat on the stove. Dirty bowls and pots filled the sink. If that wasn't a bizarre enough sight, her mother stood at the counter. She was, Cassandra did a double take, arranging a platter of vegetables. Cassandra blinked, but when she opened her eyes, the image remained. That was when Cassandra realized her mom wore a pale pink apron over her black pants and white blouse. That was not a normal fashion accessory for the refined and elegant Vanessa Daniels. Not knowing what to say, Cassandra went with the obvious. Can I help, mom? Her mother turned and smiled. I didn't hear you come in. I told your father to let me know when you arrived. He sent me in for beers. I think he wants to talk to Troy alone. I'm sure of it. Her mother returned to arranging the broccoli florets. He's been talking about Troy all week. Cassandra swallowed hard. Convincing her parents she and Troy didn't belong together might be more difficult than she anticipated. But, hopefully, her mom and dad would soon see they came from different worlds, with incompatible goals. A venture capitalist? Talk about repeating similar patterns. Not a big deal. Her parents would soon realize the relationship would never work. What should I do, she asked. How about you pour the beer? I chilled mugs. They're in the freezer. Chilled mugs? The theme from the X-Files might as well be playing. Who was this woman she called mom? 
Yes, the gourmet kitchen with its custom cabinets and state-of-the-art appliances looked the same as the last time Cassandra had been here, which was over six, maybe eight, months ago, but her mother rarely cooked and hired a caterer when they entertained. They ate out or had meals delivered otherwise. At least that was what they used to do. Even though Cassandra hadn't seen much of her parents unless they came to the city, she called them once a week. Nothing, however, had prepared Cassandra for the pioneer woman meets Martha Stewart personality takeover of her mom. This seemed wrong. Cassandra grabbed two mugs from the freezer and set them on the counter. The refrigerator contained three different brands of bottled beer. Does dad like a specific kind? Anyone will do, but give them both the same brand. Your father will want to know Troy's opinion about the beer. When did dad start drinking beer? She opened the bottles. I thought he only liked scotch. Your father has always liked beer, but he enjoys the craft ones the best. He keeps a spreadsheet of the brands he's tasted. Vanessa laughed. He's investing in his favorites. Leave it to her dad to turn something he enjoyed into a business. Cassandra poured the beer. Be sure to tilt the glass, her mother said. Your father is particular about his beer. Okay. Cassandra would never have imagined her dad as a beer connoisseur, but she tilted the glass as instructed. What are you making? Appetizers. Her mom wiped her hands on the apron. Stuffed mushroom caps, a vegetable tray, and brownies. Cassandra eyed the chocolate batter on a wooden spoon. I didn't think you enjoyed cooking. I do when I have the time, but I don't like cleaning up the mess. Her mother removed her apron. Your father had this wonderful kitchen remodeled for me, so I figured I should attempt to get a small return on his investment. Cassandra grabbed the spoon and licked the chocolate off. Dad must be happy. Her mom nodded. But he's gaining weight again. I'm sure the beer isn't helping. It isn't, but his doctor will be on him at his yearly exam. She'd grown up spending weekends and the summer months in this house, but Cassandra had been away for so long the place no longer felt like home. So much had changed. Her fault for staying away. Still. Thanks for going to so much trouble, Mom. I want Troy to feel like this is his home, too, her mom said. He's practically family. Practically family. The key word was practically. Cassandra held in a sigh. Well, almost. There's something you should know. Her mother's serious tone sent a chill along Cassandra's spine. What? Your father and I have been discussing this weekend's sleeping arrangements. Cassandra could handle this. She smiled. Let Troy have the guest room. I'll sleep in my room. That's what your father said, but I don't want Troy to think we're, well, prudes. Troy won't think that. Cassandra tucked her hair behind her ears. This is your house, and while we're staying here, we'll follow your rules. It's just, I'm so happy you found him. I don't want to do anything to, uh, screw it up. In a manner of speaking, yes. Her mother looked uncomfortable at the choice of words. You're old enough to make your own decisions. Now that Cassandra had found an acceptable fiancé, she could make her own decisions without parental interference. Unbelievable. She ran a successful independent bookstore, which wasn't exactly easy to do in the digital age, paid her bills on time, visited her dentist every six months, and still received no respect. But bring home a handsome, respectable male and bam, she was an adult? That pissed her off. I'm 32. I grew up a long time ago. I know, but you'll always be my little girl. Maybe it was a mom thing, but Cassandra was long past being a kid. When your father spent the weekend with my parents for the first time, he was so nervous I thought he would sweat to death, her mom said. Troy needs you close. Her mother was usually more direct. What are you saying? The two of you can share your room. Cassandra almost dropped the beer bottle. But. Her mother raised an eyebrow. I thought you would be happy. I'm shocked. That was the last thing Cassandra expected to hear. She didn't want to share her bedroom with a stranger. 
not that Troy was strange. He was cute, but she only knew him well enough to call him her fiancé, not to share her room with him. She clutched the counter. There had to be a way out. What about dad? I don't want to cause problems between the two of you. I can handle your father, her mother said with confidence. It's time he realized you're not ten years old. Really, mom? Troy and I don't mind. We don't want to do anything to make you and dad feel uncomfortable. We are fine with the arrangements. Cassandra's lips tightened. What would Troy say? Wipe your face, dear, her mother said. You have chocolate on your cheek. Chocolate was the least of Cassandra's worries, but she wiped her face with a paper towel. Thanks. One more thing. I do hope you've been practicing safe sex. Mother, really? Cassandra wondered how many times her mother would shock her tonight, but sex wasn't a topic she wanted to discuss with her mom. Not ever. I was young once, Cassandra. Just take care of yourself, okay? This visit was turning into a nightmare. Okay, she was the one to blame for starting the ruse in the first place, but still. She gritted her teeth. Okay. Vanessa grabbed the platters. Let's serve the food. Fine. Because Cassandra couldn't take much more of this mother-daughter chat before she lost her mind or her temper. How many more hours until she could go back to San Francisco? The clock struck midnight. Cassandra's clothing wasn't going to turn into rags like Cinderella, but the long day was catching up to her. She yawned. Troy's arm was around her shoulder. He gave her a squeeze. Tired? Afraid that her voice might betray her emotions, she nodded. He was so at ease around her parents and her. He'd either read a book about being the perfect fiancé or had experienced charming mothers and fathers. He was so attentive she could almost believe he wanted to marry her. If being a V.C. didn't work out, he could try acting. He had the talent and the looks for the silver screen. I didn't realize how late it is, kids. All the tasty food and conversation made us lose track of time. Her dad stood. His delighted smile confirmed he didn't suspect a thing about their so-called engagement. Let's get you settled upstairs. As her mother led the way up the flight of stairs, Cassandra followed slowly. Each step sent her closer to the impending doom of sharing a room and her bed. Her stomach nodded. Maybe her dad would say something. Her mother opened the bedroom door and turned on the light. Her shoulders slumped. Dixon. He ran up the stairs and peered around Cassandra. Yes, dear? What have you done? Her mother didn't sound pleased. Nothing. I can't believe you, her mother mumbled. You're going to mess this up. The indignant tone of her mom's whispers surprised Cassandra. She nudged past her parents and into her bedroom. What? The queen-sized bed had been replaced by two twin beds. Thank you, daddy. Cassandra held in her laughter. Her mother might have won the battle, but her father had won the war. Where is Cassandra's bed? Her mom asked. Cassie's mattress was old and lumpy, dear. She needed a new mattress, so I bought her one. Her mom touched her forehead. You bought two. They were on sale, her father said. Two for the price of one. Her mother stared at the purple and white striped comforters. Where did you get the bedding? They were on sale, too. Well, at least they match and are her favorite color. Vanessa shrugged. I hope you don't mind, Cassandra. Cassandra smiled at her good fortune. This is fine. Isn't it, Troy? Troy entered the room and set his bag on the closest bed. Yes, of course. Good night, kids. Her father's smile looked almost smug. These walls are thin, so let us know if we're keeping you awake. His comment earned him an elbow jab from her mother. As he walked out of the room, he left the door ajar. Cassandra rubbed her warm face. She doubted anything would ease her embarrassment. My father isn't known for his subtlety. Hey, I know where I stand. 
Troy flashed her a charming grin. If I touch you under his roof, he'll come after me with a shotgun. Cassandra laughed. She appreciated his sense of humor. You'd better keep your hands to yourself, then. I assume we're sharing this room. Troy didn't sound very happy with the idea. Yes, and you can blame my mother for that. At least my father had sense enough to buy twin beds. What used to be in here? A queen-size four-poster bed. She left out the description of the carved antique oak headboard. She didn't want to scare Troy off, nor did she want to inspire any romantic dreams of her own. A queen, he asked. She nodded, understanding his concern. I'm so happy to see these two beds. I'm relieved, too. Troy touched the mattress. I wish I could thank your father. Cassandra wished Troy didn't sound so happy about the two twins. Would sharing a bed with her be that miserable? Not that she wanted to sleep with him, but his obvious relief stung. She might not be cover model gorgeous, but men asked her out. She just never said yes. He looked around. I can't believe they're letting us share a room. This is my mother's idea, but my father drew the line at us sharing a bed. I'm not sure he'd let us do that once we were married. You're probably right. Cassandra wondered what sharing a bed with Troy would be like. Given his height and athletic build, he would take up a lot of space. If he were a blanket hog, though, his body would keep her warm. Troy rubbed his eyes. Not that we'll find out. True. She ignored the twinge of regret. What was going on? No regret or disappointment allowed. Cassandra wasn't interested in Troy McKnight as anything other than her fake fiancé. As soon as this pretend engagement was over, she would never see him again. Two more days. Do you want to use the bathroom first? she asked. No, you can. She grabbed her toiletry kit from her bag. Troy unzipped his luggage, reached inside, and then tossed her a shirt. Here. She stared at the white t-shirt. What's this for? Did you bring pajamas? No. Wear it. His hard tone surprised her. He'd never sounded that way to her. Her gaze traveled from the shirt to him. Are you always this bossy? Only when my sanity is at stake. She wasn't sure whether to take his comment as a compliment or not. Then again, he was uptight and predictable. No spontaneity, no adventure, no fun. Maybe this weekend she could help him lighten up. Might as well start now. Were you a Boy Scout, Troy? Eagle Scout. Cassandra winked at him. Does that mean you're always prepared? He swallowed. Good. She'd caught him off guard. Prepared? His voice cracked. For what? For whatever might come up. She hadn't flirted in months. Okay, a year. But she pasted on the most come-hither smile she could muster. We are engaged, and my parents will want us to act like a couple in love. She'd expected to see a deer-in-the-headlights expression on his face, not a sexy bring-it-on grin that sent her pulse racing like a race car at Mazda Raceway Laguna Seca. He walked toward her. Each of his steps forward made her want to take one back. If you mean, am I prepared to provide sound effects through the thin wall? Yes, I am. The question is, are you? Maybe trying to get him to lighten up hadn't been her smartest idea. Sure. The word flew out of her mouth, and she ran into the bathroom. The door closing didn't bring any relief. Uh-oh. Troy might be prepared, but she wasn't. Not for him. She forced herself to breathe. As Troy paced the length of the bedroom, his gaze strayed to the closed bathroom door. What was he doing? He should have gone first so he could have been asleep when Cassie came out. Yeah, right. He doubted he'd sleep tonight sharing a room with her, only a few feet separating her bed from his, and his brain unable to stop thinking about her. Troy dragged his hand through his hair. The bathroom door opened. He stopped pacing and struck what he hoped was a casual, doing nothing but looking cool pose. Cassie carried her clothes. 
she wore his t-shirt. Giving her that hadn't been one of his smartest moves. The hem of the shirt brushed the top of her thighs. Her breasts, no bra, pressed against the thin fabric. Such luscious curves. Troy sucked in a breath. He should have brought the flannel pajamas his mother had given him last Christmas and had Cassie wear those. Or a dress shirt. Anything that covered her more. It's all yours, she said. He wanted it, all of it. He gulped. Cassie had meant the bathroom, of course. But that could wait. He much preferred the view in the bedroom. There are clean towels in the cabinet, she added. He forced his gaze from her never-ending legs. Leering was not acceptable fiancé behavior. Okay. Troy removed his shaving kit and a pair of shorts from his bag, walked into the bathroom, and slammed the door. He gritted his teeth. If he weren't careful, a cold shower would be in his near future. Cassie might not be like the career-driven women he wanted to date. Or would date if he made the time, but she was sexy. Her sexiness must be the reason he was on edge. That and not dating anyone. He'd been without a woman's company for too long. Cassie wasn't the one driving him crazy. Any attractive woman would be having the same effect on him. Yes, that explained his physical attraction to her. Troy splashed cold water on his face. Now that he knew the cause, he could control it. He was here because of his career. His future as a venture capitalist was what mattered, nothing else. He'd been handed a golden opportunity to spend time with Dixon Daniels, one Troy wouldn't waste on hormones and the need for instant gratification. He'd survived this long. No reason to do something stupid that could mess up everything he'd worked so hard to achieve. After Troy finished in the bathroom, he opened the door and froze. The top sheet and comforter of Cassie's bed had been turned down. She sat cross-legged on the mattress with the flowers still tucked behind her ear. The hem of her t-shirt, well, his, rode high on her thighs. Cassie glanced at him, but she didn't say a word. He cleared his throat. I'm sorry if I interrupted you. You didn't. She pulled the edge of the shirt lower. I finished meditating. Do you do that every night? Not every night. She pulled up the covers. But it helps keep the stress levels down. Troy couldn't imagine what stress she could have unless the stars and planets were out of alignment. Okay, maybe that wasn't fair, but she seemed so free-spirited. The only thing that seemed to bother her was her family's meddling. Have you tried yoga? she asked. Uh, no. Works wonders after a long day at the office. I'm not the yoga type. She stared at him with a serious look. No, you're not. The certainty in her voice bothered him, her slight grin that followed did, too. The light switch is on your right, she said. Troy glimpsed a white lace bra lying on top of her yellow shirt. He blinked, hurriedly flicking off the light switch. It was going to be a long night. He climbed into bed. He hadn't slept in a single bed since college, but that one had an extra long mattress. His feet hung over the edge on this one. Good night, Cassie. Good night, Troy. He didn't close his eyes. Something was on the ceiling. Were those lights? Troy blinked and then refocused. Huh. They looked like stars. He took a closer look and located the Big Dipper. Cassie, he asked. What? There are stars on the ceiling. Yes. He searched the fluorescent dots and saw Orion. Why are there stars? I love to stargaze. Me, too. Growing up on the farm, I got spoiled. With no city lights to interfere, the sky is always full of stars. Troy searched for other constellations. He found Andromeda and Eridanus. Who did this for you? When I was younger, I would lie in the backyard and stare at the stars with my planisphere in hand. One winter, it got so cold my mother thought I'd catch pneumonia. 
My father had these glow-in-the-dark stars put on the ceiling so I could stay warm while I scanned the sky for constellations. Your dad did a great job. He hired astronomers to place them, so it's pretty accurate. For a bedroom ceiling, that is. Troy located the Pleiades. He couldn't imagine having Vanessa and Dixon Daniels as parents, or the money they must have spent to replicate the stars by sticking fluorescent replicas on a ceiling. Someday. My mother hated us going out in the winter, too. Troy could barely move by the time his mom finished dressing him for an evening of stargazing in the chilly air. But on the clearest and coldest night, you could see what seemed like a million stars in the sky. Cassie sighed. Sounds like heaven. Why did you leave? I got tired of living on a farm. I watched my parents grow old worrying about money, about the weather, about grain prices. About how to pay for their children's college education, their own retirement, and groceries. His father was only 52, but he had lines of worry etched on his forehead. It wasn't fair how little he had to show for all his hard work. That's just life, Troy admitted. But the hardships are multiplied by five, sometimes ten, when you're a farmer. But aren't there pluses to living on a farm? Cassie asked. No crowds, no traffic, lots of open spaces. True, but Troy didn't want to live hand to mouth or harvest to harvest. The only way to get what he wanted was to move to the big city. Leaving his family and the only lifestyle he'd known had been a sacrifice, but one he'd make again. Cassie grew up rich. She wouldn't understand his reasons or be able to comprehend how his family still struggled although he sent money and flew back on his vacations to help during the busy times. There are pros and cons floods and droughts, he said in a matter-of-fact tone. So many things are out of your control. Farming isn't an easy way to make a living. I always thought farming would be fun. Cassie sounded as if she disapproved his reasons. At times, it's fun, but there's work involved. Hard, back-breaking work no matter what the conditions are outside. A star fell from the ceiling. Did you see that? she asked in a wistful voice. What? A falling star. Her childlike excitement brought a smile to his face. Make a wish, Troy. Wish on a plastic star. He rolled his eyes. She probably tossed coins into fountains, too. It's not a real star, Cassie. So. It can't hurt. She went quiet. Did you make a wish? Yes. He had wished for a BMW. He didn't need a PhD in human behavior to know she wouldn't take no for an answer. What did you wish for? If I tell you, my wish won't come true, she said. Although, I've always thought you could learn a lot about a person by knowing what they wished for. Troy wondered what he could learn from Cassie's wish. She probably wished for world peace or an end to hunger. I'm happy you made a wish, Troy. I thought you were a total stick in the mud. She rolled over so her back faced him. Sweet dreams. You too, Cassie. He stared at the ceiling. Another star fell. He made a wish. No way was he a stick in the mud. Except. His muscles tensed. Did wishes tell something about a person? If so, what did it say about him? Troy wasn't sure he wanted to know because this second wish shocked him. He should have wished for a partnership or his own company, but he hadn't. He had wished for Cassie. Chapter 6 The smell of freshly brewed coffee tickled Cassandra's nose. She stretched her arms over her head and then slowly opened her eyes. Sunlight peeked through the blinds. Unbelievably, she felt well rested. That surprised her. With Troy only a few feet away, wearing a pair of gray athletic shorts and no shirt, she couldn't believe she'd fallen asleep. But she had and dreamed of a man with brown hair. A surprisingly romantic dream, full of long glances and slow kisses. But she knew better than most that dreams didn't come true. Still, she kept wishing on stars and blowing out candles, just in case. Hoping for the best didn't hurt. 
and if today went as well as last night, tomorrow she would be able to say, goodbye, to her fiancé for the weekend. She wiggled her toes in anticipation. Smiling, she glanced over at Troy. His bed was not only empty but had also been made. Oh, no. Troy and her parents. Alone. Panicked, Cassandra bolted upright. She gripped the edge of the comforter. One tiny foul up and her intelligent parents would figure out the engagement was a scam. The whole fake fiancé ruse would blow up in her face. She could handle the consequences, but what about Troy? Just because she'd made a mess of her life didn't mean she needed to wreck his, too. Cassandra jumped out of bed and raced for the door. Halfway down the hall, she skidded to a stop. Pants. She needed pants. Running to her room, Cassandra saw a pair of gray shorts on Troy's bed. She tossed them on, pulling the drawstring tight so they wouldn't fall off. Let me get there in time. Please. Cassandra ran down the stairs. Voices sounded in the kitchen. Heart pounding, she picked up the pace. Her mother, her father, and Troy. What a nightmare. As she entered the kitchen, she crossed her fingers behind her back. Sunlight streamed through the windows. Everything looked bright and cheery. She hoped that was a good sign. Her mother stood at the counter while her father and Troy sat at the table in the breakfast nook. Good morning, Cassandra said. Troy's royal blue polo shirt intensified the color of his eyes. The power of his gaze took her breath away. Her pulse sped up. Good morning, Cassandra. Her mother closed the waffle iron and wiped her hands on the front of a yellow apron. You're up early. Cassandra glanced at the microwave clock. What time is it? 7.30, her father said with a twinkle in his blue eyes. Couldn't you sleep, Cassie? She combed her fingers through her messy hair. No sense sleeping the day away, Dad. He laughed. Troy, you must be a good influence. When Cassie was a teenager, she never woke up until noon. Troy's smile showed off his straight, white teeth. Nine o'clock seems to be her usual time now. Wait, what? How did he know what time she got up? He picked up his mug and drank. Cassandra found herself staring at him again. She frowned. Why was she having such a difficult time not looking at him? His hair, of course. Troy's damp waves begged to be touched. That had to be the reason. Did you sleep well, beautiful? Troy asked. He'd called her beautiful. Not that he meant it, but her pulse kicked up a notch. Yes, so well I didn't hear you get up. I tried to be quiet. Looks like I succeeded. Cassandra ignored his playful tone. Yes, you did. She had been too busy dreaming about him. She should have asked someone else to be her fiancé instead. Troy was too gorgeous for his own good. And hers, too. You said good morning to me, Troy said. I did? Cassandra couldn't remember. She hadn't made a pass at him, had she? No, she hadn't. She didn't sleepwalk or anything as far as she knew. Nodding, Troy set his coffee cup on the table. Come over here, so I can say good morning properly. Cassandra blushed. Her parents' pleased glances matched their wide smiles. They thought she and Troy were a couple. She should be happy, but she couldn't quite relax. As she walked toward Troy, her heartbeat resembled a drum roll. This is an act. This isn't real. She repeated the mantra in her mind. Troy pulled her onto his lap. He caressed her cheek with his fingertips, sending a pleasant shiver down her spine. You look cute in my clothes. He winked and then kissed her. His mouth was warm. He tasted like French roast coffee and something else she couldn't define. His kiss was softer than she expected, a little tentative but sweet, too. He pulled away. Too soon. As his lips hovered near hers, his breath fanned her mouth like a soft feather. The tingles on her lips spread through her. Cassandra wanted more. Good morning, my love. Leaning back, Troy broke the spell. 
She blinked. He'd mesmerized her. But none of this was for real. The kissing had been an act. A visual effect like the sound effects he'd mentioned last night. Her body, however, seemed to be unclear of the point. Every nerve ending pulsated with sensation and electricity. Goosebumps covered her legs and arms. The kitchen must be cold. Except she wasn't cold. She felt downright feverish. That must be from the heat radiating from Troy's body. Men were always warm. Maybe some distance would help. She scooted to the empty chair next to Troy. He placed his arm around her shoulder. Be careful. Be very careful. Her mother set a plate with a steaming Belgian waffle in front of Troy. Would you like strawberries and whipped cream? No, thanks. He removed his arm from Cassandra's shoulder and placed his napkin on his lap. Butter and syrup are fine. Want a cup of coffee, Cassie? Her dad asked. Iced coffee would cool her down, but she nixed the idea. She needed to keep everything as normal as possible. I'd love a cup. Dixon filled her mug and then added a dash of milk and sugar, which was how she liked it. Thanks, Dad. Cassandra took a sip. The coffee tasted like Troy. And his kiss. Something she didn't want to think about during breakfast. Or ever. You haven't been kissed in over a year. That's all. After Eric, you didn't like being kissed. Forget Troy's kiss. Cassandra set her cup on the table. Her mother placed a plate in front of her. Here's your waffle, sweetheart. The waffle was piled high with strawberries, whipped cream, and chocolate sauce. Her favorite breakfast dish looked delicious. So how come she would rather have another taste of Troy instead? Thanks, Mom. Troy raised an eyebrow. You like chocolate sauce on your waffles? Yes, she said. Among other things. I like peanut butter and syrup on French toast, he said. So does Cassie. Her dad smiled as if he'd made another million. Vanessa, did you hear that? They both like peanut butter on their French toast. Her father sounded pleased, but liking peanut butter and syrup wasn't a strong enough foundation to build a relationship on. She and Troy were unsuited for each other. He wore Italian silk suits and leather shoes, while she wore 100% cotton and preferred going barefoot. He worked to make money, she worked to enjoy her passion, books. She could list other examples. They had nothing in common. As soon as they stopped pretending to like each other, their differences would be crystal clear to both of her parents. Peanut butter and syrup aside. As Cassandra took a bite of her waffle, she paid closer attention to her parents to keep from focusing on Troy. Her mother seemed to be comfortable cooking once again. Her father wore his golf attire, a purple shirt, an argyle sweater, and green pants. What's your tea time, Dad? she asked. Nine o'clock. He leaned against his chair. Troy and I are having lunch at the lodge after we finish. Daddy and Troy. Alone. No way. She couldn't let them go without her. If Troy said the wrong thing and her dad discovered the truth, this weekend could backfire. Troy's career would be ruined, and she would have to put up with her parents' endless advice and matchmaking. Or worse, what if her father believed they were as perfect a couple as they pretended to be? No. 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 Her father needed to see her and Troy together. That was the only way for her dad to understand why they shouldn't get married or be upset when they broke up. Mind if I join you? Cassandra flashed her cutest smile at her father, a grin that had been fail-safe when she was growing up. Don't you remember what happened the last time I took you to the course? Her dad laughed. Troy, whatever you do, don't let Cassie play golf. She loses too many balls. So much for being cute. The balls are small, and I don't understand why there are so many ponds and sand traps between the holes. Why anyone would pay all that money and suffer so much frustration was beyond her. Time for a new tactic. I won't play, but let me drive the cart. No, her father said. She slapped her palm against the table. I'm a good driver. 
Her dad shook his head. You don't own a car, Cassie. She glanced at Troy, willing him to help her. He shrugged. What kind of a fiancé was he? She would have to talk to him about what was expected. I'll caddy. Unwilling to give up without a fight, she studied her fork as if the tines would provide inspiration. I'm good with numbers. I can keep score. Her father narrowed his eyes. She ran the risk of ruining her own plans with her good intentions. Her dad would see right through her. She hated golf. Her family knew that. Honey, I know you want to be with Troy, but your mother has a special day planned for you. It's been months since you've been here. Her father's tone softened. You wouldn't want to disappoint her, would you? The expectant look in her mother's eyes hit Cassandra like a stack of George R. R. Martin hardcovers falling from a top shelf at her store. Guilt followed. Her mouth felt as if it were coated in sand. She didn't want to hurt her mom, but how far was Cassandra willing to go with this ruse? She created a fictional fiancé to stop her parents meddling. She brought home her pseudo-fiancé. What came next? A pretend wedding? Or worse, a real one? She fought the urge to grimace and forced a smile instead. No, I'm sure mom and I will have a wonderful time. Oh, we will. Her mother's hazel eyes sparkled. Just like the last time. Cassandra remembered spending a day at a trendy spa, aka the beauty salon from hell. She'd spent hours convincing a hairdresser named Sean Paul that she not only liked the length of her hair, but she also liked the color, too. Clenching her fork, she kept smiling. What are we going to do? Vanessa's eyes widened. It's a surprise, but we're going to have so much fun. Just wait. Cassandra suppressed a groan. More likely, she would hate whatever was planned. Her mother and Emily had a different definition of fun. Being primped and pampered didn't appeal to Cassandra. Not that she had a choice today. Cassandra bit into a forkful of her waffle. She was tough. She was resilient. If Jean-Paul and her hair weren't involved, she could handle anything. At least, she hoped so. After breakfast, Troy stepped into the bedroom and then stopped. He'd thought Cassie would have been showered and dressed by the time he finished eating another waffle. He'd been wrong. Dead wrong. His muscles bunched. Cassie stood in the middle of the room. She wore a dark flower print dress. A feminine pattern and style that looked good on her. The only problem, her fingers fumbled with the zipper. A black bra contrasted against white skin. He stiffened. I'll be back in a minute. You don't have to go. She faced him. I want to talk to you. Talk. How about another kiss? No, that wouldn't be right. Except he wanted to kiss her. She'd looked cuddly, sexy, and sleep-rumpled in his clothes when she appeared for breakfast. She looked downright beautiful now. Focus. Do you need help? Help. Now you offer help. Cassandra rolled her eyes. I needed your help downstairs. What are you talking about? I wanted you to convince my father that I should go golfing with you. She struggled with the zipper again. But you said nothing, nada, zilch. What did you want me to say? Let Cassie drive the cart. Troy touched her hand. You're going to ruin your dress. Let me try. Cassie lifted her single braid, a thick, golden plate that made him think of Rapunzel. As he reached for the zipper, his hand brushed against her back. Her skin was warm. She tensed. That caused him to do the same. Man, this wasn't good. Whatever chemistry existed between them, Cassie felt it, too. Knowing that didn't help. Troy ignored the graceful curve of her neck and the softness of her skin. The zipper was stuck on the edge of the fabric. He tugged until he freed the teeth, zipped up the dress, and let go. All done, he said. I'll be downstairs. Thanks, but we need to talk. She placed her hands on her hips. 
couldn't you tell I wanted to go golfing? Yes, but, he hesitated because she wouldn't like the truth. But. I didn't want you to go with us. What? Not so loud, he said, worried Dixon might hear through the so-called thin walls. Why didn't you want me to go? Things are going well. Things are not going well. Did you see the starry look in my parents' eyes? He nodded. They were smiling so much I thought I was in the middle of a toothpaste commercial. They think we're the perfect couple. Exactly. Cassie sounded annoyed. See the problem? I don't, Troy said. We decided to act like an engaged couple. You get your parents off your back. I get my partnership. Engaged couple, yes. Cassie plopped on her bed. But not soul mates destined to be together forever. You're overreacting. We've been here a little over twelve hours. Your parents can't believe we're destined to be together forever in such a short time. I think they do. Cassandra tapped her bare foot against the floor. If we don't stop our happy couple routine, I'll have to live the rest of my life hearing about Troy McKnight, the other one who got away. The other one? He hoped she didn't mean Eric. Troy wouldn't ask given the pained expression on Cassie's face. It won't be that bad. You don't know my parents. I still don't understand what this has to do with golfing. Men. She glanced at the ceiling. The more time we spend together, the easier it will be for my parents to see we shouldn't be engaged. No way. He had too much riding on this weekend to reverse tactics. We decided to act like an engaged couple while we're here. We were going to worry about breaking up later. We can't change our plans now. Her jaw tensed. Haven't you heard anything I've said? He didn't know why she was taking this so seriously. Granted, she wanted to stop her parents' matchmaking attempts, but she was too emotional and involved, enough so she wasn't seeing the situation clearly. I heard you, but I disagree. You're not going to convince my father to let me come with you. No, you're going to go out with your mother and enjoy yourself. Troy wished Cassie would smile, but she looked mad at the world. Well, him. I want to spend time with your father. Alone, if possible. Yes, that's selfish, but he's a great contact to have, and I might learn tricks of the trade. Maybe he can teach me some things that will ensure my partnership. I should have known. She rubbed her forehead. All you care about is how this affects you and your career. That's not true. Yes, it is. Cassie narrowed her eyes. You can't do anything to risk your precious partnership. I've never hidden my reasons for wanting to be here this weekend. Silence. Listen, Cassie. Your parents don't need us to show them we aren't the perfect couple. Just look at the two of us. It's obvious we don't belong together. She raised her chin. I'll say it's obvious. Two people couldn't be more different. You're much too conservative for me. You're too spontaneous for me. At least I wouldn't use anybody and anything to get ahead. Hey. Her words bristled. He didn't like her putting this all on him. This fake engagement wasn't my idea. You approached me. I'm making the best of the situation. You need to do the same. I'm trying. Try harder. Her lips pressed together. The glance she shot him wasn't full of daggers but missiles. She'd been upset before, but this felt different. What's the problem? Troy didn't get why she was acting this way. You're Miss Spontaneous, or so you claim. Just roll with it. She frowned. Thanks for the advice, Mr. Rigid. I'm not rigid. I bet you have a plan to get you where you want to be. Troy did, his master plan. And it was working. Or it had been. Slowly. Until he met Cassie. Let me guess. A partnership at thirty, she said. Your first million by thirty-two. Retirement at thirty-five. Forty. 
She had guessed the milestones but missed the ages by a few years. Where does happiness play into your plan? she asked. When I succeed, I'll be happy. Cassie rolled her eyes. You really are just like. Her father, Troy hoped. Who? Eric. That wasn't what Troy wanted to hear, but that was one more reason they were so wrong for each other. Chapter 7 Lunch at a quaint cafe in downtown Carmel reminded Cassandra of childhood outings with her mom. She enjoyed the one-on-one -on -one time. Over the past year, her mother had wanted to do things with both her and Emily. That was why Cassandra always declined. Today would have been nice except that the not-as-subtle-as-she-thought-she-was Vanessa Daniels had taken on the role of Troy's personal publicist and wouldn't stop talking about him. Don't you think he has the bluest of eyes? Yours are beautiful, but his, her mother sipped her iced tea. Gorgeous is the only way to describe them. How much longer was this going to go on? Cassandra stabbed at the piece of marinated grilled chicken in her salad. Troy also has the most charming smile, her mother continued. Wouldn't you agree? Not trusting her voice, Cassandra nodded. You're not eating much. Her mother's gaze softened. Missing Troy? Cassandra shoved a crouton into her mouth even though she wasn't hungry. Chewing was better than answering. Her mother glanced at her cell phone. Look at the time. We have an appointment at one o'clock. Cassandra managed not to touch her hair or frown. Fun. As much fun as having the stomach flu would be. We can get dessert afterward, her mother said. Nodding again, Cassandra thought of Troy. She wondered how his day of golfing was going. He had no idea how easily this situation could spin out of control, or maybe he didn't care because his focus was on how this weekend could help his career. That was how Eric had been, so she shouldn't be surprised. Still. Her appetite, well, what little remained, disappeared. I'm finished. I ate too much at breakfast. That was hours ago. The waffles were that good. She kept a smile on her face. So, what's the appointment for? Twenty minutes later, Cassandra found out. Swallowing around the lump in her throat, she stood in an elegant bridal salon. The white fabrics, lace, and sparkling crystals hurt her heart. This is sweet of you to arrange, Mom, but Troy and I haven't set a wedding date. Trying on dresses is premature. Perhaps, but humor your mother. None of this was amusing to Cassandra. Tension built at her temples. Any moment, a massive headache would erupt. Smiling hurt her jaw, but she had no choice. She had created this lie. She needed to live with the consequences. Okay. Mustering enthusiasm wasn't happening. She couldn't, not when all she could think about was the last time she tried on wedding dresses. She'd been so excited to be getting married to Eric. Putting on a white dress had made their engagement more real. Her friend and co-worker Mo had gone with her, giving his advice with each gown she tried on. They'd laughed and had so much fun until they found the right one. Now all she felt was dread. She rubbed her neck. Think of this as a trial. Her mother beamed. Who knows? You may find something you like. Cassandra hoped not. That would make the situation worse. Let's get you comfortable in a dressing room. Ginger Soren, the 50-something owner of Bridal Couture, wore a hot pink suit and matching pumps. Thick black eyeliner emphasized her sea green eyes and contoured cheekbones. She wore her beach blonde hair in an elegant French twist. Follow me, please. Cassandra did, with her mother at her side. So much pink and white. Crystals, too. Fancy and feminine described the decor. The dressing room was the size of a small bedroom with a pale pink velvet settee and two queen and chairs positioned near a raised platform that was surrounded by three huge mirrors. No doubt for the bride to model the wedding gowns. This was going to be a nightmare. One of her own making. Ginger studied Cassandra like a butcher eyeing a slab of beef. You have a lovely figure. Several of the popular styles will take advantage of your curves. I'll be right back. 
Her mom rubbed her palms together. Isn't this fun? I can't believe we're doing this. Ginger tapped on the dressing room door and then walked in with three white dresses before Cassandra could reply. Off-the-shoulder styles are the rage. This one, however, adds 3D floral embellishments, so you'll stand out from other brides. Okay. Cassandra didn't know what else to say, but the monstrous pile of white fabric spiked her blood pressure. So not good. Stress affected her sleep and health. She'd learned that before opening the bookstore. She would be lucky if she survived the weekend without becoming exhausted or sick. Or both. Ginger helped her into the gown and used plastic clips to adjust the back. The sample is loose to fit a wide range of sizes, but we would order one based on your measurements. What do you think? No was the first thing that popped into Cassandra's head, but she needed to play along for her mother's sake. It's stylish. I like the tighter fit through my hips and thighs, but the layered skirt and flowers on the bodice are a bit too much for me. She might not be conventional by her family's definition, but she wasn't the type to wear avant-garde fashion. I agree, her mother said. Ginger motioned for Cassandra to turn around so she could unbutton the dress. Let's get you into another gown. One down, two to go. Cassandra could handle this. Sure. The dress came off. Another sleeveless one went on. Ginger clipped the material. This one has a fit and flare skirt but cleaner lines. The plunging neckline will show the bra you're wearing today. That's an easy fix for your wedding day. What do you think? Cassandra eyed her reflection. Two words came to mind of fake and phony. I like the simpler lines, but I'm not comfortable with the low neckline. I agree about the neckline. Her mother tapped her chin. It's also a little too plain. There's no texture to the fabric. No sparkle. A bride needs a little more, pizzazz. Wonderful input. The third dress is similar, so we'll skip that one. Ginger smiled. Yay! Cassandra cheered silently. Now they could get dessert. Her appetite was returning. Ginger motioned for her to turn. Let's get you out of this, and I'll get some more. More? The word slipped out of Cassandra's mouth. Of course, dear, her mother said. We want to narrow down the styles you like. Standing in a pair of underwear and a bra, Cassandra wanted only to put her clothes on and get out of here. Her last dress had never been worn other than for alterations and the final fitting. Maybe the bride who'd purchased it from her had better luck. Ginger returned with more gowns. She helped Cassandra into the next one. Oh, my. Ginger clapped her hands. Her mom sighed. You look as though you stepped from the cover of a bride magazine. Ginger nodded. This is an A-line dress with an illusion bodice that's been hand-beaded. The extra layer on the skirt not only provides texture but also volume. What do you think? The crystal beading on the dress shimmered under the light of the chandelier hanging overhead. Beautiful, but the gown was like the one Emily had worn on her wedding day. An engagement ring-sized lump lodged in Cassandra's throat. Her stomach churned. A good thing she hadn't eaten much lunch. Cassandra wanted to go home. She wanted to run away and forget about her family and Troy. She swallowed. It's lovely, but the style is more my sister's than mine. Her mother tapped her chin. Now that I look closer, the gown does seem familiar. The designer is the same. I thought since they were twins, they might want similar styles. Ginger pursed her glossed lips. It's a spectacular dress, her mother reassured. But my daughters have different tastes. Like Waterford and Orifers. I understand. Ginger unbuttoned the back. Let me get you out of this. I have others that will work better. After Ginger had left the dressing room, her mother sighed. I should have been clearer to Ginger about your tastes. Like I'd want anything to remind me of Emily's wedding. She would donated her maid of honor dress and dyed to match shoes to a thrift store the day after the wedding. Sweetheart, I know you're still upset over your sister marrying Eric, but everything worked out for the best. 
he wouldn't have made you happy. Her mom's words were true. Cassandra doubted Eric would make Emily happy either, but that was her sister's problem. Still, Cassandra's parents didn't know what Emily had done. No one knew the full story or how the betrayal by two people Cassandra loved made trusting anyone difficult. She wanted to trust, but no matter how hard she tried, she couldn't. Putting the past behind wasn't easy. Not when she couldn't forget the pain of having her heart ripped out by her then-fiancé and twin sister. Maybe Cassandra should finally tell her mom what. Once we find you a wedding dress, you'll feel better, her mother said. Cassandra doubted that. She rubbed her face as if she could wipe away what was happening right now. Pretending was too much. The dress. The engagement. The fake fiancé. She should stop the charade. And she would if not for Troy. He'd asked for a weekend. She owed him that unless he changed his mind about continuing to pretend. But she could take more control now. What if we forget about finding a dress? Cassandra asked. I could wear a toga. We could go with a bacchanalian theme and have all the guests wear togas. I can wear a wreath made from fig leaves. Cassandra, really? Her mother's tone matched the shocked look in her eyes. Could you imagine your father in a toga? Just the thought. It was only an idea. Cassandra had tried and failed. Although, she liked the idea of Troy in a toga with nothing underneath. She nearly groaned. Forget his kiss this morning and her dream last night. Troy McKnight was too much like Eric Wainwright, same ambition, same drive, same everything. Telling her mother she was engaged had seemed like the perfect solution at the time, but Cassandra now realized her mistake. She should have been honest and made her parents understand she didn't mind being alone. Being alone was better than the alternative, having her heart broken again. Even if Cassandra was willing to risk her heart, she doubted she'd ever find a man who wanted her for who she was. Eric hadn't. Troy admitted they were opposites. Chances were others would feel the same. Their loss. Cassandra liked the woman she'd become and wasn't about to change for anyone. Yes, she was better off being single. Ginger returned with three more dresses. The first was an elegant sleeveless silk ballroom gown with a lace-covered bodice and sweetheart neckline. The retro feel reminded Cassandra of a dress Audrey Hepburn would have worn. The second dress was strapless, ball gown length, with some beading, but still simple and charming. She liked both dresses. I'm happy you like these better, but I think you'll like this one the best. Ginger helped Cassandra into the third gown and buttoned it. I call this my Juliet gown. The designer puts a modern spin on a historical era. Cassandra stared at herself in the mirror. The lace dress had a higher neckline and three-quarter length sleeves. Not typical. It was a tad bohemian with a touch of Renaissance flair. In a word, perfect. Her mother dabbed her eyes with a tissue. Oh, Cassandra. You look stunning in that dress. Ginger placed her right hand on her hip. This dress makes more of a statement than the other two, but it's not too out there. Emotion clogged Cassandra's throat. She looked like a bride, she felt like a bride. The other wedding dress she'd purchased had made her feel special, like a princess, but this. She wanted to be married wearing this dress. Well, if she were going to get married. Which she wasn't, she reminded herself. I'll find a headpiece to match. Ginger walked out of the dressing room. What do you think, her mom asked. It's breathtaking. I agree. It's perfect for you. The words surprised Cassandra. She'd thought her mother would prefer a more traditional style and was happy she liked this one. Cassandra imagined wearing this dress with a wreath of fresh flowers in her hair and a matching bouquet in her hands. She couldn't wait for Troy to see her. He would love the dress, except. He would never see her in this dress. No one except her mom and Ginger would. Cassandra's spirits deflated like a hot air balloon on the ground after landing. Do you like the gown? Vanessa asked. Cassandra nodded, but she was disappointed with herself for finding a dress she didn't need. 
she hunched as if she were carrying a seven-tier wedding cake on her back. This was so unlike her. Time to get out of the perfect gown before she fell in love with it anymore. Where was Ginger? Cassandra tapped her foot impatiently, waiting for her to return. Is something wrong, dear? her mother asked. Cassandra couldn't tell her the truth. No. Except so much was wrong. She was a fraud. She loved the dress, but she couldn't have it. She wasn't getting married. She might not ever get married. Catching another glimpse of her reflection, Cassandra blinked back a tear. She'd found the perfect dress, the perfect dress for a wedding that would never happen. After golfing and lunch with Dixon, Troy met Cassie in downtown Carmel where he watched her sit on a wooden stool and have her face painted by a clown. Cute, except Cassie gnawed on her lip. Maybe she didn't like clowns. Maybe something had happened with her mother. Or maybe Cassie was still annoyed with him. That seemed the most likely. He didn't know her well, but pushing Cassie didn't seem to work. Dixon had warned him last night, and he was correct about his daughter. She dug in and raised more walls. At least that was how it appeared to Troy. With only one more night and day in Carmel, they could survive without the fake engagement blowing up in their faces. She looked at him. Are you sure you don't want your face painted? I'll pass. Face painting wasn't for him, but Carmel was. A gentle breeze blew a rainbow windsock hanging outside a flower shop. Birds chirped from a nearby tree. Tourists strolled along the quaint streets lined with galleries, cafes, and trendy boutiques. Someone giggled behind him. He glanced over his shoulder. Three young girls waited in line to have their faces painted. They whispered to one another. He smiled. One of the girls, dressed in pink overalls, blushed and covered her mouth with her hands. With her curly blonde hair, all she needed was a pair of wings and a halo to look like a little angel. Troy wondered what Cassie had looked like when she was younger. No doubt a real cutie with her heart-shaped face and baby blue eyes. Sighing, he hoped he had all boys when he had kids. Daughters would age a man, fast. Especially if they turned out to be anything like Cassie. Whoa. Where had that come from? He wanted a family, yes. But not now. Maybe when he was in his mid-thirties, set in his career, and able to provide for children without a second thought. And not with someone like her. She was the perfect fiancé for a weekend, but no longer. Troy needed a woman, make that a wife, who would be an asset to his career, not a novelty. Cassie wouldn't be content chatting politely and networking at a cocktail party of movers and shakers in the VC and high-tech world. Her idea of fun would be. Troy rubbed the back of his neck. He had no idea really but he was a hundred percent certain whatever it was would likely be inappropriate and unprofessional. Standing, Cassie handed the clown a ten-dollar bill. With a big grin on her face, she faced him and struck a pose. Two daisies graced her flushed cheek. The flowers matched the ones on her dress. What do you think, she asked. It's nice. Nice? Two lines formed above the bridge of her nose. I wonder how you would describe my tattoo. Tattoo? Nothing about her should surprise Troy, but he wondered what kind of tattoo she had. A heart? Or a flower? Wildflowers? A rose, perhaps? But where? The idea of finding it made him smile. Yes, don't you? Uh, no. She blew out a breath. You need to spice up your life. You wouldn't want anyone to think you're boring. He cringed. Next to Cassie, anyone would seem bland. My life is exciting enough. Suit yourself. Where's your tattoo? She tilted her chin. That's my secret. The sly smile on her face intrigued Troy. He imagined trying to find her tattoo, but the pictures forming in his mind raised his temperature 25 degrees. He needed to think about something different and cool off. Want to get ice cream, he asked. 
Sure. There's a place nearby. The ice cream parlor was empty except for a family of four sitting at a round table. Cassie ordered a waffle cone with a scoop of Rocky Road and a scoop of chocolate fudge brownie. He settled for a scoop of vanilla in a cup. Do you want to eat here? he asked. Yes. Cassie pointed to a small marble top table near the window. You can tell me how golfing went with my dad. Troy grabbed four napkins, handing three of them to Cassie before he sat at the table. We had a wonderful time. Details. He ate a spoonful of his ice cream. Cool and tasty, just what he needed to forget Cassie, who was hot and tasty. You want details? Don't leave anything out. I lost the round, so I bought lunch. Her eyes widened. My father let you buy? Yes. Troy didn't consider buying lunch a big deal. He'd insisted on paying, but he didn't tell her that. Your dad beat me, but he was upset over his score. He has a four handicap. Huh. Troy parted his lips. Dixon said he was a hacker. A dribble of chocolate sat at the corner of Cassie's mouth. She licked the spot with the pink tip of her tongue. He plays at least three times a week. I was had. Dixon wasn't the only one trying to take Troy. Cassie was driving him crazy with the sexy way she licked her ice cream cone. Talk about torture. He couldn't wait until she'd finished. Don't worry. You made his day. She wiped her mouth with a napkin. What did you do after lunch? Your dad gave me a tour of the lodge. Surprise, surprise. We ended up in a large banquet room that he said was a nice place for a wedding reception. Dixon had been far from subtle in maneuvering Troy into the room, but he had to give the man credit. The elegant room, with a hardwood dance floor and picture windows overlooking the golf course and the Pacific Ocean, would be the perfect place for a wedding reception. Someday. When he found the perfect woman and was ready to get married. It was a nice space, Troy added. Emily and Eric had their reception there, so I can see why my dad said that. I hope the two of you didn't select a date and reserve the room because that's the last place I'd want. Cassie sounded annoyed, but taking her seriously with daisies painted on her cheek and chocolate on her upper lip was impossible. We didn't, but your father thought spring would be a good time for a wedding. Reaching over, Troy wiped her lip with his napkin. You missed a spot. Her pupils dilated. If he hadn't been looking directly into her eyes, he would have missed it. Thanks, she said. I thought about what you said this morning. Especially after Dixon mentioned an opening at his firm. I don't buy the soul mates for eternity, but your parents are possibly getting carried away. I told you so. Troy deserved that, but she didn't have to sound so smug. Can't we share the blame? We're in this together. I suppose. Cassie bit into the crunchy cone. After seeing the banquet room, I mentioned wanting a traditional church wedding, but that you wanted to get married in your bare feet at the beach and have a shaman perform the ceremony. A shaman. She chuckled. I'm so proud of you, sweetie. I can't believe you came up with that on your own. Pride rushed through Troy. He sat taller. No matter what Cassie might think, he wasn't a stick in the mud. He worked hard to get ahead. That didn't leave him time for much else besides his job. I can be creative when called upon. What did my dad say? Her smile tugged at Troy's heart. He said the beach might be difficult. Women in high heels. But he didn't see a problem if you went barefoot. Her mouth dropped open. My father said that. Troy nodded. He wasn't about to mention that Dixon thought Cassie's gown would cover her feet so whether she wore shoes or not wouldn't matter. What about the shaman, she asked. Troy laughed. He didn't see a problem with that. Please tell me you said something else besides the shaman. Well. She sighed. Your sheepish grin tells me everything I need to know, Troy McKnight. You didn't say anything else. Cassie. 
you could have told my father I wanted you to quit your job and farm algae in Oregon. Like he'd believe that, Troy said. I didn't want to press the issue and be too obvious. Why not? We were having a good time. Besides, Dixon deserved better. The man had taught Troy more during 18 holes of golf than Troy had learned in one of his business school classes. The career advice Dixon had given him had been invaluable. I didn't want to spoil it. You. Cassie crumpled a napkin and then threw it at him. You're too nice. No, Troy wasn't nice. If he were nice, he wouldn't be wishing he could have licked the chocolate from her face instead of wiping it off. Do you ever not play by the rules, she asked. I try not to bend them much. Agreeing to be your fake fiancé isn't my normal M.O. You're positively hopeless. I'll take that as a compliment. Go right ahead. He grinned. What about you? How was your day? Cassie rubbed her forehead. My mother took me shopping for a wedding gown. That couldn't have been easy on her. He remembered her reaction over her wedding dress that first night they'd met. I'm sorry. He touched her arm. This is getting out of hand. She didn't meet his eyes but nodded. He hated seeing her so, not sad, more worried. This put you on the spot with your mom, but did you at least see anything you liked? As a matter of fact, I, Cassie's cheeks reddened. She frowned. What are we doing? If we're not careful, we'll be married and have a baby on the way before we know what's happening. Her dire tone made him laugh. He couldn't help himself. I doubt that. We definitely know what was happening in both those cases. She slammed her hand on the table. The sound reverberated through the ice cream shop. We need to do something drastic. Troy's gut tightened. Cassie most likely had a different definition of the word drastic than he did. She was an extremist. He was a middle-of-the-road kind of guy. I don't like the sound of drastic. I'm not saying we stage a revolution, but pretending we're engaged is working out too well. She tapped her fingers on the table. My parents love you. Good. Because I like them. She made a face as if she were eating lemons not ice cream. Don't worry, he said. We're halfway through the weekend. But I didn't realize they'd be so excited about the wedding. You admitted this was getting out of hand. Yes. And could possibly get worse. If he wanted to work for Dixon, the job and Cassie would be a package deal. No. Troy couldn't begin to consider that. I know you're worried about your career, she said. But my sanity is at stake here. His, too. I know. Time for a reality check. Troy needed Cassie more than she needed him. Her parents' meddling was one thing, but his job could be on the line if Mick found out Troy had lied about being engaged. All we need is a plan. He was good at coming up with those. We have less than 24 hours until we leave. We can survive this if we do it together. She didn't say anything, but she rubbed her upper lip over her bottom one. Her hesitation concerned him. He needed her to agree. Think you can make it until then? I. Yes, I can, she said to his relief. It's just. Oh, no. What? Her lips parted. Hold my hand and gaze lovingly into my eyes. Troy assumed Cassie had a logical explanation for her request until she lifted his hand and kissed each of his fingers. She hadn't been kidding when she said her sanity was at stake because she'd just lost her mind. He pulled his hand away, but she held on. He tried again. What are you? PDA in an ice cream parlor, a female voice crooned. Troy turned. Emily dragged a frowning Eric toward the table. I can understand such a public display of affection from my sister, but Troy, really. I thought better of you. No wonder Cassie had acted so strangely. He stopped trying to pull away. A good thing since she tightened her grip on his hand. 
What are you doing here? We were shopping and saw you in the window. I'm sure the entire village has been watching you. Troy wouldn't describe the tense atmosphere as sisterly. Frenemy didn't come close. This was something else. Something bad. Releasing his hand, Cassie straightened in her chair. I meant, why are you in Carmel? Didn't mother tell you? I guess not from the surprised expression on your face. Emily's tittering laughter filled the ice cream parlor. Guess who's coming to dinner? Chapter 8 That night, not even a delicious prime rib dinner could make the meal enjoyable for Cassandra. She sat next to Troy at her parents' dining room table. Emily and Eric sat on the opposite side with her parents at each end. The newlyweds monopolized the conversation with their house-hunting woes in Palo Alto, but that didn't keep the tension from ratcheting to unbearable levels. Cassandra couldn't take it much longer. Having Troy with her helped. She might tease him about being boring, but he was a calming influence when he wasn't aggravating her. Yes, he could be annoying, especially when he wouldn't let her have her way. She had to admit his reliance on plans was anal but cute. Too bad he wouldn't be around much longer. Not too bad. She couldn't come to rely on him. Or anyone. With her resolve firmly back in place, she glanced around the table. She seemed to be the only one uncomfortable tonight. Maybe that was because she was the only one who knew the truth about what really happened with her, Emily, and Eric. Time to tell her parents the truth? Possibly, because she couldn't continue this way. Seeing Emily and Eric together brought back the pain of finding them in Cassandra's old apartment. In her bed. Naked only to have to pretend that hadn't happened when Eric claimed he'd broken up with her. Somehow, she'd managed to survive their engagement. She'd held her head high only to be knocked to the ground by having to be Emily's maid of honor. Oh, Cassandra had put on a brave face. Still, watching her sister walk down the aisle and standing next to her at the altar were two of the hardest things Cassandra had ever done in her life. Love equaled hurt. Whether romantic or family love, it didn't matter. Cassandra would never allow herself to be hurt or feel that kind of pain again. Which was why controlling her emotions should be easy. And it had been. Until Troy. Cassandra glanced his way. So what if a day of golfing had tanned Troy's face? The plaid of his Oxford shirt intensified his striking blue eyes. He looked more gorgeous than ever. She could imagine dating him for real. Not. Going. To. Happen. Troy was her pretend fiancé, her fake fiancé. In less than 24 hours, this charade would be over. She would be free. Free of her parents, and free of Troy. No sense getting wrapped up in silly daydreams. They had a plan. She needed to do her part and be one half of the perfect couple they'd created, one half of a lie. She plastered on a fake smile. Easy peasy. After dinner, Cassandra followed everyone into the living room to let their food digest and make room for dessert, devil's food cake. Her dad sat on one of the two chairs opposite the fireplace. It's so nice to have both my girls home. As she nodded, her mother's gaze traveled from Emily to Cassandra. We should do this more often. Sounds like a plan, Emily said. Cassandra bit her tongue. No way would she agree. She sat on the farthest couch, and Troy joined her there. Her parents must have drunk too much wine. One big happy family did not describe their dinner at all. She really had to speak up about what had happened last year. Especially when Emily and Eric feigned innocence and acted like betraying someone they claimed to care about was no big deal. The two sat on the other couch and cuddled together. Cassandra wanted to throw up, but she tried to keep the emotions from showing on her face. Knowing her sister was watching, Cassandra nestled against Troy. Emily's hints and innuendos about their engagement had been less than subtle, but Emily would find only a happy, content-to-be-engaged couple tonight. Troy draped his arm around her shoulder. Cassandra's breath hitched. Her heart pounded so loudly she glanced up at him to see if he'd noticed. He wasn't looking at her. His breathing was steady. His heart rate hadn't changed. 
His nearness wreaked havoc with her vital signs, and his calmness irritated her. Not fair. He should be as miserable as her. Her father rose from his chair and then poured brandy into crystal snifters. I heard you found a dress, Cassie? A wedding dress. Perfect, yes. But she didn't need one. Come tomorrow night, she would no longer have a fiancé. Not yet, Dad. I heard the gown looked beautiful on you, he added. Troy kissed her cheek. Cassie would look beautiful in a flower sack. The line was old and hackneyed, but Troy's words made Cassandra's cheeks warm. If only she didn't care what he said, but she did. A little too much. There's no comparison between the gown and a flower sack. Her mother's tone left no doubt about her opinion. Do you want me to call Ginger and tell her to order your size? Not yet, Mom. The dress would be ideal for spring or summer. But not for a winter wedding. Cassandra's gaze lingered on Troy's smile. Those full lips. She would give up ice cream for a year for another taste of him. No matter how hard she tried to forget about his kiss, she couldn't. And it bugged her, immensely. Maybe she just needed to get him and his kisses out of her system. A good thing there was only one more day to go. Her mother was watching her. Do you have any idea when you'd like to get married? June's a good month, Emily suggested. Eric nodded his approval. Very traditional. Though you'll have to reserve a place right away. All the best sites book early. Troy gave Cassandra a soft squeeze. I've been busy at work, so we haven't had time to think about a wedding date. There wouldn't be time. She would wait a couple of weeks and then tell her parents the engagement was off. The reason could be anything from the long hours Troy worked to a fight about the differences in their lifestyles. All she had to do was survive tonight and tomorrow. Just like they planned to do at the ice cream parlor. Once Troy's workload lightens, we'll set a date. We aren't in a rush. Are we, honey? Cassandra emphasized the endearment. No rush since I know you'll marry me one of these days, pumpkin. Honey and pumpkin. Emily grimaced. How sweet. Eric looked a little green. Would you like to go, dear? Be quiet, Emily snapped. Her father cleared his throat. Sounds good. We need time to prepare a prenuptial agreement. I hope this won't be a problem, Troy. No problem at all. I have a problem with it. Cassandra resisted the urge to stand and put her hands on her hips. I knew this was coming, Emily said to Eric. Her dad sipped his brandy. Cassie, sweetheart, a prenuptial agreement is something you need to consider given what you'll inherit someday. No, Cassandra didn't understand why everything had to revolve around money. She wanted only to be happy. Money couldn't ensure happiness. It's a marriage, not a business deal. Her father finished his snifter of brandy. Whatever you decide is fine, but at least consider one. She will. Troy's words stopped her from saying any more. I'm so excited about your engagement and upcoming nuptials, her mom admitted. Her father nodded. Me, too. I can't wait to walk you down the aisle as I did with Emily. Hello? Who was this man Cassandra called father? She stared at him. You're the one who cautioned me about rushing into things. Troy's work schedule is giving us a chance to get to know one another better. It's what you've always said you wanted. I've changed my mind, her dad said. I had my doubts at first, especially with someone you'd never mentioned before, but seeing you this weekend. You two belong together. The twinkle is back in your eyes, sweetheart. That has everything to do with Troy. Cassandra looked at her mother, who had always made a point of saying young people rushed into marriage without thinking. She would cite the latest divorce statistics and rest her case. Surely she would support her. Mom. I agree with your father, her mother said. No sense having a one or two year engagement. You're no longer a child or in your twenties. A prolonged engagement is nothing but a waste of time, in my opinion. Cassandra was running out of supporters. What do you think, Emily? 
Her sister's charming smile might look fake and plastic, but she couldn't help being a snob. Why wait? You're one of the cutest couples I've ever seen. In fact, we want to throw an engagement party for you. Isn't that right, Eric? His eyes widened. Yes. We'd. Uh. Love to throw you an engagement party. How does two weeks from tonight sound? Emily asked. That works for us, her father said. This is a wonderful idea. There are several people I'd like Troy to meet. Her mother sighed. Why don't you see what Cassandra and Troy think about the idea first? Every muscle bunched. Cassandra didn't know what to say. No doubt Emily had something up her sleeve. That's nice of you, but you're both so busy house hunting. You don't have time to host a party for us. Think nothing of it. You're my twin sister. I've hardly seen you since I got married. That's what happens when you sleep with my fiancé and then marry him. Emily and Eric had no idea that Cassandra had seen them in bed together. She still couldn't believe what she'd stumbled upon that fateful day. Nor had she told anyone. Her closest friend, Mo, had guessed, and she hadn't denied what happened. Troy, what do you think? Emily asked. Are you ready to show off your blushing bride-to-be? We were at a gallery opening last night and ran into a couple of your colleagues. None of them knew about your engagement. Troy tensed. The smile vanished from his face. His hands bawled. Cassandra sat ramrod straight. She wanted to comfort Troy, but she wasn't sure how. Instead, she waited for Emily to drop the bomb about the make-believe engagement. Emily gave him a pointed look. My sister might not be the epitome of class and style, but don't tell me you're ashamed of her. Reprieve. No bombshell, yet. Cassandra released the breath she'd been holding. Emily, their father warned. Ignore her comment and say no. Cassandra crossed her fingers. Two weeks from tonight sounds great, Troy said. So much for her fiancé for the weekend. This gig had been extended by two more weeks. Not a problem. She'd kill her fiancé and then her sister. No jury would convict her. Not after they heard the evidence. Emily's smile widened as if she'd found her dream house in the right price range. Believe me, the pleasure will be all mine. I can't wait to show off my sister and her handsome V.C. fiancé. No one is going to believe it. The tone of her voice suggested Emily didn't. This was going to be a problem. A big one. An engagement party, a bridal shower, a wedding. I can't wait. Her mother stood. I'm going to bring out dessert. Forget dessert. Cassandra didn't want cake. She wanted to show her parents that she and Troy did not belong together. That having an engagement party thrown in their honor was a mistake. The non-stop clink of crystal interrupted her thoughts. What? Emily tapped her glass against Eric's. Kiss. Excuse me? Cassandra asked, wondering if her sister had finally gone over the deep end. When people tap their glasses, you're supposed to kiss, Eric said in that know-it-all tone of his. After a few times, you get used to the attention and can enjoy the kisses. That's only at weddings, Troy countered much to Cassandra's delight. Her father laughed. None of us are going to protest. Troy gave her a peck on the cheek. Good, now they could move on. You call that a kiss? Her father drew his bushy brows together. Emily and Eric continued making the irritating noise. Troy shrugged, but the devilish gleam in his eyes told Cassandra his next kiss wasn't going to be a simple peck. Heaven help her. She grabbed the edge of the sofa for support. His mouth came down on hers. His lips touched and then pressed. Hard. Far from a peck. This was a toe-curling kiss, smack dab on the lips. One that made her lean into him. One that left her breathless. One that made her want, more. Once again, he backed away much too soon for Cassandra's liking. Her lips tingled as they had this morning, and she fought the urge to touch them. Touch Troy. 
She gulped. That's better. Her father smiled like a proud papa. Who's ready for some cake? Upstairs in Cassie's room, Troy took his time changing into shorts and brushing his teeth. He wanted to give Cassie time to cool down. The way her lips couldn't decide between narrowing or pouting reminded him of his younger sisters. Cassie was far from happy about what happened downstairs, but he couldn't stay in the bathroom all night. Time to face her. He opened the door and walked out. Something smashed down on his head. He stumbled. What the? You deserve it and more. Cassie stood next to him, armed with a pillow. Her unbraided blonde hair fell past her shoulders in waves like a lion's mane. She wore his too short, too transparent t-shirt. The outline of her breasts and her black panties were clear. She looked hot. Not the way he should be thinking about his pretend fiancé. Especially when she looked like she wanted to take him out. Eyes gleaming, she stalked him. No problem. He could handle this. Except he was so busy looking for peaks of those black panties of hers that he didn't move quickly enough to avoid a feathered blow to his stomach. Turning, she whacked him on the back. How could you tell Emily she could throw us an engagement party? How could I say no? She accused me of being ashamed of you. I couldn't back down or I'd prove her correct. Troy warily eyed Cassie's pillow. Why couldn't they just play peekaboo with the hem of the t-shirt? He doubted that suggestion would go over well. He'd try another tact. Don't forget, I'm your McKnight in shining armor. Do I look like a damsel in distress? She faked him out and thwacked him in the stomach. We had an agreement. You're supposed to be my fiancé for the weekend. So. I'm your fiancé for two more weeks. It's not that bad. What do you know about bad? Two weeks, Cassie. Troy tried hard not to stare at her long legs. Then I'm out of your life forever. One problem. He didn't like the sound of forever. He liked spending time with her even when she was acting like this. I wanted you out of my life tomorrow. Liar. The truth shone in her eyes and in the way she responded to his kiss. You can't always get everything you want. Wanna bet? She tried hitting him again, but Troy ducked out of the way, leaving her to swish the air. He grabbed his pillow off the bed. She wanted to play rough, did she? Two could play at this game. His gaze locked with hers. They faced each other, two duelers armed with a lust for vengeance. Her serious expression made him smile, but he wasn't a jerk. Warning Cassie was only fair. Are you sure you want to do this? I must warn you. I can hold my own. The oldest of six children, he'd earned his stripes as the pillow-fighting champion of the McKnight clan. I'm ready to let it drop if you are. She met his peace offer with a smug smile. A swing of her pillow hit him solidly on his arm. She had declared war. You asked for it. Tightening his grip on the pillow, Troy swung and smacked Cassie on her stomach. Ouch. No fair. She ran to the other side of the room. He'd given her a chance, an out, but she'd chosen not to take it. She knew he was bigger than she was. Still, her surprised expression told him he'd caught her off guard. Good. Maybe that was what she needed. We'll see what's fair. He staged a full frontal assault. She swung her pillow back and forth. Like a welterweight boxer trying to fight the heavyweight world champion, she only landed a few hits. Are you ready to give up? Troy asked. She smiled, but defiance flickered in her eyes. No. Troy liked seeing her like this. Cassie had so many different sides. He wanted to know each one. Stepping toward her, he raised his eyebrows. It's your choice. With a yelp, Cassie flailed wildly with her pillow. He easily blocked her efforts. Always the gentleman, aren't you? She didn't sound pleased. Smiling wickedly, 
he swung the pillow down on her head. Of course. I'll get you for that. I don't think so. Troy laughed. Cassie was like a chihuahua trying to take on a Rottweiler. She didn't stand a chance. As she climbed on her bed, Troy cornered her against the wall. Do you give up now? he asked. She swung her pillow, but he ducked. The pillow swooshed over his head. No. His pillow hit her legs, nearly knocking her over. She held her arms out to balance herself and stayed on her feet. Now, he asked. She crouched lower. Using her pillow as a shield, she peeked over the top. Never. Troy laughed. This was more fun than he thought it would be. He'd give her another reason to surrender. I'm bigger than you. I'm smarter than you. She made a final swing. Enough was enough. Troy grabbed her pillow in midair and tossed it across the room. Cassie glanced at her feathered weapon lying on the floor. Her mouth gaped open. Narrowing her eyes, she stared at him. You. He aimed his pillow at her, and she stopped talking. Can't think of anything to say, Cassie. If you were one of my brothers or sisters, I'd make you say I was the ruler of the universe. Well, I'm not going to say that. No, she wasn't. He wouldn't be that cruel. You can say I'm the perfect fiancé. Perfectly insane fiancé. She stepped toward him. Mischief filled her gaze. What are you doing? he asked. Nothing. I don't believe you. Another step. Her hands came up and she tickled him. He squirmed. Tickling was his weakness. Stop. Ha ha. I found a weakness. Cassie sounded triumphant. Give me my pillow. He backed away, but she followed. No. Then suffer, insane fiancé of mine. She attacked him, tickling his sides until he couldn't stand it anymore. He tried to pin her arms, but he couldn't because she kept wiggling away. She continued tickling him. He tickled her back. She wouldn't stop, but neither would he. If he was going to suffer, so was she. Cassie giggled like a child, her face mere inches from his. So close. Too close. The tickling stopped. Her warm breath was on his lips. Chocolatey. He gazed into Cassie's eyes, and his heart rate accelerated. The desire to kiss her overwhelmed him. Her slightly parted lips were the only invitation Troy needed. He lowered his mouth to hers. She opened her mouth further. This wasn't a pretend kiss to please her parents, this one wasn't for show. No one was watching them. No one else cared. But Troy did. Feeling as if he would never be able to get enough of her, he savored her taste. Warm, wet, sweet. Her kisses were addictive. She tilted her head so he could kiss her neck. Oh, Troy. So sweet. No expensive perfume could compete against the simplicity of her scent. She smelled like fresh-cut flowers on a spring day. Her t-shirt inched up. Her bare stomach touched his, igniting a fire within him. He ran his hand along her flat belly and her soft skin. Cassie moaned. The sound nearly pushed him over the edge. He wanted her, he'd never wanted anything more in his life. Cassie. She felt so soft, so right. Leaning over, she showered kisses from his lips along his jawline to his earlobe. His breath caught in his throat. We have to stop. I want to kiss you. The feelings pulsing through him suggested this was more than kissing. He couldn't take much more. The things she was doing with her mouth, with her hands, were such a turn on. Closing his eyes, he tried imagining an icy winter scene. Instead, he pictured a beach on a hot Caribbean day. The beating sun, sweat drenched skin, the taste of salt. He couldn't think. He didn't want to think. But he had to for both their sakes. Stop. Do you want to stop? 
she whispered and then ran her tongue along the edge of his ear to the lobe. Don't stop. She was doing the things he'd imagined at the ice cream parlor and more. I, his breathing was ragged. I don't want to stop. She smiled. I don't think you want to stop, either. Gain control. He wanted to keep going, but. This will complicate things. I don't, she paused to nibble on his ear, care. Naturally, she didn't care. Cassie never worried about the consequences. She followed her heart, acted in the moment. But he wasn't like that. Troy gritted his teeth. He was in Dixon's house, fooling around with his daughter. Not worth the risk. Troy moved away. We can't. She glanced at the floor, but that didn't hide the disappointment on her face. She took a deep breath. Cassie. Troy lifted her chin so she had to look at him. He'd done the right thing. She'd told him she wasn't interested in dating. She probably wasn't interested in a fling, either. We're in the middle of a charade. We have to be careful. Her lips were swollen from his kisses. Her eyes were wide with desire. She nodded. You are an incredibly beautiful and sexy woman. He caressed her smooth cheek. You're driving me crazy. I want. Shoo. We can't think about what we want. We have to be smart about this. He placed his fingertip on her mouth. Talking would make matters worse. It's late. Let's get some sleep, or at least try to. Troy was on her bed, but he wasn't going to sleep tonight. Too many things had happened, too many things hadn't. Holding Cassie would be pure torture, but not holding her would be more painful. Do you mind if I sleep here tonight? Cassie jumped off the bed. No. Where are you going? Glancing at the other bed, she bit her lip. Troy wanted to say something, to tell her how she made him feel, but he couldn't. He couldn't tell her the thought of her sent his hormones into overdrive. He couldn't tell her he wanted to kiss and touch her all over. He couldn't tell her the truth. He rolled onto his side. I was hoping you would sleep here, too, Troy said, unable to find any explanation for his need to sleep next to her. Maybe he was the perfectly insane fiancé. Crawl in. Looking pensive, she did and then turned so her back was against his chest. Neither spoke. Spooning her, Troy tried to keep his hands and body under control. Slowly, the tension faded from her body. The gentle, even sound of her breathing told him she must be asleep, but he was afraid to look. He didn't want to wake her. His hands wanted to stray and caress the softness of her moonlit skin. His lips hungered for another taste of her. His body ached for fulfillment, but it wasn't going to happen. Not tonight. He would remain in control, even if he had to stay awake to do so. Staring at the ceiling, he refused to wish upon another falling star. Look where that had gotten him. Troy released a slow breath. It would be another long, sleepless night. And an even longer two weeks. Chapter 9 The next morning, Cassandra woke to the sound of Troy's heart beating in her ear and her hand on his stomach. His woodsy with a hint of mint mail scent teased her nose. The hair on his leg tickled her calf. She snuggled closer, basking in the warmth of the security he provided. He felt so good. After a yawn, she let the soothing rhythm of his breathing and heartbeat lull her back to sleep. She and Troy, a real couple. What a wonderful dream. Her eyes sprang open. Sunlight filled the room. Oh, no. This wasn't a dream. Cassandra stared at Troy, a night's growth of whiskers covering his face. His eyes were closed. His chest rose and fell with his breaths. His hair was disheveled. Asleep, he looked so young, but he wasn't a boy. Troy McKnight was a full-grown man, one who'd shown a tenderness last night that touched her and a passion that left her begging for more. Wanting more now. Last night had changed everything and nothing. She sighed. Troy wasn't hers. Wouldn't ever be hers. 
Yet, being with him had felt so good, so right. Cassandra touched the light cover of hair on Troy's chest. She felt safe and at peace being with him. Odd feelings, considering the disturbing effect Troy had on her senses. Strange, no doubt, but she felt as though she belonged. That was a way she hadn't felt since she quit her job to rediscover herself and open the bookstore. Not even being engaged had made her feel like this, which in retrospect should have been a red flag she was with the wrong guy. As she brushed a stray lock of hair off Troy's forehead, she imagined a flower-filled church and a tuxedo-clad Troy waiting at the altar for her to walk down the aisle in her bare feet. A stupid thought because they weren't engaged. That was a technicality when it came to daydreams, but still. No matter how he made her feel, she shouldn't be thinking about him like that. Her mind could counter every reason her heart brought forward. Except. A new awareness hit her. No. Oh, no. Cassandra swallowed the lump lodged in her throat. She was falling for Troy McKnight. Doing so made no sense, but that would explain her crazy feelings. Not that she wanted to feel anything more than gratitude for him helping her out. She didn't. Falling for him was the last thing she wanted to happen. Even if, and that was a big if, she wanted to fall in love someday, Troy was everything she didn't want in a man, a venture capitalist, materialistic, ambitious, predictable. A man like her ex-fiancé. As she had once been. It didn't matter that Troy was intelligent, caring, gorgeous, and polite. Following her heart was a recipe for disaster. Her experience with Eric had taught her that. No problem. Falling for Troy didn't mean she was in love with him. That would be foolish, especially knowing what he wanted from life. This was nothing more than a crush. Gratitude on steroids. Still, saying, goodbye, when they no longer had to pretend might not be as painless as she hoped. Oh, well, she'd survived worse. Troy opened his eyes. Dark lines suggested he hadn't slept much, but he smiled at her. Good morning. Her stomach tingled. Tingles meant nothing, absolutely nothing. She waited for him to let go of her, but he didn't. Good morning. His gaze never left hers. Did you sleep well? I, uh, dot. Unable to find the right words, Cassandra pressed her lips together. Troy's smile made her feel warm all over. She wanted to touch him and kiss him. But she didn't want to make another mistake. In two weeks, he would be out of her life. He'd been correct last night. Taking whatever was between them further would have been a big mistake. He had a life plan to get what he wanted. She had her own life to live, a life she loved. Cassie had worked hard to be the woman she was meant to be. She refused to go backward to who she'd once been, even if that person fit perfectly into her family and Troy's world. She couldn't do it, wouldn't. He tensed. Is something wrong, Cassie? Of course not. She pulled the comforter up to her neck. Cassandra wasn't modest, but being in the same bed with him made her feel shy. The thin fabric of his t-shirt and her panties provided scant protection. Not that she was afraid of Troy. She was more scared of what she might do. How had things gotten so mixed up? Maybe messed up described the situation better. Continuing to pretend he was hers would be so easy. Her parents looked happy. She was, too. Something she'd never expected. Her body's responses to his kiss and his touch were brand new. No man had ever made her react or feel that way. Not even Eric but she couldn't keep playing along when she knew this had nowhere to go. What's wrong? Troy asked again. Last night was, wonderful. Smiling, he kissed each of her fingertips. I'm sorry we had to stop. Her, too. Cassie's throat tightened, but she had to do this. She pulled her hand away. I know, but... His eyes darkened to the color of a stormy sea. But what? This wasn't going to be easy. Not with her heart wanting one thing and her mind another. No going back now. I thought about the uh, complications of our actions. And? 
I'm falling for you. I need that to stop. Now. Before I wind up in love with you. She took a breath. We have nothing in common, but there is some kind of. Chemistry. Understatement of the year. Yes, but you were right to stop. His eyebrows furrowed. I'm glad you agree. I do. Cassandra's heart pounded. She wished for once Troy hadn't agreed with her, but this was for the best. She knew that logically even if her heart disagreed. And we shouldn't kiss again if we're alone. There. She'd said it. So why did she feel so miserable? Cassandra rinsed the last breakfast plate and placed it in the dishwasher. Outside the kitchen window, a slight breeze rippled the clear water in the pool. Her family and Troy sat on the patio outside. Five people drinking coffee on a Sunday morning under a sunny, blue sky. Five people who shared outlooks and goals. Five people she didn't want to be like in any way. She placed detergent into the soap tray. This weekend, Troy had managed to fit in with her family as if he were one of them. He'd helped her handle her meddling parents, and she appreciated that, but she hadn't expected to come away from the weekend having feelings for him or wanting to see him again. But she did and would. Unfortunately. Ugh. This sucks. She wanted to forget about his kisses and how he made her feel. She wanted to forget about him, but she couldn't. Their fake engagement needed to last two more weeks. And after that. Cassandra slammed the dishwasher door. Troy tapped on the window screen. He wore a white t-shirt under a blue chambray shirt and a pair of khaki shorts. He looked as though he'd stepped off the pages of a Ralph Lauren ad. Are you finished? he asked. She didn't want to go outside. Staying inside was safer. The more time she spent with Troy, the more she wanted to spend with him. A lose-lose situation. I'll be out in a minute, she said. He glanced at her family. You'd better hurry. Her muscles tensed. What's wrong? Your family is getting carried away. The again was implied. I told you. It's more than that. Concern filled his voice. You won't believe who Dixon wants to invite to the engagement party. She could only imagine, and that irritated her. Here she was getting all worked up about Troy, and he was concerned about a guest list. If that didn't show her how different they were, nothing would. That should stop her from falling any deeper. You're not listening, he said. Who does my dad want to invite? Troy rambled off the names, including several of the power brokers in Silicon Valley. He would be in heaven, she would be in hell. She wanted to groan but didn't. That's quite a list. He shrugged. A shrug? That wasn't the reaction she expected from him. Aren't you excited? His forehead wrinkled. What if something goes wrong? I've worked so hard and am so close. This could turn into a complete disaster. This was already a disaster, but she wasn't going to tell him that. He couldn't go into the party nervous and expecting something bad to happen. Emily or someone else would pick up on that vibe right away and pounce. Nothing will go wrong, Cassie said in a calm voice. You will impress them so much they'll all wonder why you aren't working for them. The words weren't difficult to say because she believed them. She might not want the life Troy did, but her father wouldn't be wasting his time if he didn't think Troy was good at what he did. Thanks. He blew out a breath. I needed to hear that, but you should get out here. Emily and your mother are deciding where we should register. Cassandra picked up a towel to wipe off the counter. Register? Four wedding presents. Memories of doing all the engagement stuff with Eric rushed back. Her stomach clenched. That isn't funny. I'm not joking. But we aren't engaged. She lowered her voice. We can't accept presents. We'll return them after you break my heart. Very funny, McKnight. He'd exit the relationship without a scratch. But her. Cassie didn't want to think about that. She hadn't forgotten the heartache of returning wedding and shower presents after the breakup with Eric. 
Her mother had offered to do it, but Cassandra hadn't wanted to involve her mom for fear of blurting the truth about Eric and Emily's cheating. As Cassandra returned the gifts, pitiful looks from family friends and her father's business associates had reduced her to tears. No way could she go through something like that again. If we get any presents, you'll be the one to return them. Not me. Fine. She raised her chin. And how come you get to be the one with the broken heart? He glanced down. That's right. She washed her hands. You don't want to offend the mighty Dixon Daniels. It's not that. Yes, it is. Troy's main concern was his career. He'd made that clear, so she shouldn't be surprised. She dried her hands on the dish towel. Please, come outside. Troy shoved one of his hands into his shorts pocket. I need you. If only that were true. With a shake of her head, she turned on the dishwasher. On my way. How hard could this be? A little more chit-chat, and then they would go home. She picked up the coffee pot. Home to an empty apartment. The thought depressed her. Maybe she wasn't falling for Troy, but she liked the warm and fuzzy way he made her feel. She didn't need him for that. She could get a pet. A dog. No, a cat. She could take a feline to the bookstore while she worked. Yes, a cat was what she needed. She would apply to a local rescue group and get pre-approved to adopt as soon as Troy was out of her life. Carrying the coffee pot, Cassandra walked outside. Anyone need a refill? Her father took the pot and set it on the glass top table. Have a seat, Cassie. Troy patted the pillow on the empty wrought iron chair next to him. Come here, sweetie pie. Her mother smiled. Cassandra, we've been discussing the engagement party. You need to register for wedding presents. That isn't necessary. Cassandra tried to keep her tone steady. Both Troy and I have our own places. We don't need anything new. Yes, you do. Her mom didn't use her this isn't up for discussion tone often, but she was now. The end results were always the same, her mom winning the discussion. I know the perfect place in San Francisco. It's different from what you used before. I'll make an appointment for you this week. As if she could just forget about the last time she'd done this. Cassandra sighed. I have to work. I'll make an evening appointment and go with you. Her mother wasn't swayed at all. Troy, you're welcome to join us. His face paled. I'll have to check my calendar. Leave it to the women, her dad suggested. You'll only end up saying yes, to what Cassie decides anyway. Her mom elbowed him. That's not true, and I'll be there more as an observer than participant. Her dad snorted. I never got to do this with you the last time, her mom continued. It'll be fun. No. This couldn't be happening. Cassandra wanted her parents out of her life, not driving up midweek to help her pick out china and crystal patterns. Her fake fiancé ruse had gotten them more involved in her life, not less. We might want to wait until we have a wedding date. Don't forget about the engagement party. Emily sounded almost giddy. Don't panic. Think positively. Two more weeks and there would be no more interference, matchmaking, or wedding plans. Fourteen days wasn't that long. Wars had been lost in less time. Sure, Cassandra said finally. Her dad clapped his hands. Wonderful. About the engagement party, Emily tossed her hair behind her shoulder in a move she'd practiced since she was a teenager. We've decided a black tie affair might be too much considering the short notice. Of course, black tie optional won't work either, Eric added. His words earned him a smile from his wife. You're right, as usual, Eric. Emily patted his hand like a woman petting her trained lap dog. Marrying Eric would have been a complete catastrophe. He was, however, perfect for her sister. Emily could be as bossy and demanding as she wanted, and Eric wouldn't complain. He would ask how high she wanted him to jump. That was the way he'd remain on the Dixon Daniels gravy train. Halloween is coming, Eric said. We could have a costume party. 
Both her parents shook their heads, as did Emily. We wouldn't mind if you postponed the party to give yourselves more time to plan. Troy entwined his warm fingers with Cassandra's. Her stomach fluttered. She tried pulling her hand away, but he wouldn't let go. I wouldn't dream of doing that. Emily pursed her lips and stared at Cassandra. Let's make the event semi-formal. We can go shopping next week to find you a dress to wear. I know the best boutiques in the city. We'll go every day until we find something, spectacular. Cassandra wasn't ready to spend that kind of time with Emily. Coffee would be too long. I don't. That's nice of you to offer, Troy interrupted. But I'd rather go shopping with Cassie. We haven't had much time to spend together. What was he doing? Balling her free hand, Cassandra stared at Troy. This was ridiculous. She liked being independent. She didn't need her parents, her sister and brother-in-law, or Troy getting involved in her life or taking her shopping. She could pick out her own clothes just fine. I have an idea that will solve all of our problems. Cassandra was fed up with them. Why not make the party clothing optional? Troy drove through the gates of Dixon's house and glanced at Cassie in the passenger seat. Tension filled the air. She sat on the other side of his truck's cab, but the distance between them felt like miles, not a foot or two. This was not going to be a fun drive home. And that was totally her fault. He never knew what she might say, but he couldn't believe she'd suggested people attend their engagement party naked. Clothing optional. She shrugged. Troy should have expected her to say something like that. He focused on the road ahead. Don't you think that was a bit extreme? Extreme is the only thing that works with my family. You like to shock them. She didn't deny it. He continued. Your mother and Emily looked like they were going to faint. They aren't the fainting types, Cassie said without missing a beat. Besides, I had to say something. My mother was so fired up about us registering. She would have our wedding invitations picked out, printed, addressed, and in the mail if we hadn't left when we did. Things were getting out of hand, but you're exaggerating now. Not at all. And if you can't see it, you need to stop being blinded by what our fake engagement can do for your career. Maybe music would settle her down. Troy plugged in his cell phone. The jazzy strains of a saxophone solo didn't lessen his stress. I'm not blinded, he said. Then how can you not see that this has turned into a huge mess? It's not that bad. She shivered. I don't want to register for wedding presents. I'll come with you. He didn't want to go either, but he couldn't leave Cassie to do this on her own. Not when she sounded so horrified at the thought of registering. What night are you going? Wednesday night. But I don't want you to come. It'll be easier without you. Then I won't go, he said, relieved. At least he tried. But the party. Will be a nightmare, too. She rubbed her face as if she could wipe away what was happening. Do you know why Emily is throwing this engagement party? To be nice. She's setting us, well me, up for something. I don't know what, but I think she wants us to break up. Let Emily try. Did your sister tell you that? No, but you heard her remark to you, and how she wants to find me a dress. She's telling you that I will be an unsuitable wife. You're not unsuitable. He thought about his words. You'll make someone a great wife. Cassie laughed. Someone is the key word. Someone who isn't a rising star in the venture capital arena. At least she understood how he felt and wasn't upset. She rejected the world he was struggling so hard to make a life in. He could see her being satisfied with the life his parents lived. The hard work would appeal to Cassie. So would the land and quiet. He had a feeling she would fit into his family better, clothing optional comment aside, than he fit into hers. Not that he was going back to Missouri. He'd given up so much to reach his dreams, and he needed Cassie to stick this out a little longer, but how? 
maybe she just needed the right encouragement. Do you hate the business that much? he asked. Yes. Our engagement party will be the epitome of all that is wrong with that world. Trust me. I've been through this before. Had Eric taken her to parties? Perhaps Dixon. Troy tried to picture her among the fancy appetizers and free-flowing wine and champagne, but he couldn't. She didn't fit in with the social climbing crowd. She would be out of place and have nothing in common with the spouses and dates in attendance. Have you been to enough parties to know for sure? I used to work for Richardson and Scott. Troy's mouth gaped. Richardson and Scott was one of the largest and most prestigious investment banking firms in the country. Cassie, with her flowing skirts, oversized shirts, and sweaters, had worked at the traditional firm. He couldn't picture it. What did you do? Troy asked. I was a research analyst. By the tone of her voice, he would have thought she was a member of a firing squad. Computer software, and I also did a stint in M&A. His spontaneous, rule-breaking, tattooed Cassie had been a research analyst and worked in mergers and acquisitions. Troy wondered if she had an MBA. Why aren't you still working there? I didn't like it. But it's a great company. The compensation makes up for the long hours. He caught her shrug from the corner of his eye. I still didn't like it, she said. Richardson and Scott had a solid mentor program. She must have been out of her mind to quit. Unless she'd been fired. Why? I hated getting up early. I hated working late, especially during reporting season. I hated office politics. Cassie grimaced. I also hated wearing suits. Suits. She gave up a tremendous career because of the clothes she was supposed to wear. That made no sense to him. You were burned out. Why didn't you just take a leave of absence? I did. She gave a satisfied smile. I took a permanent leave of absence. But. You don't get it, do you? Cassie bit her lip. It wasn't only the job. The entire investment industry made me miserable. I never smiled. I would stare at the mirror and not recognize myself. My priorities got screwed up, and I lost sight of who I was inside. I started having anxiety attacks. It was awful. But you must have had everything you ever wanted. Oh, I had a great flat in the marina, designer clothes, and a German-built convertible. I made lots of money, but when you're working 80 hours a week and unhappy, what good is it? I realized being wealthy wasn't as important as I thought it was. But money was important. If Cassie had grown up as he had, struggling to make ends meet every month, every day, she'd think differently. That's easy to say and do when you have your father to fall back on. I have never fallen back on my father. Anger flared in her eyes. Do you think my daddy sends me a check every month? I don't know what to think. I own a bookstore. I used the money I saved when I worked for Richardson and Scott, liquidated my investments, sold my car, and borrowed the rest. From a bank, not my dad. Cassie wrinkled her nose. At least those long hours got me something worthwhile. Her words surprised Troy. She didn't seem like the kind of person to devote the time needed to make a business successful. What about the gas money? I save the money my father gives me. I use it to buy him gift certificates for rounds of golf at his favorite courses. Has your curiosity been appeased? Yes. Troy had upset her. He'd made the wrong assumptions about her. I shouldn't have assumed. Why is money so important to you? You wouldn't understand. Try me. She wanted to know, but he still hesitated. You grew up with the proverbial silver spoon. Not me. I was raised on a farm where my parents struggled to put food on the table and to dress us in clothes that fit. Troy rolled his shoulders. We never had extra money. Kids always think there's never enough money. Did you? No, but. One Christmas, we were having a really rough time. 
rain had damaged the crops that fall. My father had broken his leg. There wasn't enough money for presents. My mother and I stayed up all night on Christmas Eve. We baked cookies and made candies so my brothers and sisters would have something in their stockings on Christmas morning. Troy gripped the steering wheel. He would never forget the dark circles and bags under his mother's eyes or the expression, one of embarrassment and desperation, on his father's face. That Christmas, I decided I would never struggle like my parents. I wanted to be able to provide for my family, put food on the table, and have presents under the Christmas tree. How old were you? Cassie asked. Twelve. Were you happy? Yes, but that was before I realized how much my parents worked just to make ends meet and still were one bad weather forecast from bankruptcy, he said. I know it's hard for you to understand, Cassie. But please don't romanticize my upbringing. Being poor and being happy do not go hand in hand. She stared out the window. Neither does being rich and being happy. Chapter 10 Tuesday night in his apartment, Troy disconnected from his call with Vanessa Daniels. Not good. He dragged his hand across his face. The woman wouldn't take no for an answer. She wanted him to be at the store with Cassie to register for wedding gifts. Nothing he said would dissuade her. He blew out a breath and then plopped onto the couch. Cassie wasn't going to be happy. He'd better tell her the news now so she had time to cool down by tomorrow night. Besides, this gave him a reason to call her. Something he'd wanted to do since he dropped her off on Sunday night but had been putting off because he didn't understand the pull she had on him. Being with her drove him crazy, but being away from her made him feel on edge. He couldn't win. Might as well get this over with. Troy texted her. No reply. Not that he expected her to get back to him right away. He wasn't her real fiancé. He turned on the sports channel. During commercial breaks, he checked his phone. Still no reply. An hour passed, and then another. That was weird. She usually would have gotten back to him by now. Maybe she'd turned off her notifications. He called her. The phone rang four times before going to voicemail. Hi, you've reached Cassandra. At the beep, you know what to do. Hi, Cassie. This is Troy, Troy McKnight. Your mother called. Before I knew what was happening, I got roped into registering with you tomorrow night. Give me a call. Troy hung up the phone. He brushed his hand through his hair, hoping he didn't sound as stupid as he thought he did. He glanced at the time on his phone. Nine o'clock. Was she still at work? On the phone? At eleven o'clock, Troy hadn't heard back. He got worried. Surely her bookstore didn't stay open that late. Had she gone out with friends or on a date? Troy clenched his hands. He didn't like the idea of Cassie with another man. He willed his cell phone to ring or buzz. Nothing. He grabbed the remote and scrolled through the channels. Hundreds of shows were on, but not one caught his attention. All he wanted was to hear from Cassie. By midnight, Troy was pacing his apartment. Forget working or sleep. His bunched muscles seemed to be getting tighter. Maybe a hot shower would help. He would be able to hear the phone ring. His muscles were going to need a hot shower or massage to relax. First, he tried her again. This time, the call went straight to voicemail. Was her battery dead? That was the best scenario. She could have forgotten to charge her phone. That seemed the most likely scenario, but how come she hadn't answered or replied earlier? What if something had happened to her? An accident or? His gut tightened, but he realized the way he felt could be worse. A lot worse. Imagine what he'd be going through if Cassie were his real fiancé. The next morning, Cassandra entered her apartment. She moved slowly, a combination of tiredness and soreness. She hadn't meant to work so late at the bookstore, but so much work needed to be done. 
Work she couldn't do with customers in the store. Work that kept her from sitting at home and daydreaming about Troy. Yeah, keeping busy was good even if she would be paying the price today. She dropped her backpack on the floor and bent over to unlace her black boots. Ouch. A sharp pain shot up her spine. The result of sleeping on a hard floor last night. She gave a quick rub to the sore spot, removed her boots, and then plugged in her dead cell phone. Yawning, Cassandra shuffled her way across the hardwood floor toward the kitchen. Dust clung to her socks. She needed to clean her apartment, but that would have to wait. She needed water, a shower, and sleep. In that order. Everything else could wait until she wasn't feeling like a zombie. She downed a glass of water. She would grab a shower and then. Her phone beeped and buzzed. She debated ignoring the texts and voice messages, but what if something was wrong at the bookstore since she left? Mo could handle things, but he was good about keeping her informed. Sleep could wait a couple of minutes. She scrolled through the notifications. Huh? Troy had texted her more than once. She had also missed calls from him and her mom. Voice messages, too. Cassandra played one from her mom. Hi, Cassandra, her mother said cheerfully. I never heard if Troy's available to register with us, so I'm going to call him and see since you're not answering. That way, we can make arrangements. Who knows? Maybe I'll find you with Troy. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow at the store. 7 o'clock. Don't be late. Cassandra groaned. She did not need her mother watching her and Troy select a china pattern and other wedding presents they didn't want or need. Doing so with Eric had been uncomfortable enough because she hadn't wanted friends and family to spend money on them, but Eric had insisted on picking stuff they didn't need. She would have rather had people donate to a charity in their name. Maybe Troy had nixed her mother's idea. Please let him have said no. Cassandra was too tired to think about registering for wedding presents or the engagement party or her soon-to-be ex-fiancé. Cassandra rubbed her tired eyes and hit play on the message from Troy. Hi, Cassie. This is Troy, Troy McKnight. Your mother called. Before I knew what was happening, I got roped into registering with you tomorrow night. Give me a call. Roped in? No way. Cassandra's shoulders sagged. He probably said yes, without putting up a fight. Darn the man. Lifting her arms toward the ceiling, she stretched. Oh, boy, her back hurt. She needed to buy a couch or futon for the back room. No more sleeping on the floor. Better get going. A shower and nap were waiting. She had to be at the store by noon, but given the number of texts Troy had sent, she'd better call him. She touched his number. Cassie? Weird. She hadn't heard the phone ring. But the way he said her name made her feel warm and tingling. Tiredness. That was why. Yes, she said. I got your messages. My phone died last night. That's good. Funny, but he sounded relieved. I mean, not about your phone. It's good to hear from you. I was wondering what was going on. Something clicked in her brain. Were you worried? A little, concerned. His words touched her heart but also made her wonder if he was more concerned because of what being her fiancé was doing for him. The thought made her feel heavy all over. I, uh, need to keep a phone charger in my purse or at the store. I probably have an extra one if you want it. That's sweet of you to offer, but I'm sure there are a couple here somewhere. Silence filled the line. Look at the time, Troy said. Isn't it a little early for you to be up? I just got home. You. Just. Got. Home. Uh. Huh. She yawned again. Are you at work? He cleared his throat. I have a breakfast meeting in 15 minutes. She stretched her neck. Her back seized with pain. Ow. Are you okay, Cassie? I'm tired, and my back is killing me. She yawned once more. Forget the shower. 
she would take one after her nap. Crawling into her comfortable, warm bed would feel so good. It would be nicer if Troy were there to hold her while she slept. Uh-oh. She must be exhausted to think like that. Yeah, that was the reason. I didn't get much sleep last night, she added, as much for her benefit as his. I'm going to bed as soon as I hang up the phone. Silence. Troy. She didn't know why he was being so quiet. Had they been disconnected? She glanced at the screen, but the call was still going. Are you there? I'm here, he said finally. His voice sounded different, terse, harder. Cassandra shrugged. A knife-edged pain shot through her spine. She didn't know what his problem was, nor did she care right now. You don't have to come tonight. Selecting dishes, appliances, and bedding with Troy would be too couple-like and intimate. The line between fact and fiction was blurring. At least in her mind. Registering wouldn't help. Best to keep her distance. Don't you think doing this together will be, uh, awkward, she asked when he still hadn't responded. Yes, but your mother thought I should come. Cassandra rolled her eyes. You're turning into the dutiful son-in-law. I don't have a choice. Yes, he did. But Troy wasn't coming to please Cassandra. Ambition was a powerful motivator. She couldn't forget that. I'll pick you up at your bookstore and drive you to Union Square, he continued with an edge to his tone. What's the name of your place? Her heavy eyelids drooped, so she forced them open. Cassandra's attic. I'll be there at 6.30. Okay. She stifled another yawn. She didn't want to think about seeing Troy. A couple of hours of uninterrupted sleep was all she wanted. And thanks, he said. I know this isn't easy for you either. Black spots appeared before her eyes. She had to get some sleep. Maybe she wouldn't dream about Troy. I'll see you tonight. That evening, Troy walked toward Cassie's bookstore. The area wasn't as upscale as where he lived, but the neighborhood had a trendy vibe. Shops and cafes lined each side of the street. The scents of olive oil and lamb wafted in the air as he passed a crowded Greek restaurant. His stomach growled. He hadn't eaten much at breakfast or lunch. Not due to work. He couldn't eat. Thanks to Cassie. She'd been on his mind since her call. Okay, before that, but more so now. Where had she spent last night and with who? She must have had a good time if she hurt her back. Everything inside of him felt so tight, like a knob cranked too many turns. At any moment, he would explode. Troy didn't understand why she'd gone out with another guy. Sure, their engagement wasn't real, but her kisses hadn't been for show or fun. They'd meant something. To him, at least. He thought they had to her, too. Warning bells sounded. Danger signs illuminated. He was falling for Cassie Daniels. And falling in a way he hadn't done before. His once routine life was being taken over by a woman who would think nothing of ordering dessert first at a five-star restaurant. A woman who would jump out of an airplane and then check to see if she were wearing a parachute. A woman he'd known a little more than a week. Troy's stomach nodded. What was going on? He'd never felt this way. He didn't want to feel this way now. Not about Cassie. He had an excellent job with a partnership on the horizon. In a few years, he'd have everything he ever wanted. He'd never have to worry about taking care of his family, about anything. He didn't need this. Her. So why was he upset? Because he couldn't stop thinking about Cassie kissing another man. Troy wanted to punch someone, preferably her new guy. As his temperature rose, he flexed his fingers. That didn't relax him. Nothing he tried all day had. It took him a minute to realize he'd walked past the bookstore. He retraced his steps until he stood under a wooden sign that said Cassandra's Attic. He peered in the front window that was decorated for Halloween with a jack-o'-lantern, cobwebs, and spiders. 
horror hardcovers and children's paperbacks were also displayed. Smiling, Cassie stood behind the counter and spoke to a customer. Something in Troy's stomach fluttered. He might not be happy with Cassie, but he couldn't stop staring. Her hair was pulled back in a ponytail, but blonde tendrils framed her face. Pink earrings dangled from her ears and matched her t-shirt. Beautiful. But not his. A weight pressed against the center of his chest. Cassie had wanted only a fiancé for the night. That had turned into two weeks. Now that he'd spent the weekend with her, he was confused about his feelings. He shouldn't want to spend more time with her, but he did. Cassie might annoy him at times, but she also made him laugh. He was used to his life being predictable and, okay, he'd admit it, boring. She brought needed spontaneity into his scheduled days. He never knew what to expect when she was around. That wasn't always a good thing, but he'd had more fun with her in the past week than in the past three years. A man approached the shop. He opened the door and then glanced at Troy. Going inside. Troy took a step toward the entrance. He couldn't stand out here all night. Thanks. Walking into the store, he smelled cinnamon and cloves. Old wooden shelves crammed with books fit the casual atmosphere. Homey signs pointed out the various sections. Burnt orange walls gave the place an overall warmth. So much potential. After graduating college, he'd worked as a business consultant before going to get his MBA. He scanned the layout and imagined improvements that could be made. Some with no cost, only a little sweat. Arranging the shelves differently would make better use of the space. The loft could be converted to a coffee bar. But as it was, the store was quaint with a homey, small-town charm, but seeing the possibilities of ways to improve the flow of customers and increase income excited him. Something he hadn't felt in a long time if he were honest with himself. Not that he didn't offer suggestions to the startups they invested in, but he'd forgotten how much he'd enjoyed his old job despite all the traveling. A man with jet black hair sat on a wooden chair and held a large book. Toward the rear of the store, a woman read to her two children. Several other customers lounged on stools reading books and magazines. I'll be with you in a minute, Troy, Cassie said from behind the counter. She focused her attention on an elderly woman. Cassie dashed out from behind the counter, hurried down an aisle, pulled a paperback from a shelf, and rushed back. As she rang up the sale, she laughed as if her customer were an old friend. As soon as Cassie said goodbye, another customer, a thirty-something female, stepped up to the counter with a stack of paperbacks. Cassie glanced at Troy. Go ahead. I'm early. He enjoyed seeing her in action. She might act unconventional and claim to be a free spirit, but she knew how to run a business and keep her clients happy. In such a tough market for independent bookstores, customer service could be the difference between success and failure. Another customer walked up to the counter to make a purchase. Cassie yelled, Mo. As she reached under the counter, a twenty-something man raced down the stairs. He had short black hair with a six-inch multicolored mohawk down the center. He was tall and thin with an ear-to-ear -ear grin. His jeans were ripped, and he wore a black t-shirt with a quote from Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. Cassie whispered something into the man's ear, and Mo stepped behind the counter. Walking toward Troy, Cassie swung a small purse over her shoulder. A black skirt flowed around her legs. I'm sorry you had to wait. You have a nice bookstore. She smiled. Thanks. Troy motioned to the man behind the counter who watched every move Cassie made. Does he work for you? She looked over. You mean Mo? Troy nodded. I don't know what I'd do without him. He's my right hand and best friend. The affection in her voice matched her words. Was Mo her new boyfriend? Troy gritted his teeth. How long has he worked for you? Since I opened. He wandered in when I was painting, and that was it. He's been my guardian angel since. She faced Mo. Bye. 
Moe's lopsided grin looked fake to Troy. Maybe he should warn Cassie. Or ask Dixon to run a background check on the guy. Who just walked into a place like that? Have fun, Cass, Moe said. Cass. Moe called her Cass. Troy waited for her to correct Mo. She merely smiled. Are you ready, Troy? He was ready to kill Mo. Was he the one who hurt her back? Troy clenched his hand. Does Mo stand for Mohawk? Cassie laughed. No. It's a nickname. His real name is Zack. Troy didn't know why he was torturing himself, but he had to ask. Why Mo? He's a big Three Stooges fan. He didn't think Curly fit him. His brother is named Larry, and who wants to be called Shemp, she said in a matter-of-fact tone. The same way she'd asked Troy to be her fiancé. Okay, time to go. He opened the door for her. Is your back better? Why did he ask her that? He didn't want to know the details. It is, thank you. Cassie walked outside the store. It's my own fault. Mo told me, but I wouldn't listen. Troy did not want to hear the intimate details of her night of passion with a man named after one of the three stooges. Cassie, I. Mo told me I wasn't in my early twenties anymore. That I couldn't stay up all night and work on. I really, wait, what did she say? Work? Yes, she said. Being gone over the weekend put me behind. Mo did what he could, but he was too busy with customers. So we had to stack books and rearrange the shelves. Mo had to leave around two in the morning. He made me promise I wouldn't walk home alone. Way to go, Mo. Troy wanted to shake the man's hand. What about your back? I slept on the floor in the storeroom. Guess Mo's right. I'm not a young pup anymore. None of us are. Troy's relief was palpable. No need to be concerned or jealous. Not that he had been. Not much anyway. Chapter 11 Cassandra hadn't been to this store. Someone had purchased her and Eric a present from here. She remembered the box, but she couldn't remember what had been inside. That time was such a blur, except for the overwhelming emotions. Tonight, she noticed this place smelled like money. Her stomach clenched. She didn't want to be here. This wasn't where she would shop. Not ever. She much preferred discount stores, but she had a sinking feeling this was exactly the kind of place where Troy would register when he got engaged for real. She didn't blame him for that based on what he wanted out of life. As they rode the escalator to the third floor, she glimpsed his reflection in the mirrors to her left. Dressed in a charcoal gray suit, Troy looked like a successful businessman. He was gorgeous. Not her type of guy? What a joke. His desire to be wealthy didn't cause her attraction to Wayne at all. Especially after he'd explained about growing up without money, without presents under the Christmas tree. He might be like Eric, but Troy had his own motivations behind his goals. Still, she shouldn't have come tonight. Not only because of registering and how sick she felt taking the fake engagement farther, but also because of Troy. He haunted her thoughts and her dreams. Everything reminded her of him. No matter how hard she tried to stop thinking about him, she couldn't. His first kiss that morning in the breakfast nook reminded her of coffee so much she'd been drinking herbal tea instead. Cassandra wet her dry lips. After years of pretending to be someone she wasn't, she had finally let her true self come through. She had no regrets, other than she wished she'd done this sooner. Once her family stopped interfering, she would be happy. Nothing else was needed in her life, including a relationship. At least that was what she had believed. No, still believed. He stood below her on the escalator. One step. Too close, if she was being honest. Her forehead throbbed. That happened when she thought about Troy, but she wasn't about to massage her temples in front of him. She clutched the black handrail instead. His worrying about her last night was sweet, but her family's concern was more than enough for her to deal with right now. 
She didn't want anyone else, especially a guy, telling her what she should be doing. When they reached the second floor, she stepped from the escalator. The China department was straight ahead. She moved to the side so Troy wouldn't bump into her. He grabbed her hand. Fluttery sensations spread through her. Holding hands meant nothing. Just an act. Yet, even as she told herself that, her fingers wanted to lace with his. Get a grip. The sheepish gleam in his gaze was impossible to miss. Always the perfect fiancé, aren't you? I try. He tried too hard, but not for her. This was all about her mom being here, too. Cassie lowered her gaze to their linked hands. Hers fit snugly in his, too snugly for her own good. She bit back a sigh. She pulled her hand away, but he wouldn't let go. You can let go. I don't see my mother. Troy kept holding Cassandra's hand. Your mom is here somewhere. Temper spiraling, Cassandra took a breath and then another. Now wasn't the time for an argument. If he wanted her mother to see them holding hands, so be it. What time is it? Seven o'clock on the nose. My mother's always on time. Maybe she went to the ladies' room. Cassandra looked around. A discreet bridal registry sign sat on a cherry queen and writing desk. Pachelbel's Canon in D played on speakers hidden in the ceiling. The place, elegant and refined, reeked of wealth. Troy tilted his head toward the desk. Maybe we should check in. A tall, model-thin woman met them halfway. Her stylish lime dress belonged in the pages of Vogue and looked fabulous against her darker skin. Her hair was braided in an intricate pattern. She was beautiful. My name is Mercedes. May I help you? Hi. I'm Cassandra Daniels. She forced a smile. This is Troy McKnight, my, uh, her fiancé. Troy shook Mercedes's hand. We have an appointment. Oh, Ms. Daniels and Mr. McKnight. Mercedes's pearly smile spread across her face. I've been expecting you. Please, do have a seat. My mother, Vanessa Daniels, is meeting us here. Oh, I'm so sorry. Mercedes waved her hand, and a jasmine perfume scented the air. Your mother can't make it tonight. She said she would call or leave you a message. Cassandra checked her phone and saw a text from her mom. She hadn't turned up the volume on her phone after she'd left the bookstore so had missed the notification. Mom, sorry, sweetie. I can't get to the store tonight, but I know you'll have fun with Troy. We can finish up another day. No way was Cassandra returning here. She unmuted her phone, tucked it in her bag, and then looked at Troy. She messaged me. Something came up. I'm sorry I didn't check sooner. This happens all the time, Mercedes said without missing a beat. Mothers like to be involved, but you know your tastes the best. We can find the perfect items to fit your lifestyle. Thank you, but we should reschedule. Cassandra tried to sound disappointed. If she could push off registering until after the party, they'd never have to do this. My mother wanted to be a part of this. I understand, but you're both here now. Why don't we get the preliminaries out of the way? You can get a feel for what's available, see what you like, and things will go quicker the next time you're here. Mercedes sat behind the desk. That way, you can discuss your favorites with your mother and get her input. I can email your mother a link to your registry before we publish it for guests. And give her a full report on how she and Troy acted, too. Cassandra wouldn't put that past her mom. Mercedes removed a file folder and a Montblanc pen from a desk drawer. Let's get started. Following a quick lesson on how to use the electronic scanner to fill out their registry, Mercedes handed Troy the device. Most grooms like to handle this part. Your list will be available online, so this takes away typos or human error. Troy checked out the scanner like a kid with a new game controller. Cool. He would think so. Cassandra, however, wanted to leave. The tasteful displays of crystal, china, and hollowware might as well be displays of half-eaten brains and hearts. 
she'd hated doing this with Eric because he'd only wanted the top of the line for all their selections. It had felt disingenuous asking for expensive things she didn't want, but being here with Troy under the guise of an engagement was worse somehow. Mercedes motioned them to follow her. Why don't we start by looking at the china patterns? If they were doing this, they might as well go all in. Who knew what her mom had said to Mercedes? Cassandra brushed a stray lock off Troy's forehead. Is that all right with you, Muffin? I go where you go, shortcake. He drew her close to whisper in her ear. Why are you being so, so fiancé-like? In case Mercedes is going to report to my mother, Cassandra whispered. Think you can handle it? I'll try. When he kissed her neck, her pulse hit overdrive. Maybe she should have worded her question differently. Could she handle it? The china is over here, my two lovebirds, Mercedes said. On the way, Troy pointed out an ivory plate with a black and navy patterned band and a gold rim. What do you think of this, cupcake? It's beautiful. Like you. The words flowed too easily from his lips. Cassandra could almost believe he meant them. The pattern might be too bold. We could grow tired of it, tiger. You're absolutely right, kitten. She picked up a plate with peach and blue flowers along the rim and in the center. What about this? Nice and traditional. Troy kissed her cheek and Cassandra nearly dropped the expensive plate. But the colors might not match our decorating scheme in a couple of years. Cassandra set the plate down. You're so right, dumpling. Mercedes beamed. The two of you are adorable. I've seen couples who are only interested in picking out the most expensive or popular patterns. It's obvious the two of you want to create a home that will last. If only. Was that what Cassandra wanted, a home and family? Maybe once upon a time, but now? She clasped her hand in Troy's and gazed into his eyes. For a moment, she couldn't tell if she was acting this way for Mercedes's sake or her own. I'm lucky. Troy caressed her hand with his thumb. We're lucky. Standing among the exquisite china and crystal, Cassandra could almost believe they were a happily engaged couple. The feeling didn't suck. She tried to focus, but the strains of Bach playing from hidden speakers caught her attention. The tune was one she could imagine being played as she walked down the aisle on her wedding day. Cassandra's throat tightened. She'd known tonight would be a mistake, but she had no idea how big. Her mix of emotions was off the chart scary. Troy's correct about picking a pattern, Mercedes said. Choose one with colors you love and can grow old with. Troy released Cassandra's hand and examined another plate. She was glad he'd let go, but a part of her wished he was still touching her. As she looked at the various place settings, she pictured herself at Christmas. A big Douglas fir with brightly wrapped presents under the branches. Joy and laughter. A table overloaded with food and surrounded by family. Children. Troy. They would establish traditions that would carry over. And each year, Cassandra would set the table with the same china. A classic pattern. White or ivory. The image sharpened. She could smell the pine needles and vanilla. Wait a minute. Stop the madness. This wasn't real. No matter how good Troy was at playing her fiancé, they weren't planning for their future. They would never have a decorating scheme. No traditions or children. It was all a lie. A big fat lie. Her heart pounded in her throat. Agree to whatever he picks up next. Troy showed her a white plate with a white lace motif and platinum band. What about this? Perfect. And the pattern was perfect, to her dismay. If she were going to get married, she would select that pattern. But she wasn't. She would continue using the multicolored plates she'd bought at an estate sale. Her ribs squeezed. Eight place settings? Twelve. Troy gave her arm a gentle squeeze. I have a large family. We'll never be able to use them at Thanksgiving and Christmas unless we have enough place settings for everyone. I can almost taste the turkey and homemade cranberry sauce. 
so could she, except. This was getting more ridiculous, by the second. She didn't know how to cook a turkey and cranberry sauce came in a can or from the caterer. Holiday dinners with his family would never happen. But. 12. Okay, 12 place settings. No sense arguing. Whatever gifts they received would be returned anyway. Is this for your formal place setting? Mercedes asked. Yes. Troy ran his fingertips along the edge of the plate. We don't need informal dishes. Cassandra tried to erase the image of a Battenberg lace tablecloth beneath the bone china. She had left that life behind. She wasn't going back to it. Not for Troy, not for anyone. She hated that she had to keep reminding herself of that. He smiled. I agree. I want to use our china every day. No sense keeping the dishes in a hutch only for holidays. That way, it'll remind us of tonight and how we chose the pattern together. I love you. Oh, no. Cassandra realized she wasn't falling for Troy. She'd fallen. Head first. Love. How could that have happened? He was so different from her, and she hadn't known him long enough. One reason after another swirled in her mind. Mercedes's smile grew wider. Mr. McKnight, I wish I could clone you. I wish you were really mine. Cassandra's muscles felt weak as if her body had gone numb. She searched for the nearest exit, but didn't get past staring into Troy's eyes. Focus on registering. Mercedes set the five-piece place setting on a forest green placemat. Let's find crystal and silverware to complete the setting. What about this? Troy held a plain goblet with a narrow stem. I like this one. Orifers, Mercedes said. Would you care to look at the Waterford patterns also? Cassandra remembered her mother's comment at the bridal salon in Carmel. I'm not the Waterford type. The crystal Troy picked out is fine. Troy raised the glass as if making a toast. If I tap on the glass, do I get a kiss? You can have anything you want. Cassandra swallowed hard. Do you deserve one? He tapped his finger on the glass. Yes. She meant to only brush against his mouth, but the moment her lips touched his, she couldn't stop herself from taking the kiss deeper. Everything faded away. Everything except Troy. The taste of him, the texture of him. She never wanted this moment to end. Not real. As she pulled away from Troy, he smiled. If I'll get kisses like that, I'm buying one of these glasses tonight. I could get used to that. Her too. But Cassandra couldn't afford to. After the party, he would be out of her life. The way she wanted. Or had wanted. Now. Would you like to see the silverware? Mercedes asked. Yes. Troy held Cassandra's hand once again, but after kissing him, she needed distance. She made a beeline to a display of silverware against the far wall. The sooner they made their selection, the sooner she could go home. Troy followed her. Look at this, honey. It's perfect, she said, wanting to end this charade right now. She had so much on her mind, so much to figure out. He stared at a dinner fork. Perfect? Cassandra took a closer look. The silver fork resembled something from a fantasy novel with dragons on the handle and swirling arrows of gold forming the prongs. Maybe not. Mercedes pointed to a set shining against the black velvet background. What do you think of this? Two circular bands near the head of the fork were the only decoration. Plain, yet striking. Yes, that will do. Mercedes put the silverware together with the rest of their choices. Wonderful selections. Look how well the pieces work together. Troy placed his arm around Cassandra's shoulder. Doesn't it look perfect, darling? You're perfect. Cassandra's stomach nodded. She forced herself not to lean into him. Yes. Mercedes smiled. I've seen hundreds of engaged couples, and I must say the two of you seem so happy together. Cassandra couldn't talk, she couldn't breathe. Troy pulled her closer. 
That was the last thing she needed. He smelled so mouthwateringly good. It wasn't fair. Thank you, Mercedes. He handed over the scanner. I'll get this uploaded, Mercedes said. You don't need to send the information to my mother. Cassandra couldn't go through this again. Picking out a place setting for dinners that she and Troy would never share hurt her heart. We're happy with the selections, but we need to go. No problem, Mercedes said. We can set up another appointment later to pick out serving pieces, housewares, and bedding. Enjoy the rest of your evening. As Mercedes walked away, Troy smiled. That wasn't so hard. No, pretending was too easy. Cassandra felt as if she were going to marry Troy. Despite his job, his being uptight, his goals, she wanted to be with Troy. He made her smile and feel good inside. When he was around, she felt at ease. He cared what happened to her. That sense of belonging had only increased since Carmel. She loved him. Her stomach churned and cartwheeled. Talk about a big mistake. How had she let this happen? Troy touched the edge of her mouth. Smile, please. You look like you lost your best friend. She forced her lips to curve upward. Whoever said frowning took more muscles than smiling was a fool. Is something wrong, he asked. Wrong? Everything was wrong. She was an idiot. Loving Troy when she shouldn't. First, she barely knew him. Second, he defined success by the amount of money, power, and prestige he could achieve. Third, his priorities were 180 degrees different from hers. Beyond the physical attraction and chemistry, they had nothing in common. He was the wrong man for her. You'll make someone a great wife. Someone, not him. He wanted a different kind of woman to marry. A woman not like her. Just. Like. Eric. A chill traveled the length of her spine. She shivered. So why was she feeling this way? And how did she make it stop? Getting away from Troy was the only solution. Getting away now. Staying away forever. I want to cancel the engagement party. His eyes widened. What? As her gaze met his, Cassandra's resistance melted. His thick-lashed blue eyes should be on the FBI list of deadly weapons. They were to her. She couldn't look at him and say no. But she had no choice. Stay strong. Cassandra glanced at the marble-tiled floor instead. I'm sorry, but I can't go through with the party. He grabbed hold of her hand before she could step onto the escalator. You're nervous. Yes. Except nerves were only a part of this. The future she'd envisioned, the one she wanted, was changing because of the man standing with her, but it was a futile future, something she'd never have with Troy. I don't want to go to the engagement party. He pulled her toward the dress department. Want to buy new outfits to wear? As if that would solve anything. Don't trust me to pick out my own clothes? I didn't say that. You wouldn't complain if I wore a little black dress with a strand of pearls. I didn't say that either, but would that be so bad? Yes. Her voice sounded harsh and loud and so unlike her. That's not who I am. Not now, but once. In the past, yes. Her heart ached because she had a feeling he could never love her as she was now. But I don't want to go back to that. Not for my family or anyone. Especially you. Please don't ask me to do that. It's one night. One night for her to once again pretend to be something that she wasn't. Not just his fiancé, but the career asset future spouse. Dressing and acting the part would only prolong the inevitable, saying, Goodbye. Troy didn't want someone like her. She'd known that but had ignored the bursts of reality. She could no longer deny how this was going to end. You were supposed to be my fiancé for one night. Cassie. The engagement party is one more lie piled on a stack of the ones we've told. Pretending has gone too far. It has to stop. Lines creased his forehead. 
As his brows drew together, his gaze flitted around, never focusing on one thing. That was Troy's worried look. Only she realized he wasn't concerned about her. He was concerned about how this would affect him and his future. Her shoulders drooped. She wanted to go home. We need to talk. Troy motioned to the nearby sales clerks staring at them and then took her hand. Someplace more private. Chapter 12 Heart pounding, Troy led Cassie out of the store and to an empty park bench in Union Square where they sat. So much was riding on the engagement party. Somehow, he had to get her to agree to attend. You said you would go to the party, but now you don't want to go through with it. I don't understand why you're changing your mind. He really didn't. She didn't say anything. He'd try again. What's the big deal about dressing up and pretending to be engaged for one more night? We've survived a dinner out and the weekend at your parents' house. This is only a few more hours. Cassie started to speak, but then stopped herself. Be patient. Pushing her wouldn't work, so Troy remained quiet. A crowded cable car headed down Powell Street. The driver clanged the bell, and passengers waved. He waited for her to answer. A gust of wind made Cassie shiver. Troy put his arm around her. Canceling the party would be for the best, she said finally. Her vague answer told him nothing. Could you please be more specific? She took a deep breath. And another. Registering tonight made me realize we've taken this pretend engagement too far. I want everything to stop now, before I. Before you what? She hesitated. Before we make the situation worse. But the party. Means a lot to you. I know, Troy, she said with sincerity. I wish I could help you. You can. Troy sensed her uncertainty, but he wanted to know what was going on inside her beautiful head. Be my fiancé. It's not that simple, Cassie admitted. The party will be a total nightmare, and Emily is going to pull something. Is she the reason you want to cancel the party? Partly. We've always had, problems. Cassie tapped her foot against the pavement. The syncopated rhythm matched his heart rate. Remember when I told you my parents put stars on my ceiling? Troy nodded. He remembered well. Wishing on a plastic star, the closeness of that night. The next morning, he'd thought the feeling would disappear in the harsh reality of daytime, but it hadn't. Your mother was worried about you getting cold. That wasn't the real reason, Cassie said. They installed the stars because they were worried about kidnappers. Troy tensed. Kidnappers? Being rich isn't all fun and games. One night, when I was fourteen, I'd gone to the beach to stargaze. It was my routine. Someone figured that out and tried to take me. The thought of anything happening to Cassie made his gut tighten. Troy held her closer. He didn't want to let go of her. She pulled away. Would you mind if we went to the truck? It's getting cold. Troy wanted to keep holding her, but he didn't want her to catch a chill. Let's go. They headed toward the parking garage. The only reason the kidnapping attempt failed is my father had a bodyguard following me, she explained. Emily and I had bodyguards, but we didn't know it. He'd hired a security team after a few threats had been made. He hadn't told us about those, either. Cassie licked her lips. After that night, things got pretty bad. I was the rebellious daughter. The one who didn't follow the rules. My parents didn't blame me, at least not to my face, but the kidnapping attempt haunted them. I felt what almost happened was my fault and that I owed them for making sure nothing like that happened again, so I tried to be everything they wanted me to be. And? Doing everything I was supposed to do made them happy. Emily, however, got angry. She was no longer the only perfect daughter and hated that. She accused me of setting up the kidnapping attempt so I'd get more attention than she would. Sibling rivalry. To the extreme. I thought the competitiveness would disappear when we got older. 
It didn't. A few years ago, I realized I wasn't happy with the person I'd become. I'd lost the real me, so I changed my life. Goodbye perfect daughter, hello black sheep of the family. Cassie pressed the crosswalk button. I thought that would solve my problems with Emily. It did to a point. Until Eric. As they crossed the street, Troy held Cassie's hand. He didn't know what else to do, but the way she trembled told him she needed support. Three weeks before Eric and I were to be married, I found him. Troy didn't understand. Found him. In bed, my bed, with Emily. In her own bed. Troy swore. How could Emily do that to her sister, her twin sister? And Eric, the so-called fiancé. Inexcusable. No wonder Cassie didn't want to date anyone. Wainwright had ripped her heart off her sleeve and displayed it like a trophy. Troy wanted to shove his fist down Eric's throat. I'm sorry. I. I wasn't spying or anything like that, she said as they entered the parking garage. I almost wish I had been, but I had no idea what was going on between them. That made me feel so foolish and stupid. The signs were there, but I didn't see them. I didn't want to see them. Troy kissed the top of her hand. You don't have to tell me this. I want to so you'll understand. She squeezed his hand, the simple gesture touching his heart. That morning, I'd forgotten some paperwork in the living room. After Mo arrived at the bookstore, I ran home. I was about to leave when I heard laughter coming from the bedroom. I almost walked into the room when I saw them, but my feet wouldn't move. I was so shocked I stood frozen. I couldn't even talk. Eric told Emily he would dump me and marry her. He admitted he never loved me and couldn't see me fitting into the life he wanted. I ran out of the apartment before they saw me. The ultimate betrayal from her fiancé and her twin sister. You never confronted them? No. They have no idea I was there or knew what was going on. Cassie's lower lip trembled. I broke up with Eric that night. I moved out of the apartment the next day and donated the bed to a women's shelter. I thought the two of you decided to break up. That's what everyone thinks. Eric told my dad and everyone else that it was a mutual decision so he could have a chance with my sister. They waited three months before announcing their engagement. I guess they didn't want to flaunt their relationship in my face. Troy hugged Cassie. She would never be any man's doormat. He respected that. Her. Three months isn't a long time. It was long enough for them, she said without a trace of bitterness or regret. I've gotten over Eric. I would have never been happy if I married him. He was more interested in working with my father than loving me. And I never loved him the way I. Cassie bit her lip. Are you okay? Troy asked. She nodded. What Emily did hurt most of all. We've always been competitive, but I felt so betrayed. We shared my mother's womb for nine months. You'd think that would count for something. Five minutes alone with Wainwright. That was all Troy wanted. And Emily. Cutting up her charge cards would do the trick. I wish I could say or do. I don't want you to do anything, Cassie interrupted. I wanted you to know, that's all. I don't want to get hurt like that again. I couldn't handle it. Just like I can't handle the engagement party. Troy raised her chin with his fingertip. I would never purposely hurt you. The edges of her mouth turned up slightly. I needed to hear you say that. He brushed his lips against hers. Then I'll say it again. I don't trust what Emily will do at the party. I can't go. Not now. He wanted to ask her to change her mind, but he couldn't. Not tonight, possibly not ever. He understood where she was coming from now. What happened between her, her sister, and her ex-fiancé explained so much. He also needed time to understand his growing feelings toward Cassie. He paid the parking lot attendant, received an exit ticket, and kissed her cheek. 
you need to get home. The rest could wait. The next morning at work, Troy sat behind his desk. He'd been reading the same document for the past 20 minutes, but he hadn't comprehended a single word. He wanted to take a day off. Call it a mental health day or a vacation day, but he didn't want to work. He wanted to be with Cassie. Leaning back in his chair, Troy closed the document. He'd been thinking about Cassie since he dropped her off last night. Thinking he wanted to keep seeing her after they called off their engagement. She might not be perfect, but maybe his perfect image of a future spouse was overrated. She was beautiful and good for him. He wasn't in the market for a wife. Why couldn't she just be his girlfriend? No other woman had been as good for him as Cassie. With her, he could loosen up and relax. Being with her made him feel free and more alive than he'd felt before. She made him laugh and want to be a better man. Last night had only been the beginning. She'd opened her heart and shared her secrets. He wanted to know more. He wanted to know everything about her. Troy didn't understand his feelings, but he felt an overwhelming urge to protect her. Seeing her so vulnerable shredded his insides. Cancelling the engagement party was the only solution. So what if he missed out on meeting and partying with the movers and shakers of Silicon Valley? There would be time for that after he had his partnership. Troy was already so far ahead of his plan because of Cassie. He could handle the rest on his own. The phone rang on his desk once, signaling an internal call. He picked up the receiver. Troy McKnight. Go to Mick's office, Della, Mick's assistant, said. He wants to see you now. She emphasized the last word. Be right there. Thankful for the distraction, Troy grabbed his tablet. Mick would get him motivated to work. The door to the office was open. Troy glanced in. You wanted to see me? Mick stood in front of his desk, dressed in a navy pinstriped suit and flashy purple tie. He smiled, waving Troy inside. Have a seat, Troy. He sat in a comfortable leather chair. Mick leaned against his desk. I want to congratulate you. Yes. I got the partnership. No reason to have the engagement party. Troy clenched his hand and pumped his fist slightly. My wife wanted to know why I kept your engagement a secret. Heather was thrilled when she found an invitation to your engagement party in our mailbox yesterday. No partnership. Yet. Troy flexed his fingers. I hope you can come. He hoped the answer was no. We wouldn't miss it, Mick said. Though I was surprised. With the hours you work, I had no idea you were dating anyone, let alone engaged. Cassie understands about my job. I'm sure she does. Mick grinned. I'm looking forward to meeting her, and so are the other partners. A boulder settled in Troy's stomach. Other partners? They'll be coming to the engagement party, too. Cancelling the engagement party would be tricky now, but Troy had to do it, for Cassie. He ignored the urge to tug on his tightening collar. I can't wait for everyone to meet Cassie. The words tasted bitter, and he regretted them the moment he spoke. Have you set a wedding date? Mick asked. Not yet. Troy pictured Cassie in a wedding gown. He liked the image, including her bare feet. Maybe he needed to take life less seriously. The spring or summer might be good. Keep me posted. Heather's going to want to know the details. You know how women are. Nodding, Troy was relieved Cassie didn't care about gossip. Mick rubbed his hands together. How would you like to go with me to visit Intertalk? Intertalk. The Austin firm was one of the hottest startups around. Their video chat app with digital filters had investors salivating. Troy scooted to the edge of the chair. They turned us down. Mick smiled. That was before we teamed up with Daniel's Venture Group. Teamed up with Dixon's Group. Troy's heart fell to his feet. Cassie had warned him, but he hadn't wanted to listen. Now. 
Dixon and I have had several telephone conversations recently, Mick said. He's approached us with a unique opportunity. Us? Troy didn't feel any relief. His collar got tighter. He's giving us the chance of a lifetime, Mick continued. I want you in on the deal. Thanks. I think. To be honest, serious questions have been raised about making you a partner in the new fund. Troy gave up and tugged on his collar. Experience counts, Mick continued. But contacts and connections are invaluable. It was worse. He swallowed the lemon-sized lump lodged in his throat. It didn't help. No matter. If he choked to death, he wouldn't have to worry about the engagement party or anything else. None of us knew you had Dixon Daniels in your corner, Mick said. We'll take that into serious consideration. We don't want to lose you to Dixon and his group. Troy's partnership wasn't dead, but he would have to go through with the engagement party. Surely Cassie would understand, even though she wouldn't be happy about having to be one half of the perfect couple on parade. A few more hours. That was all he was asking. I've enjoyed working here. Glad to hear it, Mick said. Getting married and starting a family are life-altering events. You'll have to consider all of your options. Options? Troy knew one option, to return to his parents' farm. He imagined cold rainy days, mud, and manure-soaked jeans, and aching muscles. Okay, he was being melodramatic. There were other options, such as finding a new job or returning to management consulting, but those things hadn't been part of his master plan. Feeling his shoulders slumping, he straightened. I do have my future to consider. This deal will be a good experience for you. You'll be working with Dixon and me. Troy should feel lucky. Grateful. He didn't. Forget going to Austin. He would need to swallow an entire bottle of antacid tablets to survive the rest of the day. And what would happen after the engagement party? After he and Cassie were no longer engaged. Troy wasn't sure he wanted to know the answer. Mick cracked his knuckles. It's going to be busy until we leave on Sunday. Long hours don't bother me. What about your fiancé? Cassie is extremely supportive, Troy said. She runs her own business and understands the necessity of putting in extra time. She sounds like quite a woman. She is. How would Cassie feel when he told her they couldn't cancel the engagement party? Maybe flowers would help. He could have them delivered to the bookstore. No, she would see the gift as a bribe. And it would be. She deserved better. Don't look so worried. Mick patted Troy's shoulder. I'll have you home in time for your party on Saturday night. We have our partner's retreat on Sunday, so no one is going to want to start the weekend off tired. Great. Troy tried to muster some enthusiasm. Knowing he might be a topic of conversation at the retreat didn't help. He felt torn between his dreams and Cassie. It wasn't a good place to be. You know, Troy. I knew you had ambition, but I didn't know how badly you wanted it. I considered you our farm boy from Missouri a worker bee. I see now I was way off base. Mick chuckled. Troy stared, dumbfounded. He may have appeared to be an up-and-coming successful venture capitalist, but no matter how hard he worked to fit the part, others didn't accept him in that role. Yes, he was still comfortable butchering a chicken for his mother and harvesting crops with his father, but his past shouldn't define him. Yet, it had with Mick. Most likely the other partners, too. I know you can be hard-nosed in meetings to get the terms we want, but marrying Dixon Daniels' little girl. I didn't know you had it in you. Mick's words hit Troy like a bucket of ice water being dumped on his head. He'd thought his dreams were in his grasp because of his hard work, but like his and Cassie's fake engagement, that had been an illusion. Just like him. I had no idea who she was when we met. Really? He nodded, unsure if he wanted to say anything else aloud. But if Troy had known, would he have done anything differently? That was a question he didn't want to answer, 
and one he hoped Cassie never asked him. The bell on the bookstore's door jingled. Smiling, Cassandra looked over from where she was shelving to greet the customer. Her fingers tightened around the books. Troy. What was he doing here? He wore the same navy suit as the night they'd met. As usual when he was around, her pulse kicked up a notch and butterflies filled her stomach. Hello, he said. Goosebumps covered her arms. Too bad turning up the heat wouldn't help get rid of them. It's not even late afternoon. Shouldn't you be at work? The words tumbled from her mouth. Her cheeks warmed. What I meant to say is hello. Troy's charming smile made Cassandra lean against the shelf. Could she spell S-W? Uh? N? Or S-T-U-P-I-D? I'm here because I wanted to give you this, and yes. He handed her a box of chocolates. Thanks. She opened the box and popped a chocolate into her mouth. Almost as tasty as Troy. Wait a minute. A midday visit during the week and a box of candy? Something was up. She drew her eyebrows together. What's going on? He rubbed his neck. Nothing. His body was tense. Another sign something was wrong. Spill. He glanced around the empty bookstore. We're the only ones here, she said. Don't tell me you took time from your busy work schedule to make a social call and bring me candy? His cheeks reddened. I have to go to Austin for an important meeting. He was making no sense. You came over here to tell me you're going on a business trip? Yes. A text would do. Troy's gaze seemed interested in everything in the store except her. I also wanted to tell you that I'll be back in time for the party Saturday night. Huh? She hadn't imagined their conversation last night. Didn't you hear what I said last night? There isn't going to be an engagement party. I heard you, and I was going to tell you to cancel the party, but then I spoke with my boss this morning. Troy paused before he hunched. Mick and the other partners are attending. I'm on the verge of getting a partnership. They're having a retreat on Sunday. I need to show them I. It's always business with you. Cassie, please. This is important to me. Her, too. But that didn't matter to him. No matter how much she wanted him to be different from other men, especially Eric, Troy wasn't. That told her all she needed to know. This was never going to work. They each wanted the other to change. She got upset when he suggested she act unlike herself, but she couldn't expect him to change his priorities because they didn't match hers. Her chest tightened until each breath took effort. What had happened between them was make-believe based on a lie she'd created. She knew that, but some things had felt. Real. Except nothing between them had been real. Not his mind-blowing kisses. Not the security being in his arms brought her. Not the ease with which she could talk with him. Her shoulders sagged from the weight of the reality pressing down on her. She'd wanted all of it to be real. Hope filled his gaze. I need that party to happen. No. The word only had two letters, but her tone was firm. She had to be if she wanted to protect herself and keep her emotions under control. She wanted to sound annoyed and tell Troy McKnight good riddance. But a part of her also wanted to agree with him, lose herself in the romantic notions swirling in her heart, and melt in his arms like the chocolate had in her mouth. That pissed her off. She knew better. I don't want to keep pretending. I know. I don't either. Then why are you asking me to go through with the party? He shifted his weight between his feet. Something more was going on. He wasn't acting like he normally did. She had a feeling there was more to this than the party. Tell me the real reason you're here. He unbuttoned his suit jacket. A second later, he buttoned it again. Troy, she asked. His eyes darkened. The only reason I'm being considered for a partnership is because of you. That wasn't what she expected to hear. What do you mean? He rubbed his face. Today, my boss, Mick, called me into his office. 
he made it clear that he sees me as a farm boy from Missouri and the only reason they're considering me for a partnership is because of my connections to your family. Well, your dad. She tried to make sense of his words. But you work so hard. Doesn't matter. Nor do the suits I spent too much money on. I can dress the part, but, Troy half laughed. I learned my work ethic from my parents, but according to Mick, my work ethic seems to be holding me back. He said he thought I was a worker bee. That was so disrespectful. She was incensed on his behalf. Your boss sounds like a jerk and not someone you should be working for. I wasn't expecting to hear him say that. A vein twitched at Troy's jaw. If there was any other way to show him and the partners. But there wasn't. The party was the last thing she wanted to do, but she couldn't leave Troy on his own. This wasn't about him not listening to her. He was grasping at anything he could to keep his dream alive. Fine. I'll go. And she would. Troy might want to rethink his dream if pretending and lies were the only way to get there, but that was for him to figure out. The tension evaporated from his face. Thanks. The party is the last time we act like an engaged couple. No more pretending after that. She wished he hadn't agreed so readily, but why wouldn't he? This was what he wanted. I hope you get everything you want. His heart's desires were easy to list, a partnership, introductions to high-powered players, money. Only one thing was on her list now, him, but all she'd wind up with was a massive headache, a broken heart, her parents continuing to meddle in her life, and oh, a box of chocolate. He walked closer. I'll make this up to you. You can't. I'm not going to dress like my mother and Emily. He moved closer. Wear what you want. Staring at the width of his shoulders, she gripped the counter. I'm not going to be forced to wear a strand of pearls or something equally subdued. Fine. Wear a necklace made from candy. He stood next to her. She ignored the urge to nuzzle her face against his neck and inhale his intoxicating scent. Boy, did she have it bad for him. And I'm not going to wear my hair in a French twist. Do what you want with your hair. Troy put his arms on her shoulders. And I will make this up to you. I promise. The color of his eyes darkened to a midnight blue. She knew that look. He wanted to kiss her. A warning sounded in her brain, but she didn't want to follow reason. She wanted to ignore common sense and forget all about the consequences of her actions. She might as well have F. Uh? L tattooed across her forehead, but she didn't have much more time with him. Troy lowered his mouth to hers. He kissed her gently, as if he were testing her reaction. Cassandra didn't want gentle. She wanted all of him. Opening her mouth wider, she pressed harder against his lips. Pulsating sensations of pleasure raced through her, erasing any lingering doubts about what she was doing. She wanted this, wanted this now. Troy deepened his kiss, ravishing her lips with a hunger she understood. So good. Cassandra arched against him. She wanted only to taste him, to feel him. This isn't real. She ignored the blast of reality. His kisses were real enough for now. The bell on the front door rang. Troy pulled away from her so quickly she nearly lost her balance. A woman pushing a baby stroller entered the bookstore. We both need to work, Troy said. I'll call you from Austin. Don't bother, Cassandra wanted to scream, but she couldn't. Not with the liquid heat running through her veins. Not when the desire in his eyes matched her own. Not when, after everything that had happened, she still wanted to be with him. Badly. She touched her fingertip to her tingling lips. Cassandra wished she didn't feel this way about Troy. Maybe his trip to Austin was a blessing. A separation would do them good and prepare her for what came after the engagement party. Never seeing him again. Chapter 13 That week, Cassandra missed Troy more than she thought possible. He'd been in touch each day. He'd text during the day and call at night. Seeing his name flash on her screen made her stomach tingle. Hearing his voice gave her a warm feeling all over. 
They might be separated by miles, but they were getting to know each other better and, dare she say it, becoming friends. Only it was too late. One more night until the engagement party. Only one more night until their charade would be over. A jagged pain sliced through her chest. Even though ending the fake engagement and saying, goodbye, to Troy was for the best, her heart didn't want to do that. Cassandra sank into her slip-covered couch and opened a best-selling legal thriller, but she couldn't get past the third page. Not surprising. She'd had trouble concentrating this week. She glanced at the clock. Eleven o'clock. That meant it was after midnight in Texas. And Troy hadn't called her yet. The buzzer to her apartment rang. Who would it be at this hour? Maybe her neighbor's gray and white cat, Macy, had run away again. Carrying her book, Cassandra padded her way to the door. Who is it? Who do you think? Troy. Her pulse picked up speed. She unlocked and opened the door. He held a bouquet of roses, lilies, daisies, and heather. Hi. Hi. She sounded breathless, but Cassandra didn't care. She clutched her book so she wouldn't drop it. Sorry to stop by so late, but my flight was delayed. I took a shuttle from the airport. He handed her the flowers. The floral scent filled the air. They're beautiful. Just like you. His suit was wrinkled, his tie loosened, and his hair a mess, but he still looked gorgeous. Can I come in? Cassandra caught her breath. I'm sorry, yes, come in. He rolled his suitcase inside. After he took off the strap to his laptop bag, he removed his jacket and tie. Troy looked around. This place is great. Thanks. Her flat was one of four that had been converted in the old building, but defined the word character with high ceilings, hardwood floors, picture rails, and a bay window. Thanks to inexpensive treasures found at garage sales and thrift stores, she'd made herself a comfy home. A bit cluttered and mismatched, but Cassandra loved this place. She remembered the flowers in her hand. I need to put these in water. Your walls, he said. Is that the same paint color you used in the bookstore? She nodded. I decided to try it here first. Great choice. Cassandra grabbed a blue vase from the top of the refrigerator. I took a mango to the hardware store, cut it open, and had them match the color. He grinned. That is so, you. You need to help me liven up my apartment. It's as homey as a morgue. Just tell me when. Or maybe not. Sunday, everything would change. Not wanting to think about that, she filled the vase with water and arranged the flowers. Did you work tonight? he asked. No, she didn't want to admit she'd left early in case he called. She didn't want to be distracted at the store. Mo closed up. Troy drew his brows together. He doesn't mind working at night? No, his partner works at a restaurant, so he prefers working nights. Cassandra carried the vase of flowers into the living room. She'd left her book in the kitchen. She was done reading for tonight. I hope your week went better than mine. What happened? She pushed aside a stack of advanced reader copies and set the vase on the coffee table. You know how I wanted a fiancé so my parents would leave me alone? Yes. Well, my family is bugging me more than ever. My mother calls daily with wedding suggestions. Emily calls to talk about the engagement party. Even Eric has texted his advice. Cassandra sighed. The past few days have been a nightmare. Troy squeezed her shoulder. We'll get through this. The warmth of his touch penetrated the fabric to her skin. She wished he wouldn't let go of her. Ever. Only one more night to go. I wanted to talk to you about that, Troy said. No wonder he brought flowers. Another bribe? You agreed we aren't going to keep pretending after tomorrow night. I'm tired of pretending, too. But after the party, I still want to be around. For real. Cassandra's heart slammed against her rib cage. Those were the words she wanted to hear. Her palms sweated. 
Her pulse sprinted. What if I don't want you around, she asked. Try to get rid of me. Are you sure? She hated sounding so uncertain, but she needed to know. He nodded. I missed you, Cassie. I missed you, too. She fought the urge to twirl around the room. Would you like a drink? Flashing her a flirtatious smile, he pulled her close. You're the only thing I want to taste. I haven't been able to stop thinking about kissing you. But I only want that if you do. Too late to turn back. Nothing less than a 7.0 earthquake would stop her now. She kissed him in reply, exploring his mouth, feeling the different textures, tasting his warmth. She ran her fingers through his soft, curly hair. Greedy for more, Cassandra pulled him closer to her. He showered kisses along her neck and behind her ears as he rubbed his hands over her shoulders, kneading and massaging her muscles. His kisses turned her legs to mush. She supported herself against him. I'm not sure my back is up to another night on a hard floor or the couch. Troy picked her up. Which way to your bedroom? She felt so safe, so secure with his strong arms holding her. Pointing to the doorway, she batted her eyelashes. I love a man who takes control of a situation. Sweetheart. Troy captured her mouth in another earth-shattering, intoxicating kiss that made her want to give up all control, forever. You ain't seen nothing yet. Is that a promise, my McKnight and Shining Armani? It's a guarantee. Cassandra couldn't hardly wait. Nibbling on his ear, she inhaled the male scent that was uniquely his. In the bedroom, he set her on the bed. Staring up at him, she read the desire in his eyes, desire for her. None of their differences would get in the way here. Focusing all his attention on her, he made Cassandra forget everything except the here and now. She felt as if they were the only two people on earth, and this moment was their destiny. His lips blazed a trail of whisper-like kisses down her neck, past her collarbone, leaving her speechless. Cassandra shivered. As his fingers followed the same path, goosebumps covered her arms. She'd never noticed before, but his fingertips were rough, calloused perhaps from working on the farm and she loved the way they made her feel. The gentle kisses and caresses sent pleasurable sensations through her body. Troy made sure his warm, strong hands and his soft, moist lips didn't miss a spot. Cassandra felt spoiled. She didn't need champagne, candlelight, or music for an evening of romance. She only needed Troy. She tilted her head. Troy accepted her. The way he stared at her with such desire made her feel beautiful, sexy, alive. I love you, Troy McKnight. The thought was so clear and strong she wondered if she'd said the words aloud. Each touch of his lips and hands sent electric shockwaves through her body until she ached with need. She kissed him long and hard, running her hands along his back and feeling the muscular ridges. It was his turn to experience the torture of those overwhelming sensations. You're driving me crazy, he said. She couldn't get enough of him. Same. He moved back. Cassie, stop. She pulled away. What's going on? We can't do this. Not while we're still pretending. We should go slowly. Get through the party and figure out what comes next. Nodding, she blew out a breath. That was the best plan she'd heard. Otherwise, her heart might not survive if he walked away. But I'd still like to stay the night, he said. She tensed. Do you think that's a smart idea? No, but we've done it before. And neither of us slept much. I'm too tired to stay awake, he admitted. I can sleep on the couch. Cassandra didn't want that. Here's fine. I promise to be on my best behavior. Mischief filled his eyes. But do you think I could get a peek at your tattoo before we call it a night? The next morning, Troy opened his eyes to rays of sunlight glinting off Cassie's golden hair. The long strands covered his chest like a satin sheet. She snuggled closer, her body warm and soft. Beautiful. His. Feeling more content than he ever had, he cupped her well-rounded bottom with his hand. 
Lightly, he stroked the spot where she'd shown him a delicate rose tattoo last night. How had he gotten so lucky? Cassie was a gorgeous, passionate woman. So what if they were different? The differences in their personalities complemented each other. His stability kept her from floating away like a helium balloon let loose in the sky, her vivacity lifted him enough to keep his feet from being cemented too firmly on the ground. Stirring, Cassie blinked open her eyes. She looked up at him with a soft, sleepy smile that made his heart clench. Good morning. Troy could get used to waking up next to her. He brushed his lips against her hair. How had he gotten so lucky to be the one she asked to be her fiancé? She traced hearts on his chest with her fingertips. Did you sleep well? she asked almost shyly. He felt unbelievably rested. Yes, I did. And the day was only going to get better. They could hang out until it was time to get ready for the party. After the party. Her cell phone rang. Cassie glanced at the nightstand. Don't answer it. Trying to distract her, Troy kissed her neck. The phone rang again. It could be an emergency at the bookstore. I have to answer. Cassie reached over him to pick up the phone. Hello. No, I was awake, Emily. It's almost 9.30. Troy looked at the ceiling. Why did Cassie have to pick a time like now to act responsibly? She could be so unpredictable, but that was what he loved about her. Loved? Where had that come from? Troy stared at her with new awareness. He was falling in love with her. Tumbling downhill was a more apt description. The thought made him smile. Things might work out after all. Really? She moved off him. I didn't know they went too. He did. She drew her brows together until two small lines formed above her nose. The color of her eyes deepened. I can dress myself for tonight. No, Troy won't be here. Where was he going? He touched her arm. Cassie shrugged off his hand. Okay, if you insist. I'll see you then. She covered herself with the comforter. Bye. She disconnected from the call and took a deep breath. That was Emily. She told me you've been in Austin with my father and Eric. Nodding, Troy tried to pull Cassie closer, but she wouldn't budge. She crossed her arms in front of her chest. Why didn't you tell me? I was going to tell you. Her nostrils flared. When? After you went to work for my father. Troy brushed his hand through his hair. We are only working on a deal together. One deal, honey. Don't call me that. Cassie. Emily said my father offered you a job. I didn't accept the position. Did you say no? Troy hadn't. It was a dream offer. One he didn't want to turn down. Not yet. Why? Because I wanted to discuss the offer with you. He held her hand. Cassie, I should have told you last night, but I had something else on my mind. She jerked her hand away. Like making Dixon Danielle's daughter continue the fake engagement by saying you wanted to date me for real? I had you on my mind, nothing else. Her reaction angered him. He hadn't forced her to kiss him back. She'd been a willing participant. You're not being fair. What you did wasn't fair. She gritted her teeth. Using our engagement. Using me. Troy rolled his eyes. The deal in Austin had nothing to do with you and me. But the job offer does. I didn't solicit your father for a job. He offered. You used me. Her voice cracked. You used me to get close to my father. Yes, it started out that way. You were using me, too. We both admitted that. But something changed. You know that. Yes, but I'm not the kind of person you want. Someone you could love. Troy hadn't thought so at first, but he cared about her. If he told her now, would she believe him? Cassie. You should go. 
he needed to make her understand. Not until I've had my say. There's nothing you can say. I trusted you, Troy. I really did. Her bottom lip quivered. I should have known you were no different than Eric. Cassie had no right to compare him to her worthless ex fiance and brother in law. Wait a minute. I'm nothing like that guy. Troy was offended. If you trusted me, you wouldn't be saying that. Why does everything have to be so black and white with you? It's easier that way. He sighed. This wasn't how he wanted today to go. You must be pleased with yourself. Her voice had a hard edge. Eric had to propose to both Emily and me to get what he wanted. You only had to pretend to be engaged to me. Please don't take this to the extreme, Cassie. I'm not Eric. She stuck her nose in the air. If you say so. Troy didn't need this. You're the one who approached me and asked me to pose as your fiancé. I wasn't hiding anything from you. I didn't ask for any of this. I didn't want any of this. She gripped the comforter. You aren't complaining about what it's gotten you. Cassie, don't. She didn't understand. She didn't know he loved her. I. Don't apologize and don't worry about the engagement party. I don't care about the party. Her lips tightened. Yes, you do. Okay, she had him there. Don't worry. I won't jeopardize your hard work and your precious career, she continued. I'll be the perfect fiancé. But as soon as the party is over, I never want to see you again. No. She was emotional. She couldn't mean that. He would give her time to calm down. Him, too. Troy got out of bed while she stared at the wall. Are we going to let a little misunderstanding come between us? This isn't little, Troy. This is about you and me using each other. That's what we've both been doing. Oh, yes, I admit my part in this whole charade, but it has to stop. Believe me, Cassie, I'm not using you. He was running out of time. He couldn't walk out without letting her know how he felt. I couldn't use you. I, I love you. He couldn't believe he'd said the words. Her eyes widened. It doesn't matter. How can love not matter? Because we want different things from life. Her eyes glistened with tears. We're too different. We may be different, but not where it matters. Troy was so close to getting everything he wanted. He couldn't give it up now. Cassie. My name is Cassandra. Only because you choose to hide behind a name that isn't you. You tell me I'm rigid, but you're just as bad. You won't let yourself see it. Go. You need time to cool off. I'll leave now, but you're not getting rid of me that easy. Is that a warning? she asked. He didn't dare respond to that. I'll see you at the party, was all he could manage before he left. Clutching the comforter on her bed, Cassandra poked a hole through the cotton fabric with her fingernails, but she held her tears at bay. She'd shed too many tears over men. She wouldn't cry. Not over Troy. Even though she'd been a fool. Again. Love only caused pain. Why had she thought falling for Troy would be different? Because she wanted to believe he was different. Oh, she knew they were opposites, but she'd still wanted to believe she'd found her Prince Charming, her Mr. Right. But she'd been wrong. Again. She knew better than to think a man like Troy would want her and could love her for who she was. She'd made the same mistake twice, falling for two men who had used her to get close to her father. No one with career aspirations could resist the Lord Dixon Daniels offered. Why would Troy resist? The flowers and the earth-shattering kisses made sense now. Who cared about Troy McKnight anyway? She didn't need him. She had her bookstore. She had her own life. She would forget him. He'd fade from her memory like a poorly written book. She simply needed time. Say, a hundred years. Her McKnight and Shining Armani? 
What a joke. So what if she could still smell his intoxicating male scent? She would wash the sheets. So what if she missed having his warm body next to her? She would get that cat she'd thought about in Carmel. So what if she'd never again experienced such amazing kisses? Cassandra pushed her hair behind her shoulders. She would get through the engagement party. She'd gotten hurt before and survived. Somehow, she would survive this. Love. Troy had said he loved her. She wanted to believe him, but she couldn't. Not now. She didn't want to love him. She wouldn't love him anymore. Rubbing her eyes, Cassandra ignored the void inside her emptiness, as if a piece of her heart had walked out with Troy. But that was ridiculous. She was overreacting, that was all. A void. She'd scared. It meant nothing. Nothing at all. Chapter 14 Waiting for the bus, Troy leaned against a graffiti-covered wall and rubbed his chin. The sharp stubble dug into his fingertips. He needed to shave, take a shower, and change into clean clothes. He didn't need Cassie. The bus stopped in front of him. Troy reached into his pocket. His empty pocket. His cash belonged to the man selling flowers on 24th Street. His wallet was in his jacket, and his jacket was at Cassie's. No money, no debit card. As the bus pulled away, a trail of foul-smelling exhaust fumes was left in its wake. He was tired, too tired to walk across town. Tired enough to sit and think for a while. Brushing his hand through his hair, he sat on a nearby step. Things weren't turning out as he'd planned. He'd planned on being made a partner, becoming a millionaire, and providing for his family. Sitting in a doorway like a bum wasn't part of his plan. Meeting and falling in love with Cassie wasn't part of his plan, either. Troy wanted to get married and have children, but he had a definite image of the kind of woman who would be a good wife. He wanted a woman who would be the perfect corporate, okay, trophy, wife. A woman who would support his goals, be understanding about his work, and fit in with the crowd. Cassie was none of those things. Although beautiful and intelligent, she was also free-spirited and unpredictable. Conformity was a four-letter word to her. Cassie didn't fit his image. But he loved her. Was love enough? She didn't think so. And back in college, he hadn't thought so when he broke up with his then-girlfriend. Although, his feelings for her had never been as strong as they were for Cassie. Now. An old man with a weather-beaten face and snow-white hair sat next to him. The man wore tattered, grungy clothes and carried an overloaded duffel bag. He needed a shower worse than Troy did. I haven't seen you around before, so I thought I'd warn you. The man's voice was deep and gravelly. Crazy Teddy sleeps in this doorway, but he shouldn't be here until later. Thanks for the warning, Troy said. Nice pants. The old man touched the wrinkled fabric. You steal, them. Troy wore Armani. The old man had taste. No. Bad day, huh? You could say that. Wanna talk about it? No. Didn't think so. The old man buttoned his army issue jacket. Must have something to do with a woman. No one likes to talk about that. Another bus stopped. A stream of passengers unloaded. A hipster-looking couple stared at Troy and the old man. The woman, wearing a ripped pair of jeans with a long sweater, handed two fare receipts to Troy. Have a nice day, she said before rejoining her significant other. Troy stared at the receipts, also called transfers, that would allow him to get to his apartment. You want one of these? The man smiled a toothless grin. This is my home. I don't need to go anywhere. Troy needed the transfer, but did an average homeless person need one? He didn't think so. I need to go home. Where is that? Good question. Home wasn't his apartment with a view of a sliver of the marina green and bay. Home wasn't his parents' farm. I wish I knew. I'm happy here, the old man said. 
more sun than other parts of the city. I used to live in the park, but that didn't work out. Before Troy could say anything, a man in an expensive jogging suit strolled by. He wore earbuds and $300 running shoes. He handed the old man a dollar. Spend the money on food, not booze. Thank you, kind sir. The old man gave a mock bow before handing the dollar bill to Troy. You need this more than me. He didn't need the man's money. Troy had a bus transfer. He could get home on his own. He had money in the bank, a 401k full of mutual funds, a small investment portfolio, and an excellent job. I can't take your money. You look like a good kid. The old man pushed the dollar into Troy's hand. Take the dollar and some advice. Clean yourself up and get a job. Find a woman to love and make a home for yourself. Troy could have all those things. Sounds like good advice. The old man nodded. I had all of that once, but I let it slip away. You're young enough. You still have a chance. Troy clutched the dollar in his hand. Suddenly, this one bill felt more important than the millions he planned to make. I'll try. And always remember where home is. The man's eyes focused on something Troy couldn't see. I forgot. When I finally remembered, it wasn't there anymore. Looking in the mirror, Cassandra cringed. So much for not crying. She had ugly cried. Not good. She rubbed concealer under her swollen, red eyes. She had to pull herself together somehow. The engagement party was in less than two hours. The doorbell buzzed. Her heart leaped into her throat. She ran to open it, unsure of why her pulse raced. Emily, wearing flowing black pants and a matching bolero jacket, stood with a metallic cosmetic box and a hair straightener in her hands. Not now. Cassandra didn't need this. Why are you here? This is the first party I've thrown as Mrs. Eric Wainwright. Emily marched into the apartment. Lots of VIPs will be there. I have to make a good impression, and I want everything to be perfect. Including me. Emily nodded. Is that so bad, Cassandra? No, it's. Her sister was the perfect trophy wife. No wonder Eric had cheated. Troy might not cheat, but he would find someone else who fit what he was looking for. A woman like Emily. Cassandra blinked back an unexpected rush of tears. Emily hugged her, an uncharacteristic gesture that opened the spill gate of Cassandra's tears. What's wrong, her sister asked. After a minute, the tears subsided. Cassandra stepped away. I'm sorry, Emily. I hope I didn't get your jacket wet. I'm not worried about the jacket, Emily said. Are you going to tell me what's going on or am I going to have to guess why Troy's luggage and suit jacket are sitting by your door, but he's not here? He forgot to take them with him. Cassandra hesitated. It's over. We're over. No, it isn't. Emily placed her hands on her hips. I'm not going to let a lover's quarrel ruin my party. They weren't lovers. They weren't anything. But Cassandra didn't dare say those words. She pushed back her shoulders. Don't worry. Your party will go on as planned. Thank goodness or daddy would kill me. Emily patted her chest. I thought I was experiencing heart palpitations. Why would dad care? The party was his idea, but he wanted me to throw it. Cassandra didn't understand, but she didn't care. She only cared about Troy. If only. Do you want to talk about what happened? Emily asked. Not really. Her sister walked to the kitchen. She grabbed a cucumber from the refrigerator and sliced it. Lie down on the couch and put these on your eyes. Cassandra took the cold slices and did as she was instructed. A drawer opened and closed. Water ran in the sink. Here you go. Emily placed a wet cloth on Cassandra's forehead. Do you have any ibuprofen? In the bathroom, but I don't want any. They're not for you. 
A few minutes later, Emily returned to the living room. Are you wearing the blue dress on your bed? Yes. The pearls you got from mom and dad for graduation would be perfect. And you should wear your hair up. I'll plug in the straightener. Emily was being too nice, too understanding. Cassandra didn't know what to say. Okay. Eric told me Troy talked about you all week in Austin. He did? Yes. The man's crazy about you. Emily sounded sincere. Cassandra's stomach tightened. She was going to be sick. She took a breath. It'll never work. Why would you say that? Because I've been there before. With Eric. We're too different. Troy doesn't want someone like me. He wants me to be. To be what? Cassandra stared at the seeds on the cucumber. To be like you. I'll take that as a compliment. Though I can't imagine why he'd want that. You're everything I'm not, Cassandra said finally. You dress stylishly, have a trendy hairdo, know the right things to say and when to say them. You don't stick out like a cast member of a freak show. I'm boring and stuffy. A little anal, too. Someone once called me a snob. Can you imagine? Emily sighed. You're like a butterfly or a breath of fresh air. You always have been. When we were growing up, you didn't notice or care how beautiful you were. Or still are. And when you stopped rebelling and started behaving after the kidnapping attempt, I couldn't compete. You were still you, but you were edging in on who I was. I hated that. I hated you. Cassandra noticed the past tense of the verb. She removed the cucumbers from her eyes. Emily. We're grown-ups now, Emily said. Time to put our petty jealousies and competitiveness behind us. Could it be so easy? But Eric. Look, we can discuss this until we're blue in the face, but it won't change what happened. We can't change the past. Agreed. Unsure of what to say, Cassandra hesitated. It's not that easy for me. Why not? Because I saw you. Saw me? Where? Cassandra took a breath. And another. With Eric. In my bed. Three weeks before our wedding. Emily's face paled. She took two steps back. Who else knows? Troy. Mom and Dad? Not yet. That might have been mean to say, but Cassandra was only human. She needed to explain a few things to her parents so they understood what they were doing to her each time they tried to push her and Emily together. I can understand Eric's motivation, but what was yours? Cassandra had been wanting to ask that question, even if hearing the answer would hurt. But honestly, what more damage could they do between them? Emily seemed to fade and grow smaller. I wanted to get revenge. Why? I've always wanted what you had. Eric was my chance to do both, get revenge and have something of yours. I never expected to fall in love with him. Just have sex? Emily lifted her chin. Yes. I'm sorry we hurt you. It wasn't just Eric. That hurt, but I was devastated by what you'd done. We were never close, but I never expected my twin, Cassandra's throat clogged with emotion. And then to have you keep rubbing it in my face. Emily's hands trembled. Asking you to be my maid of honor was not my proudest moment, but mom and dad would have thought it odd if I hadn't. So you thought forcing me to suck it up rather than admit the truth was better? Cassandra couldn't keep the hard edge from her voice. I was only concerned about myself. I never thought about what it would be like for you. Typical Emily. Cassandra felt numb, but she did want to know one more thing. Are you happy with Eric? Yes, more than I imagined, but I'm not stupid. He cheated on you, and he might do the same to me. I have an ironclad prenup. He also knows if he screws around, I will kick him to the curb, and that means he'll lose his job with dad. Smart thinking. It's not easy when the heart's involved. So true. I kept all the marriage counselor cards you gave us, Emily added. Just in case. 
Cassandra wished she had a pithy reply, but she didn't. I hope you don't need them. Me, too. Emily studied her. Do you love Troy? More than I thought possible. Saying the words aloud to someone brought such a release. Even if that someone was Emily. But I don't want the same things he wants. I can't be the kind of woman he wants me to be. Then don't. Be who you are, Emily said. Cassandra hadn't been enough for Eric. She wouldn't be enough for Troy. He would never accept her as she was. Who I am isn't good enough. Then screw Troy McKnight. He doesn't deserve you. Emily, really, Cassandra said, shocked by her usually prim and proper sister. Emily smiled. You sounded just like mom when you said that. I know. They laughed. Your eyes are looking better. Emily took the damp rag off Cassandra's forehead. Now let's get busy. By the time I'm finished, Troy will take one look at you and either fall to his knees or run to the nearest exit. For a moment, Cassandra had forgotten about the party. Why are you doing this? Because we're sisters and it's about time we started acting like it. I expect repairing the damage I've done will take time, years even, but I'm patient. Emily picked up the straightener. Ready to do something with your hair? Cassandra would need time. How long? She had no idea, but hair was a good first step. Sure. Work your magic. Troy paced the foyer of the Pacific Heights mansion, his steps sounding loud on the marble-tiled floor. The house could be rented out for events, but he couldn't enjoy the elegant surroundings. His collar seemed to be shrinking by the second. Cassie was late. Not that promptness was one of her priorities. Still, her not being here worried him. Was she coming to the party? Or not? He wanted her to come. He needed her to come. If she didn't. The massive stained glass door opened. A man and woman stepped inside. Where was Cassie? The partners from his firm were in the ballroom, drinking the expensive liquor and eating the delicious smelling hors d'oeuvres. So were half the other guests. The door opened again. Let it be her. And it was. As Cassie stepped inside, Troy sucked in a breath. No long necklaces with dangling pendants, no broomstick skirts, no boots. Two thin straps held up the ice blue material that floated above her knees as she moved. Elegant, but slightly daring with a slit at the side. The dress showed off her curves in a subtle, intriguing way. She wore a strand of pearls. She'd dressed this way for him. A vice tightened around his heart. Troy didn't deserve her. He didn't need her to dress and play a part. The clothes and accessories didn't change who she was. Cassie Daniels was perfect as she was. That was the woman he loved, not the one who'd come to the party. For him. He exhaled. You're here. Sorry I'm late. Always late, that was his Cassie. It was worth it. You look, incredible, stunning. Thank you. She wore her hair up, curly tendrils framing her rosy cheeks. A single pearl graced each earlobe. She laughed. Nice tie. She'd called him rigid, a stick in the mud, and other things. Well, maybe he was. But he wanted to show her he could be spontaneous. On his way to the party, he'd stopped and purchased a Mickey Mouse tie. That was the least he could do to thank her for showing up. Troy smiled. Now was the time to tell her. He put his hands on her shoulder. That was when he noticed the cutouts on the back of her dress and the asymmetric hem. The front looked conservative. The back was not conventional by any means. She managed to pull off both looks, and doing so was compromising without giving up who she was. That filled him with hope that they could work things out. His gaze met hers. Listen, Cassie, I've got to tell you. The door opened again. Dixon and Vanessa entered, followed by. Every muscle in Troy's body tensed. What were his parents doing here? Mom. 
Dad. His father laughed. Our eldest child is having an engagement party, and he's surprised we're here. Kids. His mother kissed Troy's cheek. Dixon invited us and sent us airplane tickets. Why didn't you tell us you were engaged? I've been meaning to, but things have been rather, hectic. I would say that's an understatement. His mother smiled. Aren't you going to introduce us to your fiancé? Mom, Dad, this is Cassandra Daniels. Troy forced the words from his dry throat. Cassie, these are my parents, Paula and Bill McKnight. Troy caught a moment of panic in Cassie's eyes, but she recovered quickly. Smiling, she extended her hand. It's WW wonderful you could come. Troy has told me so much about you and the farm. His beaming father hugged her. Welcome to the family, Cassie. You'll have to come for a visit and see the farm for yourself. It's a wonderful place to raise a family. Don't be so subtle, Bill. Paula gave Cassie a hug. We are so happy to meet you. Dixon stepped up. Before we join the rest of the guests, this might be a good time to give the kids your surprise, Paula. She removed a small black box from her purse and handed it to Troy. Your father and I thought you might want this. Troy opened the box. A diamond solitaire gleamed against the black velvet. His grandmother's engagement ring. His chest tightened. Sweat beaded on his forehead. Cassie's mouth formed an O, oh, it's, it's beautiful. This ring belonged to my mother, Troy's grandma. She wore it for 66 years, his father explained. Put it on Cassie's finger, son. Not now. Not this way. Not when the ring wouldn't mean anything. What are you waiting for, son, his dad asked. Troy stared into Cassie's startled eyes. He gave her trembling hand a gentle squeeze. This wasn't the way it was supposed to be. As he slid the ring onto her finger, she tensed. Her eyes glistened, and she blinked. Does the ring fit? Vanessa and his mother asked at the same time. Cassie showed the ring to the curious mothers. Yes. Fantastic. Dixon patted Troy's shoulder. Let's go inside. Everyone's waiting to congratulate the happy couple. And I bet Cassie wants to show off her ring. And her amazing dress, Vanessa said. Lovely choice, sweetie. The next two hours passed quickly. Everything Troy had dreamed about was happening. Congratulations on your engagement. Brett Matthews, who ran the Matthews Investment Group in Portland, Oregon, shook Troy's hand. The guy was self-made, a financial guru and an angel investor. Not to mention one of Troy's role models. You didn't mention a girlfriend the last time I saw you, let alone a fiancé. Things happen fast. Not a lie. She's beautiful. Thinking about Cassie filled his stomach with flutters. Yes, she is. You have it bad. Laughter filled Brett's gaze. I guess I do. No guessing about it, but there's nothing wrong with that. Brett's tone was sincere. You're lucky you found her. Except she'd found Troy that night at the bar. Imagine if he'd said no to pretending to be her fiancé for the night. He couldn't. I am. He didn't want to say much more about the two of them. Anyone special in your life? No, but I'm too busy for a relationship. Brett didn't seem bothered by that, though neither had Troy until meeting Cassie. I'm working on a book, so that's been taking up what little free time I have. A book? Troy straightened. Nonfiction? Brett nodded. Personal investing. Cassie owns a bookstore here in the city. The words rushed from Troy's mouth before he lost his nerve, but he'd do anything to help her succeed. If you want to do a book signing there. I'd be happy to. Brett removed a business card from his pocket and then handed it to Troy. You have my contact info, but give this to your fiancé so she has it, too. He couldn't wait to give the card to Cassie, so she could make the necessary plans. Thanks. 
After leaving Brett, Troy worked the room with Dixon at his side and spoke with the inner circle of Silicon Valley venture capitalists and CEOs. Even the partners from Troy's firm seemed a tad overwhelmed by the well-wishers like Brett Matthews at the party. Troy couldn't ask for anything more. A complete success. A perfect evening. Except. For the misery in Cassie's eyes. Staring at the fresco painted on the ceiling, she stood next to his parents. This wasn't working. Cassie had done her part. She'd done so without sacrificing who she truly was even, but she clearly hated every minute. And if the way she kept the engagement ring hidden from sight meant anything. Troy made his way through the crowd and touched her arm. We need to talk. Cassie nodded and led him into the cloakroom. The heavy wooden door dulled the music and the conversation in the ballroom. I wanted to talk to you, too, she said. I'm sorry for how I acted, overreacted, this morning. It was easier for me to believe you'd use me than to think you wouldn't. It was going to work. I should have told you what was going on. I'm sorry. She stared at the parquet floor. Looks like the party is working out the way you want it. For me, but what about you? Everything you want is waiting for you in the ballroom. Not everything. This was his chance. I want you. Cassie bit her lip. I want you, too. Her words sent his heart soaring. He put his arms around her and kissed her. She tasted so sweet, so warm. And she was his, all his. Gently, she pushed him away. I want you, but I can't be with you. I don't understand. This isn't an easy thing to say, but I can't live your kind of life. We'll compromise. I. You said you wanted me. The words rushed out of his mouth. What about love? Love doesn't change the fact we have different goals. You want to network at parties like this. You want to make millions of dollars. You want power and prestige. I don't. What do you want me to do? Give everything up. Troy McKnight was the hottest property around. He'd made the right contacts, impressed and awed them. He was a shoe-in for a partnership. His dream was waiting for him. He could taste it. He couldn't stop now. Could he? No. He shouldn't feel guilty for that. He was on the verge of getting everything he'd ever wanted. Everything he'd planned for. Of course not, she said finally. Thank you. She removed the engagement ring from her finger. I'm not asking you to make a choice. Troy pulled back his hand. The ring belonged to her. I love you. Sometimes love isn't enough. This is one of those times. You need a woman who shares your dreams, who wants the same things as you. A woman who can make you happy. I'm not her. He loved Cassie. He needed her. He wanted to marry her. Yes, you are. You are her. She forced the ring into his hand. No, I'm not. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. We can work through this. I'm sorry, Troy. He wasn't about to give up without a fight. Successful relationships are about compromise. Let's at least try. Please, meet me halfway. I came tonight. I compromised by wearing this dress. But anything else, I, can't. His chest ached. He wanted to say something, but the words wouldn't come. He should stop her from leaving, but he couldn't move. Not his arms or his legs. Cassie walked out. The door closed behind her. Standing alone in the cloakroom, he stared at the ring in his hand. The diamond seemed duller now that it wasn't on Cassie's finger. No stars to wish upon, no words left to say. A precious gift had been ripped out of his hands, and Troy was at a loss about how to get it back. He remembered what the old man had told him. Never forget where your home is. What happened when home didn't want you? Chapter 15 
The engagement party was a smash for Emily and Eric based on how much everyone was enjoying themselves, but Cassandra stood off by herself in an alcove. All she wanted to do was go home, but she didn't know how long she was required to stay. She hoped not much longer. The strains of the string quartet filled the air. Her stomach churned. This was the song she'd heard when they registered last week. The song she'd imagined herself walking down the aisle to in the gown she tried on in Carmel. A lump burned in her throat. Oh, no. She was going to cry. Cassandra forced the image from her brain. What are you doing over here? Her mother's beaded cocktail-length dress swooshed around her legs as she walked toward Cassandra. This party is in your honor. You should be mingling. Cassandra swallowed. She kept her hands clasped, so no one would notice she was no longer wearing Troy's engagement ring. I've made my rounds and said hello to everyone. She had and was now ready to leave. Her mother looked around. Where's Troy? She hadn't seen him since their talk in the cloakroom. He's here somewhere. Probably schmoozing with his firm's partners. Okay, that wasn't fair. He was only doing what he needed to do for his future, even if that wouldn't include her. What's wrong, her mother asked. Saying nothing or lying would be wrong, so Cassandra shrugged. A non-answer seemed safer than telling the truth. Come with me. Her mother led her by the arm out to the balcony off the ballroom. No one else was outside. Not surprising since the temperature had dropped. A fountain was in the corner, and sconces provided soft lighting. You look miserable, her mother stated in a matter-of-fact tone. I am. Why? Such a simple question, but not an easy one to answer. She stared through the arched doorways to the party inside. People chatted, laughed, and drank, but Cassandra felt as if she were from another planet. The last time she'd felt this way had been Emily and Eric's wedding. Cassandra blew out a breath. Might as well tell the truth. Making up stuff sure wasn't working. Troy and I aren't engaged. We've been pretending. Her mom's mouth gaped. Why? There was that word again. I couldn't handle you and dad meddling in my life and trying to set me up on dates. I thought having a fiancé would get you off my back. Stop your matchmaking. Lines creased her mother's forehead. She started to speak but then stopped herself. A bit extreme, don't you think? It seemed like a good idea, until I realized the stranger I'd asked to be my fiancé was in venture capital like dad. You and Troy weren't even dating? Her mother sounded scandalized. Nope. Cassandra took another breath. I'm sorry for lying, but I couldn't handle the meddling. Your father and I love you so much. We only wanted you to be happy. I was happy. You were alone. By choice. The words came out harsher than Cassandra intended, but she couldn't help herself. After you and Eric decided to call off. We didn't mutually decide. I broke up with him. The words rushed out before Cassandra could stop them. He and Emily got together while I was still engaged to him. I knew I couldn't marry him after I found out he was cheating on me, but he told Dad that we'd called off the wedding before I could say anything. Her mother swore. Something the elegant Vanessa Daniels never did. At least not in front of her daughters. Cassandra thought saying the words would make her feel better, but her mother's face scrunched with hurt was difficult to see. Her mom took a breath and then another. Why didn't you tell us the truth? I couldn't handle everyone knowing what had really happened so I just went along with the we mutually decided farce to save face. But later? There never seemed to be a right time. You were so busy with Emily's wedding. And we didn't see each other that much. Her mother pursed her lips. Because I was always inviting you to join us when Eric and Emily were around. Cassandra nodded. I, I needed space. Distancing herself from her family had made the most sense. She couldn't pretend as if everything was fine when she'd felt so raw after what happened. I realized when I was in Carmel with Troy that I needed to say something, but then there was this party. Not to mention looking at wedding dresses and registering for gifts. 
Her mother studied her as if seeing her daughter for the first time. We have been meddling. Cassandra didn't trust her voice, so she nodded instead. This must have been so hard on you. And being Emily's maid of honor. Cassandra sucked in a breath. It's what you and dad wanted. Just like you felt I needed a plus one for the wedding when the last thing I needed was to go on a date with anyone. So that's the reason you said you shouldn't bring a date so you could concentrate on your maid of honor duties. It wasn't a question, but Cassandra nodded. I'm so sorry, sweetie. Sincerity and love filled her mom's voice. Regret, too. If we'd known. Now you do. What about Troy? The two of you seem like such a great couple. Your father and I both think he's perfect for you, which is why we didn't care that things were moving so quickly. We talked about dating after this fake engagement ran its course, but that isn't going to work. I gave him back his ring a little while ago, so after tonight, we won't have to see each other again. Is that what you want? No, it's for the best. And if she kept telling herself that, she might come to believe it. Cassandra's eyes stung. She blinked. Though Troy's parents are going to need to be told the truth. I should be the one to talk to them since I came up with the idea of a fake fiancé and made a mess of everything. What do you need me to do? Her mother asked. Could you please find a way for me to get out of here so Emily doesn't make a scene? Stay here. Her mother's arms wrapped around Cassandra. I'll see what I can do. I'm sorry, Mom. Compassion filled her mother's gaze. You have nothing to apologize for. Cassandra nodded. I love you, Mom. Her mother smiled softly. I love you. Be right back so we can get you home. Troy didn't know how long he stayed in the cloakroom, but by the time he opened the door, his hands no longer shook. He didn't have a plan to get Cassie back, but maybe a drink would calm him so he could think of one. As he walked to the bar, one of the partners put his hand on Troy's shoulder. Here's the man of the evening. Russ Thayer was one of the original partners at the firm. Not as old as Dixon, but in his mid-fifties. He'd ridden the wave and watched the bubble burst in the nineties. Russ lowered his hand. Congrats on the engagement. The man had barely acknowledged Troy's existence over the past three years. Thanks. Great party. Cassie's sister, Emily, went all out. He doubted Eric Wainwright did much other than perhaps pay for the shindig. Unless Dixon had, which wouldn't surprise Troy. Looks like you're making the most of your country charm. Your future in-laws will serve you well. The knot in Troy's stomach grew, along with his unease. I prefer to keep family separate from business. Of course. Russ's smile didn't waver. But try keeping Dixon out. You've hit it out of the park with this alliance. I look forward to our two groups doing more together in the future. Country charm. Alliance. Troy's jaw tensed. He didn't know what to say. If the partners felt he'd pulled an Eric Wainwright to further his career, so would everyone else. Troy didn't want to be that guy. Good to talk to you, Russ continued. I need to find my wife. With that, the man wove his way through the crowd. The guy was like Mick. Troy's bosses were treating his and Cassie's engagement as nothing more than a contract to do business with the mighty Dixon Daniels. The partners didn't care about Troy. Only about his connection to Cassie's dad. The meeting with Mick replayed in Troy's head. I knew you had ambition, but I didn't know how badly you wanted it. I considered you our farm boy from Missouri, a worker bee. I see now I was way off base. Marrying Dixon Danielle's little girl. I didn't know you had it in you. He remembered what Cassie had said. Your boss sounds like a jerk and not someone you should be working for. She was correct. Nothing Troy had accomplished mattered to the people who controlled his career, his future. Without Cassie and her family, he would return to being a worker bee. Mick and the partners would likely be disappointed that Troy hadn't calculated this. Screw that. And them. 
Being a partner and wealthy might have been his dreams, but he needed to focus on a new dream. One that involved a pretty, smart bookstore owner who made him feel as if he could accomplish anything. He'd walked away from his college girlfriend based on what his ideal woman should be. Well, his ideal had just changed, and he wasn't about to lose Cassie. He bypassed the bar and found Mick instead. Can I speak with you for a moment? Mick sipped from a champagne flute. Sure thing. The partner's annual retreat is tomorrow, and I want you to remove me from consideration for a partnership. Mick's face dropped. You're going to work for Dixon. No. Mick's smile returned. But I'll be giving my two weeks notice on Monday. His boss frowned. Why? Mick's dumbfounded tone matched the look in his eyes. Cassie is the only reason you're considering me for a partnership. You admitted you saw me as a worker bee until my engagement. I do work hard. I'm proud of that, though I've pretty much had zero life outside of my job until I met Cassie. The truth is that connections are more important to the firm, and I don't want her to ever believe I'm using her or her father to get ahead in my career. I hope you understand. Ha <laughs> ha. Good one. Mick took another sip of bubbly. You crack me up. You had me going for a second or two because I never knew you were a jokester. I'm serious. Troy's voice remained calm. He'd finally realized what he needed to do. Not for Cassie, but himself. He didn't want a promotion with strings and for reasons other than he deserved one. He deserved more. He'd paid for college himself using scholarships, jobs, and loans. Payment still had to be made, but he'd come this far on his own. He could do it. Troy raised his chin. I'm quitting Scorpio Partners on Monday, and I don't want you wasting retreat time talking about me to the other partners. Mick's gaze narrowed. You're serious. Troy nodded once. Will you sleep on this for a couple of nights? Mick's words came out faster than usual. I know you've been working hard. Not taking your vacation days except to help your parents. And I was just kidding about the worker bee. Yeah, right. Just like Russ was with the country charm. Maybe we can work something out to benefit you and us, Mick added. I've made up. Please. Troy nodded again. He'd think about it but there was no reason to change his mind. He'd made the right decision. He only hoped Cassie thought so, too. Standing at the balcony rail, Cassandra wanted to ignore the turmoil raging inside her. She was happy she'd been truthful with her mom, but Cassandra wanted the fog rolling in to dull the knife-edged pain stabbing her heart every time she thought of life without Troy. Should she have given him a chance? Should she have been more willing to take a chance herself? The questions plagued her. A door closed. The hair on her nape stood up. She was no longer alone. She didn't smell her mom's trademark perfume. Troy. It had to be him. Cassandra. She didn't turn, she couldn't. She clutched the rail. The only sounds were the trickling water from the fountain in the corner, Troy's footsteps, and her pounding heart. He stood behind her, too close for her own good. As his warm breath caressed her neck, an arm brushed hers. The brief contact sent a spark shooting through her. She stepped aside. Aren't you cold out here, he asked. No, I was, enjoying the view. He turned her around so his gaze met hers. It's lovely. The intensity of his eyes sent a shiver down her spine. Cassandra had used all her strength and courage to tell Troy she wouldn't make him happy. That he needed to find someone else. The disappointment in his eyes had ripped her heart in half, but she was doing this for his own good. She couldn't be the woman he wanted. Why are you out here alone, he asked. I'm waiting for my mom, and I, uh, wanted some fresh air. It's a little stuffy in there. Are you talking about the air or the stuffed shirts, she half-joked. Both. His answer surprised her. She ignored the twinge of regret creeping up her spine. Saying, 
Goodbye, to Troy McKnight was what she needed to do. He needed her to do that, too. There's something I've been wondering, he said. She didn't want to hear what he had to say. One word and she might wind up in his arms. She might forget that she wasn't the woman for him, that he wasn't the man for her. What? He leaned against the edge of the balcony. Are you planning on hiring more help at the bookstore? Troy wanted to talk about her bookstore. Right now? Puzzled, she drew her eyebrows together. I can always use help. Good. She wrung her hands, fighting her nervousness. Does someone need a job? Yes. Me? You? This wasn't funny. She wet her lips. You have a job and an offer from my father. Not any longer. Stop playing games, Troy. This isn't a game. He held her hand. His warmth seeped into her skin and spread through her. I thought about what Mick and one of the other partners said. If they can't see the value of my work without my connection to your dad, then I'm working at the wrong place. It's time for a career change. Her mouth gaped. Have you been drinking? No, but what you said to me finally makes sense. I'd rather have you than all the money in the world, so I told Mick I'll be resigning on Monday. His words left her stunned. I don't understand. Being a partner is what you've always wanted. What you've been working for. Yes, but this is the right move. I never want you to second guess why I'm with you. Her mouth dropped even further. You gave up everything you wanted, your dreams, for me? Not just for you. For us. She should be jumping for joy. Instead, guilt consumed her. Your dream. Has changed. You're sure. Because I feel awful right now. Positive. I love you, Cassandra. She had no doubt he did. But what if you regret? I won't regret anything as long as you're with me. I've been told compromise is the key to a successful relationship, she said. You could work for my dad. Or I could work for his daughter. I like books. I'm good with numbers and always have ideas. I have several for Cassandra's attic. Did you know I used to be a management consultant? Her mind reeled. No, but you don't have to decide everything tonight. You're right, but whatever decision is made, we'll do it together. I like the sound of that. Her smile seemed to stretch across her entire face. I guess this means I need to stop being so black and white about everything. He grinned. That might help. Gray's not the worst color. It's not, but I draw the line at yoga. I can live with that. Good, because I don't want to live without you. Troy dropped to one knee. Will you marry me? Her nerve endings quivered. Her blood tingled. She struggled for a breath. For real. For real. Troy took the ring out of his pocket. I love you. I want to marry you. Yes. Tears of happiness welled in her eyes. I love you. Troy slipped the ring on her finger. Standing, he pulled her into his arms and kissed her. No more nights, weekends, or weeks. I'll be your fiancé for life. No, you won't, she said. You'll be my husband for life. With that, Cassandra kissed him, long and hard. No more pretend kisses. Only real ones from now on. I think I'm going to like being engaged for real. Wait until we're married, Cassandra. Staring at the diamond ring on her finger, she smiled. Call me Cassie, and I don't want to wait. Epilogue. Waiting months for their wedding day to arrive felt more like years. Cassie had wanted to elope the night of her and Troy's engagement party. He'd been game, but seeing the disappointment on their mother's faces had made them reconsider. Instead of driving to the nearest wedding chapel across the Nevada state line, they met both sets of parents for breakfast the next morning to discuss wedding plans. Surprisingly, both sets of parents had agreed with Cassie and Troy's wedding wishes. Only immediate family and Mo would attend. The ceremony would be held on the beach in Carmel. 
Cassie would be allowed to go barefoot. No maid of honor or best man would stand up with the bride and groom. Cassie's parents would both walk her down the aisle. The reception would be held at her parents' house. With those things out of the way, the actual planning of the big day had been relatively easy. They picked a date that coincided with Troy's youngest sibling's spring break so they wouldn't have to miss classes. Her mother hired a caterer, florist, and harpist. Her father found an officiant who wasn't a shaman, but didn't mind incorporating the bride and groom's wishes into the ceremony no matter how non-traditional their requests might be. Cassie ordered the dream Juliet a gown she tried on at the wedding salon she'd visited with her mom. Amid the wedding planning, Troy started a small business consulting firm. His first client, Cassandra's Attic. The changes being made were good ones. Sales were up, a new employee had been hired to be their book concierge, and Brett Matthews, who'd written a best-selling investing guide, would be doing a book signing soon. Next on the list of renovations was the addition of a coffee shop to the attic portion of the store. Working with Troy and being a real couple instead of a pretend one reaffirmed what her heart knew, they belonged with each other. Things might not always go smoothly, but whatever obstacles they faced, they would get through them together. She had no doubt about that. Today, on her wedding day with a cloudless blue sky overhead and a light breeze blowing off the Pacific Ocean, she couldn't wait to take the next step toward her future with Troy. Eager to stand next to her groom and exchange vows, Cassie dug her toes into the warm sand. It won't be much longer, sweetheart, her mother whispered loud enough to be heard over a lovely song being played by the harpist. Anticipation thrumming through Cassie, she nodded. You're a lovely bride. Her father squeezed her hand. That dress is so you. Her vision blurred. She blinked away the tears. Thanks, Dad. For everything. The harpist song changed. It's time, her mom announced. A feeling of contentment settled over Cassie. With her mother on one side and her father on the other, she walked down the aisle to Troy, the love of her life, who stood waiting in a navy tuxedo with a huge smile lighting up his face. His parents, brothers, sisters, Mo, Emily, and Eric sat in white chairs around a makeshift altar decorated with flowing white shears and vibrant flowers, but Cassie barely saw anyone else. Her focus was on Troy. His gaze gleamed with tears, and he rubbed his eyes. As she reached him, her parents each kissed her cheek. Her father let go of her arm, placed her hand in Troy's, and then her parents took their seats. Troy squeezed her hand. You're gorgeous. So are you. I love you, Cassie. Tears filled his eyes again. You have no idea how much. Oh, she had an idea because she felt the same about him. I love you, too. As they faced the officiant, her heart overflowed with love and joy. That night at the bar, she hadn't found a fiancé for the night. She'd found a husband for life. About the author. USA Today best-selling author Melissa McClone has written over 45 sweet contemporary romance novels. She lives in the Pacific Northwest with her husband, three children, a spoiled Norwegian elk hound, and cats who think they rule the house. They do. Thank you for listening to Fiancé for the Night. One Night to Forever, Book One. Written by Melissa McClone. Text Copyright 2017 by Melissa McClone. Production Copyright 2023 by Melissa McClone.